our main character is a bookworm who only knows how to bury his head in mathematics. However, the true identity behind that innocent face is the top gamer in the country. Things started rough for him, but eventually, things went smoothly, and his life gradually improved. Until a cruel fate dealt him a devastating blow. The protagonist's aura pulled him from death and gave him a whole new life. In this second life, he was given a completely different life, with a happy family that he longed to protect. How did he use his innate mathematical talent from Earth to become the most powerful and wealthy mage on the continent? Let's watch Happy Stories' review to find out. It's unknown how long had passed, but the child just experienced a horrible time, he had no strength left, his body now felt light and free from all pain. The child opened his eyes, a dazzling blue like the water, to receive a pure white light, a natural yet radiant light like divine light, he wondered, where is this, is this heaven, it's so warm. Immediately after, the child heard a gentle and clear voice, like the autumn sun, ringing in his ears, L. The child obediently closed his eyelids in the warmth that embraced him, the real warmth let him know that this wasn't an illusion, nor just a dream. The soft and melodious voice continued to pour sweet words into the child's ear, Hello L, my dear son, L was in his mother's arms, feeling a surreal sense of dream and reality, what's happening to me? Seven years later, on a silent night, L's mother, Silfer, was hurrying back to their simple little house, before even reaching the house, she excitedly called out affectionately, Ellie. As soon as Silfer arrived, she went straight to her son's room, Ellie, have you been good at home? In response to Silfer's overflowing affection, Elle's answer was cold, Mom, it's not Ellie. Hearing this, she was clearly startled. Elle pouted, his cheeks puffed out, seeming unhappy, he turned to complain to Silfer, It's Elle, Elle, if you keep calling me Ellie, I won't talk to you anymore. Silfer exclaimed in astonishment, her eyes brimming with tears, Cruel, you're so cruel. Silfer slumped down, covering her face and wiping away her tears, I call you Ellie because it's a cute name, I'm really shocked, sniff sniff, my Ellie is scolding me, startled by Silfer's tears, Elle looked flustered, ah, uh, ah, uh, mom. Seeing Silfer sobbing, Elle worriedly approached her and mumbled, mom. Silfer's cries grew louder, it hurts so much, mom just, Elle, flustered and confused, said, okay, okay, you can call me Ellie, stop crying, mom. Silfer, it was unclear if she was really crying or faking it, immediately broke into a radiant smile and excitedly embraced her son, really, I believe you, Ellie, my dear son is so adorable. Silfer rubbed her cheek against Elle's with a happy smile, you know I love you so much, right, my lovely son. After Silfer left, Elle went into the book room, where he kept hundreds of books, his little treasure trove. Muttering to himself, Elle's attitude had changed now radiating a maturity beyond his age, being with mom like this, I feel so comfortable. L couldn't help but smile thinking about Silfer and his current life, he thought to himself, my adaptability is scary. L had been living here for seven years now, he didn't know why, but he still had memories of his previous life, and the truth was, he had been reborn, the place he thought was heaven back then, turned out to be a different world. L sadly recalled his previous life, he was Kim Jun Sung, who lost his parents at a young age, to pay off the one billion won debt his parents left behind, his life was always busier than his peers, at that time, L didn't know if he could ever be happy. His life afterwards wasn't too bad either, as a student, he didn't have many ways to earn money to make ends meet, so L simply did all kinds of work he could. One of his most recent jobs was as a professional gamer, not wanting to reveal his private life, L used an alias, Lee Junhook. Thanks to winning the 20 million won prize, L was able to earn money a little easier, it was also the best way to make money for a student with limited time and a huge debt like him. Despite the tiring days, he still managed to make time for his studies after finishing his part-time work, with his fairly intelligent nature, Jun Sung secured a place in a prestigious university with excellent academic achievements. Today, as usual, 19-year-old Jun Sung sat at his desk in class, indifferent to everything around him, he took out a notebook and started solving math problems. Suddenly, someone approached his desk, and a cheerful and playful female voice called out, Hey, hello. Jun Sung replied half-heartedly, without taking his eyes off his exercises, 
Ah, hello. The girl with mischievous short hair sat down, clinging to one side of the desk, and stared at Junsong. The cute girl didn't take her eyes off the notebook full of letters and numbers on the desk. Junsung, you're really good. Then came her endless speech, that super hard exercise in class. You're really a top student. I noticed you changed your headband. It's really nice. Where did you buy it? Can I have it? Junsung coldly replied, No. The girl was immediately brought to tears by Junsung's cold attitude. He couldn't help but feel panicked inside. Oh shoot, I'm done for. Jun Sung frantically waved his hands, trying to explain, wait, wait, I didn't mean it like that, just at this moment, another girl walked past Jun Sung's back and noticed the conversation. Jun Sung awkwardly explained, I have my reasons, he didn't notice a hand stealthily reaching towards his headband behind him. In the next second, the headband holding Jun Sung's bangs disappeared, revealing his hair falling over his forehead, Jun Sung frowned, ah, come on, what are you doing? The girl who just pulled off Junsung's headband ignored his grumpy rebuke and said, What's wrong with it? The two classmates stared at Junsung, Hmm, you look more handsome like this. After a few seconds of observation, the two girls' eyes suddenly lit up, Wait, hold on. The girl looked at Junsung's face and clapped in surprise, Junsung, you look exactly like Lee Junhook. Junsung pursed his lips, slightly frowning, and avoided the two girls' scrutinizing gaze. Jun Sung quickly used his hand to brush his hair and intentionally lowered his head to cover his face, but the other girl innocently turned to ask everyone in the class, he really does look like him, right? Immediately, most of the students turned back to look at Jun Sung and started to evaluate, he looks like he was cast from the same mold, there's no way, how could a bookworm like him be professional gamer Jun Hook, but he does kind of look like him. It's no exaggeration to say that anyone in South Korean youth knows Lee Junhook. One girl quickly took out a pair of glasses and said, I have the same glasses as Junhook, try them on, there's no way you can fool the eyes of a true fan like me. Jun Sung reluctantly put on the glasses and was slightly disheartened, done, everyone wants to satisfy their curiosity. At that moment, the girl who didn't believe Jun Sung looked like Junhook changed her attitude, she was shocked and exclaimed, What? What is this? Jun Hook's private life has always been a mystery since his debut, so everyone was excited about what was happening. Whoa, he doesn't just look like Jun Hook. Rumors started spreading instantly is he really Jun Hook? And so, Jun Hook's identity was unexpectedly revealed thanks to the little prank of the short haired girl. It's truly unbelievable that the bookworm Kim Jun Sung is actually Lee Jun Hook. Jun Sung looked at the excited reactions of the crowd and tried to hide his sigh. The news quickly spread throughout the school, thanks to the fame of professional gamer Lee Junhook, most people, especially his fans, clung to him every day, asking, Jun Sung, I watched your match. Not only did a line of female students chase after Jun Sung, but male students also focused their attention on him, let's have a match, me too. Jun Sung hated all the attention and didn't want to be bothered by it, he still had debts to pay and studying to get into a prestigious university. He wearily could only escape to the school rooftop to find some peace. How did things become like this? Jun Sung slumped down with a heavy heart and endless sighs. I tried to keep a low profile, didn't I? Jun Sung thought to himself, the reason I hide everything and become a mysterious professional gamer is to quickly save a lot of money, because of that debt, having a girlfriend or enjoying pleasures like everyone else is a luxury I can't afford and giving up my privacy just for the purpose of making money as a professional gamer is something I want to avoid at all costs, being noticed like this is truly uncomfortable. As Jun Sung was still gloomy with a long face like a pump, a pair of small feet softly walked towards him. The short-haired girl hesitated before speaking to him, I'm sorry, it's my fault, I didn't know it would turn into such a big deal. Jun Sung generously replied, it's okay, it's not your fault, Miji. Seeing that Jun Sung wasn't blaming her, Miji suddenly blushed with shyness, um, besides apologizing, I also wanted to say. Then, she shyly invited Jun Sung to have a really fancy meal to make up for her unintentional actions, and Jun Sung couldn't bring himself to refuse this adorable friend. Jun Sung thought his life would have a romantic ending, but it turned out he died right after his first date and his life due to a traffic accident. In the last few seconds of his life, a fleeting thought flashed through Junsung's mind, 
I've worked so hard to live happily, but who knew I'd die like this? At that moment, Jun Sung thought, next life, I want to be born into a wealthy family and live happily, maybe the heavens heard my plea, because soon after, Jun Sung realized he'd been reincarnated into a different world, and he was the current L. At four years old, from the books he read in the library, L learned that this world followed a feudal system like the medieval times, with a hierarchy of ranks and levels. Mages use magic, knights use aura, and priests also have divine power, there are many interesting things here. But the best thing for L was having a mother who loved him dearly, Ellie, stop reading, let's go eat. She was already a third-level mage at a young age, L's father in this life passed away early, so his mother spoiled him very much, to live up to his mother's expectations, he studied magic diligently. Because the magic formulas here were very similar to mathematics, L absorbed them quickly, at only seven years old, he had already mastered level two. Though L's potential was limited by the amount of mana his young body could hold. But reaching level 3 in the next 3 years wouldn't be a problem for him. On a beautiful day, L looked out the window with excited eyes. Mom is here, in front of the house, the villagers brought Silver a basket full of tea leaves. L's face showed excitement, today is the day, only once a month. Mom will go to the big village to sell Rosito tea leaves. After receiving the basket of tea from the villagers, Silver went to knock on L's door. Silfer carried her luggage on her shoulder and called softly, Ellie, I'm about to go, are you still sleeping? Seeing that Elle didn't respond, she felt a little worried and opened the door to the room, Ellie, I'm coming in, what Silfer saw next made her freeze for a moment. Elle had put on a baggy cloak and carried a bag, as if he was playing a role of an adventurer, he looked at Silfer with excitement, Mom, I want to come too. Silfer's sparkling eyes widened in amazement, Oh my gosh, you're so cute. With that cute look, Elle almost made Silfer nod in agreement immediately, but she managed to stop that thought. Silfer shook her head frantically with worry, No, never, what if we encounter a terrifying monster on the way, it will eat my adorable son. The image in Silfer's mind of the monster when she saw Elle's cute appearance was like a pervert. Thinking about her mother having to travel those dangerous roads alone to earn money, L couldn't help but feel worried, but L hadn't told his mother that he could use magic, so it was natural for her to be anxious. In L's heart, a strong determination arose, I need to learn quickly and master the next level, when I reach level 5, I'll be treated like a viscount in this kingdom. And when I reach level 7, I'll become a powerful mage and be able to live comfortably in luxury, I'll become the richest and most talented mage on the continent to live a happy life with my mother. But first, L didn't want to attract much attention with his current level, so, he tugged at his mother's skirt and pleaded with innocent eyes, Go, go, mom, I'll protect you. Finally, Silfer couldn't resist those puppy dog eyes, All right, all right, we'll go together. Silfer was still worried and carefully instructed L, In return, you have to listen to your mother, and don't do anything dangerous, the boy excitedly replied, He he, yes, yes, of course. Silfer spoke confidently to her son, if a terrifying monster appears, don't worry, mom will protect you, just trust your mom. L looked at his mother with a happy smile, yes, I trust you. After that, they quickly began their journey, L happily skipped along behind Silfer. Silfer kept glancing back to check on her son, Ellie, aren't you tired, we've been walking for an hour now. She tried to slow down a bit because she was worried Elle wouldn't keep up, the boy ran up to her and said, I'm okay, I exercise a lot. Silfer smiled brightly and praised him, right, you not only focus on studying magic, but you also exercise regularly. Elle chuckled, great mages of the future need strong bodies and minds, he, so I have to exercise diligently from a young age. Silfer was a little surprised, thinking, what he said is exactly like the announcements from the Mage Academy about physical fitness. Silfer beamed at her son, Ellie, you're so smart, you'll be a great mage one day. Ellie picked a flower from the roadside and proudly showed it to his mother, Mom, I've seen this in a book, you use it for medicine, right? Silfer grinned, you're absolutely right, you're so smart. After walking a bit further, they reached a resting spot at the edge of the forest, Silfer told her son, Ellie, come here and rest for a while, then we'll continue our journey, Ellie squealed with excitement, 
Wow, there's even a table and chairs. Silver explained, I made this resting spot when I was traveling through here. Ellie was amazed. Wow, it's awesome. Silver smiled kindly and asked, Do you like it? Ellie nodded enthusiastically, Yes, yes. They were laughing and talking happily when Ellie's expression suddenly changed. He pointed nervously towards a bush not far away, his eyes filled not with fear, but rather disgust. Mom, over there, there's something, it's so creepy. Three large orcs appeared, their weapons held ready, smells like humans, juicy and delicious, let's have them. Silfer was also startled, she had feared this moment. Silfer quickly stood in front of Ellie, shielding him, she assessed the monster's orcs, three of them, this was Ellie's first encounter with a monster, and he might be traumatized. The orcs stare at Silfer and Ellie with hungry eyes, that woman and child look so delicious, I'm drooling already. One of the orcs lunged forward, ready to attack, first meal, here I come. Silfer was momentarily confused by the orc's flamboyant sword swings, her mind was racing, worrying about her son, if she didn't escape quickly, Ellie would. But as Silfer glanced at Ellie, she noticed he wasn't scared at all, his eyes were filled with curiosity and excitement, Mom, that's an orc. Ellie saw Silfer's concern and tried to distract her, they're much cuter than people say, they're just green pigs, Silfer almost burst out laughing at his innocence, kids are different, they don't know fear, calling an orc a green pig, and he's even excited. The three orcs were taken aback by Ellie's strange reaction, in a flash, they roared in anger, snorted, and swung their swords, we are not pigs. The orc's eyes flashed with murderous intent as they charged forward. Seeing that her son wasn't panicking anymore, Silfer calmed herself down, she began to cast a spell and said, that's right, Ellie, there's nothing to be afraid of. A fireball grew rapidly in Silfer's hand. She gently told her son, I promised you. They won't hurt you, Ellie. Silfer's eyes shone with confidence, her gaze locked on the orcs, don't you dare touch my son. Ellie's eyes widened in excitement as he witnessed magic in action for the first time, wow, this is level 3 magic. Silfer threw the fireball at the orcs, the air around them suddenly heated up, and the impact of the fireball was felt in every single hair on their bodies. As a result, the fireball singed all the fur off the orcs, leaving them looking like roasted piglets. Now Silfer couldn't hold back her laughter anymore, she chuckled, remembering Ellie's innocent remark, haha, calling an orc a green pig. Silfer's fireball had only singed the orcs' fur, not turned them into crispy roast pork, but they were terrified nonetheless, fire magic, it's terrifying, run. The orcs scrambled away, not daring to look back at Silfer and Ellie even once. Ellie looked up at Silfer and exclaimed in awe, Mom, you're so cool. Silfer smiled proudly at her son's compliment. She leaned close to Ellie, pretending she hadn't heard. What did you say? I didn't hear you. Silfer clearly just wanted to hear the praise again. Ellie giggled and repeated, You're so cool, Mom, like a great mage. The second compliment from her son made Silfer laugh even harder. Oh, Ellie, hearing you say that makes me so happy. After that, they unpacked their things and had a light meal at the resting spot. Silfer asked her son, Ellie, weren't you scared of the orcs? Ellie replied with amusement, those green pigs, they look funny, not scary at all. Ellie's humorous expression made Silfer try hard to hold back her laughter. She became serious and instructed him. They ran away because they were afraid of fire, but there are many more terrifying monsters out there, so be careful. Ellie's eyes sparkled with excitement as he listened to Silfer's detailed explanation of other monsters. Trolls recover quickly, so they are very difficult to defeat. Ogres are strong and tough as a wall. Ellie asked excitedly, Can you defeat them, Mom? Silfer replied with pride, Of course. Troll blood is a popular ingredient in potions because of their healing abilities. An ogre hide is also very expensive because it's so durable. Ellie's eyes lit up at the mention of money. He thought to himself, I can probably sell them for a lot of money, Silfer warned him, of course, you won't see them here, but still be careful, Ellie was hoping to see these monsters, but he was disappointed, nonetheless, he obediently replied, yes, mom. Silfer reassured Ellie with a smile, I'll protect you, so don't worry, our destination is a city called Banzark, it'll take us about three days to get there. Silfer asked Ellie softly, you can keep up, right? Ellie puffed out his chest confidently and replied, 
of course, I'm very strong, so don't worry, mom, Silver immediately praised him, you are so cool, Ellie. Then, they continued their journey, thankfully, they didn't encounter any more monsters along the way. On the third day after leaving the village, Silfer and Ellie finally reached the city of Banzark, Ellie excitedly thought to himself, this is where I'll take my first step towards becoming rich. Ellie's face beamed with excitement, and each step felt like he was about to take flight with joy. As they entered the bustling city, full of people coming and going, Ellie was amazed, it finally feels like I'm in a different world. Ellie walked while gazing up at the magnificent buildings, wow, it's amazing, Silfer held his hand gently, Ellie, watch where you're going, the place we need to go is this way. After walking for about ten minutes, they reached a relatively small three-story building, this was the Dibel store, in the past, Silfer had received a lot of help from the store owner. As soon as they entered the store, a young man greeted them, I've been waiting for you, Silfer. Silfer nodded warmly, it's been a long time, Dibel, Ellie peeked out from behind Silfer with curiosity, is he the store owner? Seeing Ellie peeking out from behind Silfer, Dibel asked curiously, who is this? Silfer lifted Ellie up with pride, oh, this is my trusted companion, he's my son, he's very smart and adorable, though he also likes to whine, Ellie blushed at her introduction, wait a minute, mom. Silfer placed Ellie in front of Dibel, Dibel sat down and smiled warmly at him, your son is adorable, it's nice to meet you, I'm Dibel. When Dibel looked closely at Elle, he was suddenly taken aback, they say you can tell a person's character by looking into their eyes. After exchanging glances with Elle, Dibel was a little confused and astonished, the boy's eyes were different from other children his age. Dibel was surprised to see a bright spark in Elle's pupils, he thought to himself, the way he's looking at me, it's like he's assessing me. Seeing Dibel lost in thought for a while, Silfer called out, Dibel. Dibel snapped out of his reverie, Oh, I'm sorry, I was being strange, your son is really amazing, his remark left them both baffled. Putting that aside, Silfer presented a bag of tea leaves and said, This is the Rosito tea harvest from this time, Dibel took one glance and was pleased, the quality of the Rosito tea this time was excellent. He carefully held the premium tea pouch, in that case, this time I'll give you an extra five gold coins, you won't find this quality anywhere now, Silfer replied bashfully, really, I don't know much about that, but thank you. Dibel said, what are you saying, thanks to you, my shop is doing better and better, we both benefit from this, so there's no need to be shy, while they were talking, L went towards the bookshelf alone. He pretended to read a book, but his eyes were fixed on Dibel, this guy knows his goods and knows how to talk, if you need to do business with a shop, this one is very good. After the transaction was complete, Silfer quickly left, see you next time, then, come on, Ellie, Elle quickly put the book away, I'm coming. Once they had left, Dibel leaned back in his chair and pondered. He recalled Elle's gaze earlier and muttered to himself, those eyes, that boy will become a great man. Elle followed Silfer onto the main street and curiously asked her, where are we going? Silfer received a generous sum this time, so she was in a very good mood, we're going to the wizard's tower, I'll sell mana stones with ancient rune inscriptions there. Mana stones are stones that help everyone use magic, even though they're disposable, they're very difficult to produce, so they're very valuable. Elle thought deeply, with his knowledge of advanced magic, the process would probably be simpler, but the ingredients were very expensive, so he didn't dare try it. Silfer continued, they also sell magical ingredients and spell books at the wizard's tower, L looked up at his mother in surprise, I can get spell books in the village too. Silfer gently explained, at the wizard's tower, you can get level 9 spell books that aren't available in the village, there are also level 10 spell books. But the highest ranking wizard on the continent is only level 9. They say no one has ever reached level 10. L was startled, level, level 9, there's also level 10, I was planning to grow up quickly and live happily with my mother, but I guess I have to change my plans. L immediately became excited, mom, let's buy level 8 and 9 spell books, Silfer happily nodded in agreement, oh my god, my Ellie is so hardworking. After that, they continued on to the wizard's tower, which was just a half hour walk away. 
Greeting Silver was Bat Rock, the deputy tower master, a middle-aged man around fifty years old with half his head shaved. Hello, Silver. Silver politely bowed to him. It's been a long time, deputy tower master. When Bat Rock's attention was fully on Silver, L couldn't hide the displeasure in his eyes as he stared at him. Humph, who is this old man? Bat Rock smiled warmly at Silver. I've been looking forward to seeing you. Bat Rock picked up Silver's mana stone and praised it lavishly. Perfect, your skill has improved, Silfer. Silfer replied bashfully, Thank you, Deputy Tower Master. Only then did Bet Rock notice Elf staring at him, HM, who is this little kid? Silfer said he was her son, Bet Rock immediately squeezed Elf's cheek affectionately, He looks exactly like you, so handsome, Elf thought to himself in annoyance, Don't touch me, but he still reminded himself that Bet Rock was a high ranking wizard and any wrong move could have serious consequences. As soon as Bet Rock released his hand, L turned away with a disgusted look. He said happily to Silfer, Well, I'll introduce you to my son. Bet Rock called out to the boy with a face that exuded arrogance and disrespect, who was standing near the bookshelf. Gedrick, he's only twelve years old, but he's already reached level one. Ha <laughs> ha. Silfer exclaimed in surprise, Wow, he's a level one wizard at such a young age. Bet Rock said excitedly, Gedrick, show us a mana orb. Gedrick snorted with an air of arrogance. After putting the book away, Gedrick turned towards Silfer and began to create a mana orb. He tried his best to show off his talent by creating a small orb that fit perfectly in his palm. Silfer excitedly applauded Gedrick, Wow, you're amazing, I'm really looking forward to seeing how much further you'll go in the future. Suddenly, Bet Rock grabbed Silfer's hand. He revealed a lustful gaze as he stared at Silfer, if you offer yourself to me, our son will be as talented as Gedrick, Silfer immediately refused, blushing, ah, uh, no, no. Rejected, Bet Rock changed his tone, oh, don't take it so seriously, I was just joking, ah ha ha, El saw this and was furious, this old goat, you keep teasing my mother, if it weren't for that, I wouldn't even show my skills until I was ten, but I've had enough. L burst out laughing and proudly declared, as if, I can also make a mana orb, Bet Rock was startled and released Silfer's hand, what, Gedrick, exhausted after his performance, was skeptical of the claim from a seven-year-old. Of course, Silfer was also astonished and worried, rushing to her son's side, Ellie, what do you mean, my good Ellie wouldn't lie, why are you suddenly saying that? L didn't answer his mother's question and immediately created a swirling wind in the room. It took him less than three seconds to create a mana orb in his palm. But that wasn't all, L's mana orb generated a dazzling light and energy that even spilled out of the magic tower. L, in a fit of anger, displayed his true power as the mana orb he created was even larger than his own body. After showing off enough, L happily retracted the mana orb. Bet Rock was stunned by the speed and powerful energy of the magic, far surpassing his own son's abilities. Gedrick's face turned pale and he slumped, the arrogance he had shown earlier gone, Elle's performance had dealt a heavy blow to Gedrick's pride as a prodigy. The most surprised was still Silfer, she sat down on the floor and stared at her son, no, I can't believe it. Silfer embraced Elle and kept her head on his, Ellie, my son, you're amazing, when did you learn to do that, you're so cool. At this moment, very loud footsteps were approaching them. The heavy wooden door burst open with a loud bang, an elderly man with a white beard stormed into the room and shouted, Who, who just cast that magic? Bet Rock was terrified as soon as he saw him, Tower Master Brian, the Tower Master's eyes were blazing with intensity, and for some reason, he seemed to be angry. The moment he looked at the Tower Master, El's heart skipped a beat with excitement, this old man is the Tower Master. He could keenly feel the mana flowing around the Tower Master, he could sense an incredible amount of mana, this is the strength of a level 7 mage. After glancing around the room, Tower Master Brian immediately focused his attention on L. L stood up to face Tower Master Brian without any fear, making him even more curious, is that you, you're a strange kid, your eyes don't match your age at all. L didn't hesitate to ask, what do you mean, Tower Master Brian answered evasively, a wise man can understand another person's heart just by looking into their eyes. While L was still confused, Tower Master Brian turned to Silfer, you brought this boy here, Silfer bowed politely, yes, Tower Master. 
Right after that, he straightforwardly asked Silfer, can I borrow your son for a while? Once Tower Master Brian and L were in the Tower Master's private room, he got straight to the point, that was a level 1 spell, but your mana capacity is astounding and your casting time is extremely short, how did you do that? Tower Master Brian pondered, a level 7 mage is equivalent to a level 7 sword master, but when fighting, magic is very limited. So many mages die at the hands of knights, can you tell me the method you just used to cast the spell, he asked L sincerely. However, L responded with a cunning smile, do you think I'm an idiot? He smiled brightly, but his way of speaking was not like a naive child, such a powerful and mysterious technique, you intend to take it just like that. Hearing L's words, Tower Master Brian's face darkened for a moment, but quickly brightened again, his eyes twinkling with curiosity, hmm, you are a cunning child, if I offer you a fair price, would you be satisfied? L kept that cunning smile, what is that price? Tower Master Brian immediately said, I'll give you 10,000 gold coins, that money is enough for your descendants to live in luxury. L thought for a moment, right now, I don't need that much money, I have to exchange it for something else, he offered a deal, no need for that, level 8 and 9 magic books and a mana stone will be enough. Instead of being happy with this simple condition, Tower Master Brian exclaimed, just the mana stone, is that okay? L calmly replied, no problem, I need that most right now. Tower Master Brian put his chin in his hand and looked at L with a scrutinizing gaze, I don't know what you're planning, but you must have your reasons, I will prepare 100 mana stones and a few magic books like you want. They immediately shook hands, deal. L laughed boisterously, thank you, old Tower Master. Tower Master Brian looked at that innocent smile and felt like he had been tricked, hmm, this cunning fox. Tower Master Brian approached L and used a spatial teleportation spell to send him away, he glanced at L and grumbled, why is it so difficult to negotiate with a seven-year-old? Looking at L's cute and innocent face, Tower Master Brian couldn't help but wonder, why do I feel like I'm negotiating with a grand mage? The moment he heard Tower Master Brian's comment, L smiled mischievously. A white light enveloped L, before disappearing, he carefully instructed Tower Master Brian, please make sure everyone keeps the events that happened here a secret. When he returned home, his mother bombarded him with questions, Ellie, how did you learn magic, how did you manage to use it in such a short amount of time? L could only give a vague explanation, it's because of the magic books at home, practicing mana reactions, and I also created my own formulas. In his previous life, after work, Jun Sung used his sleep time to study, he not only wanted to get into a good university but also wanted to improve his life, among the things Jun Sung studied, math was the subject that interested him the most. Because it wasn't something you could just breeze through, and because the sense of accomplishment after solving difficult math problems made Jun Sung very happy, however, magic formulas are many times more difficult than mathematical formulas. Thanks to his memory of math, L in this life could decipher magic to minimize his casting time, but he couldn't teach Silver Earth's mathematics, so he only showed her a basic magic formula. Just like what L taught Tower Master Brian, Silver was amazed after practicing, oh my goodness, you actually found a way to minimize casting time while maintaining the full power of the magic. Excited, Silver hugged her son tightly, Ellie, you're a genius, teach me a little more and I'll become an outstanding mage. Thus, two years passed, Silfer made significant progress and became a level 4 mage, they left Loon Village and moved to live near the Magic Tower in Banzark, Silfer also had a more leisurely life. While they were moving closer to the Magic Tower, on their usual journey, they unexpectedly encountered a group of slave traders capturing two girls. The girl with long platinum hair tried to resist the slavers with her weak resistance. The slave trader slapped her across the face, hurry, follow me. At that moment, a stone hit the slave trader's head. L yelled fiercely with angry eyes, what are you doing, stop it right now. The slavers immediately shouted at L and his mother, who are you, don't meddle in our business. Silfer's mother was not someone who would easily ignore the pitiful plight of those two girls. Silfer was furious at the slavers and firmly stood up, Ellie, stay back a little. She didn't say much but cast a fireball spell, talking to these bastards is useless. 
the more angry she got, the bigger the fireball in Silfer's hand became. L smiled happily, seeing that what he taught Silfer had come into play at this critical moment. Immediately after that, L also created a wind energy sphere, and both he and his mother attacked the slave traders. The slavers, terrified, scattered and ran away without daring to look back. After chasing away the slavers, Silfer gently unchained the two girls. Are you all right? Silfer picked up the heavy iron collar and was still angry, they're too cruel. Under the sunrise that dispelled the darkness, El and his mother shone like angels in the eyes of the two girls, El kindly said, Now, everything is all right. The warm-heartedness of El and his mother stunned the two slave girls for a moment. Afterwards, the two girls burst into tears, filled with both sadness and emotion. Silfer wanted to reunite them with their families but after hearing that they had nowhere to return to, she decided to take them in. Three years later, on a beautiful day, El had grown considerably, and his life continued to be peaceful as before. The door to El's room slowly creaked open as warm sunlight streamed through the window. Serena, one of the slave girls Silfer had rescued, gently entered the room and called out to El. Seeing that El was still asleep, Serena used magic to create a small bird of light and said, Wake up, L. The bird immediately began fluttering its wings on Serena's hand. Then, it flew upwards, towards L. The little bird flitted around L's bed, shedding its bright feathers. The light and sound of the bird's wings quickly awakened L. He sat up, stretched, yawned, and greeted Serena with a smile. L happily praised Serena, Amazing, your magic has advanced so much in such a short time, that magic was incredible. L, slightly concerned, asked Serena, you've been working all day and learning magic from me, aren't you tired? Serena replied with a gentle smile, at first, it was difficult, but after realizing how fascinating magic is, I don't feel tired anymore. After waking L, Serena went back downstairs immediately, take your time getting ready and come down, okay, L nodded and replied, okay. Since rescuing the two girls, time had flown by and L was now twelve years old. As he reached the bottom of the stairs, L looked around and asked Serena, Kano went out early again today, didn't she? Serena nodded, yes, she's been going out around this time every day recently. Just then, Kana opened the door and walked in. Kana had a tougher appearance than Serena, and her voice was slightly colder, did you sleep well? L, used to Kana's seemingly casual tone, cheerfully greeted her, Good morning, Kana, you're practicing swordsmanship again today, that's awesome. Kana nervously held up her wooden sword and explained, Yes, the more actively I swing the sword, the more my strength flows, it's really interesting. Not being good at expressing herself, Kana immediately wanted to demonstrate, If you don't mind, I can show you how much I've practiced and improved. L quickly stopped her, Sure, show me next time you're out. Kana was L's age while Serena was two years older, since they were young, they had been isolated from the outside world, so L thought it would be a difficult time for them to adapt to a new life. However, thankfully, they adapted very well to their current life, both were learning many things from L. Serena possessed magical talent and had reached level 1. Kana, on the other hand, had exceptional physical abilities and was being trained to use a sword. L seemed proud as he looked at them. It's great that both of you are progressing well. While the three children were playing together, Silfer appeared, her face radiant like a blooming flower. Good morning, Ellie. Elle quickly realized something was different about Silfer's constant smile. She seemed more relaxed than ever. He curiously asked his mother, something good happened, didn't it? Silfer immediately turned to Elle with a bright smile, as if she had been waiting for him to ask that question. Oh, you can tell, can you? I reached level 5 yesterday. The three children clapped and cheered, really, congratulations, mom, congratulations, mom, congratulations, Silfer replied happily, thank you, kids, it's all thanks to Ellie. While everyone was grinning, Elle was pondering something, so, to celebrate. The three women in the house all stared at him in bewilderment. Elle didn't explain, just gave them a mysterious smile in response. That evening, as the red sunset painted the sky over Banzark. At the magic tower, an unexpected visit took place. 
Greeting L was the grumpy and sulky face of the tower master. Brian, goodness, you've grown up, you haven't shown your face here once since then, you heartless little brat. L laughed it off and replied, that's why I'm here to see you now, master, I hear you defeated a swordsman, seems like you're getting stronger, congratulations. Tower Master Brian said warmly, well, it's thanks to that magic formula, please, have a seat. L excitedly pulled out a bag of something, Silver, a little worried, whispered to him, hold on, Ellie, why are we at the magic tower, is there a reason? Hearing this, Tower Master Brian frankly asked L, I'm curious too, why did you suddenly come looking for me like this? L poured out a heap of shimmering stones from the cloth bag, I want to show you my invention. Tower Master Brian picked one up and examined it with a look of intense curiosity, this, isn't this the rarest thing on the continent, a magic stone, so, you're the one who invented it. L cheerfully introduced his creation, the magic stone contains a mana level that's almost equal to a high level mana stone. But unlike mana stones, which need to be left for years before they can be used again, the magic stone can recover in three days and be used up to ten times. L also expressed his concern to the Tower Master, perhaps because of this, people sent from magic towers across the entire continent are lurking near our house, Silfer, almost completely unaware of these things, exclaimed in surprise, really, Ellie. L sighed and replied, yes, thankfully, they haven't done anything yet. He continued to look at Tower Master Brian with a meaningful gaze, I think the Tower Master here might also find this interesting, after a moment of stunned silence, Tower Master Brian admitted with a click of his tongue, you're still the cunning kid you were back then, what do you want from me? L said frankly, I have four requests, I will hand over the production and sale of magic stones to the Tower Master, in return, please protect my family, if a magic tower is recognized by the entire continent to manage this business, other places will be forced to give up, thus ensuring our safety. Tower Master Brian nodded in agreement, that's right. L continued, please find me more books on swordsmanship and magic. L looked towards Serena and Kana, we need more books because both of them have extraordinary learning abilities, Tower Master Brian generously responded, what do you think, if it's books, I have plenty, take anything you find useful, anything else. L continued, please find us a good inn, Tower Master Brian was slightly surprised by his request, ha. Huh. L explained, my mother just became a level 5 mage, so I want to celebrate with her, I want to have a relaxing vacation with my family without worrying about anything. Silfer was moved to tears, Ellie. She hugged Elle tightly, you're such a good child, thank you. As everyone embraced each other in overwhelming happiness, Elle thought to himself, from now on, no matter what happens, I will protect this peace. Tower Master Brian awkwardly interrupted their embrace, what's your fourth request? L responded seriously, I want a book on how to make golems. Tower Master Brian's eyes widened in astonishment, golems, why do you need them, don't you know that even with blueprints, you still can't create them? L chuckled, I just find them interesting. In reality, he thought to himself, to realize my ultimate goal, I need golems, golems will compensate for the weaknesses of spellcasters in close combat. I am aiming for night golems with abilities far superior to the existing worker golems on the continent, suitable for escorting mages. Another long time passed by quickly, and before you knew it, for years had gone by, outside El's house, at midnight, there were faint rustling sounds and whispers, found it. Two assassins stood outside carefully observing, so this is the house of the one who created the magic stones. After a moment of investigation, the two assassins said to each other, what, there are no magic traps, it seems they were too confident in the protection of Banzark Tower and let down their guard. The two assassins quickly approached the house, I thought it would be difficult because the requirement was to not injure the target, but it seems it will be easy, what if he tries to resist? One assassin arrogantly drew his sword and said, then. We will kill him like any assassin would. The two assassins had not been happy for a few seconds when they were startled by L's sudden appearance, not a bad idea, ha. Huh? Seeing L's youthful and proud face, the two assassins exclaimed in shock, you, you are. They jumped back in surprise and saw three golems standing tall behind them, blocking their path. The two assassins glanced at each other in panic, signaling to take action. 
Immediately, one of the assassins jumped forward and swung his sword towards the golem. He glared fiercely and struck repeatedly without stopping. Seeing that the golem didn't budge at all from those initial attacks, the assassin launched a direct thrust with his sword. However, his double-bladed sword was cut into several pieces before it could reach the golem. Both assassins were startled and horrified to see the golem slicing through iron like it was mud. The two assassins collapsed, their minds filled with terror in front of the golem warriors who were three times larger than ordinary humans. What? How is this possible? This? What kind of monster is this? After a scream of terror, the two assassins no longer had a chance to find out what they were facing. El immediately praised his warriors, well done. Looking at the golem warriors, El thought to himself, these golems may not be perfect yet, but they are already quite strong and agile. Since receiving the book on golem creation from Tower Master Brian, El had locked himself in the workshop and poured all his energy into creating them. Thanks to the combination of earthly knowledge and magic, El's golem guards were created and they have been fulfilling their duties quite effectively. However, for El, this is still far from his goal. Seeing a large pool of blood still splattered on the ground, El directly used magic to clean it up. He thought to himself, this should be all right, right? When he was finished, El brushed his hands clean and went back inside, mother and the others won't notice. The next morning, the new day began with Serena's cheerful greeting, good morning, El, thank you for breakfast. Serena replied with a bright smile, it's nothing, cooking is really fun. Soon after, Kana appeared, hello. El turned to look at her, hello, Kana, just back from training. As always, Kana was about to show off her skills, yes, watch how much progress I've made, El chuckled and stopped her, later, please, I beg you. El thought to himself, I'm so relieved, they're acting just like normal, but I haven't seen Silver yet, where is she? He looked around, worried. Suddenly, the atmosphere became heavy, Serena looked gloomy, leaving El confused. At this moment, not far from their house, Silfer was practicing magic alone. With her current abilities, she was able to create fireballs three times larger than before. However, Silfer still felt unsatisfied and wanted to push herself to become stronger. The flames, they were beyond her control, if she couldn't control them, then. The next second, Silfer lost control and the fireball vanished in a flash. She couldn't help but feel disappointed as she collapsed to the ground and sighed. Just then, El arrived, Mom. He said cheerfully to Silfer, Serena has finished breakfast, let's eat together. Silfer sadly turned her back to El, I'm sorry, I just need to practice a little more. El gently sat down to comfort her, you should eat first, and don't push yourself too hard, you're already amazing as you are. Silfer mumbled dejectedly in a feeling of powerlessness, no, if I don't become a level 6 mage soon, then, El didn't understand why Silfer was pushing herself so hard, so he tried to comfort her, mom, you don't need to try so hard. For the first time, Silfer reacted fiercely with such a desperate look at El, no, if I don't try harder, then. Silfer's unusual attitude startled El, as if he had missed something that had happened over the past time. El looked at Silfer pensively, what's going on, you're different, something has happened, right? El sighed softly, remembering something, the method he had learned in his previous life to enhance his concentration when playing games, he had intended to keep it a secret, but now he thought it was the only way to help Silfer level up quickly. After a moment of hesitation, El said, so, let me teach you the breathing technique. Seeing the three women look confused, El began to explain, the breathing is a method that allows you to focus your mind on a point just a few inches below your navel, you inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth, if you learn it, you can concentrate all your energy into one point, thereby increasing your strength. After El's instructions, the three of them immediately began practicing, focusing their minds, inhaling, and exhaling. Serena was the first to give up, I, I can't breathe, El immediately reminded her, don't rush, do it slowly, breathe gently, and deeply. Kana was the next one to complain, ugh, my abs are going to explode, El was panicked and told her, you're using too much force. Seeing the two girls slumped down in exhaustion, El muttered, normally you don't need to focus so much on your breath, 
but this method is really difficult to master, Kane arrived and cried out, the human body is truly mysterious. Only Silfer was successfully carrying out what Elle had just taught her. All three teenagers were astonished as they looked at Silfer's composure, oh my god, her focus is incredible. Elle quickly realized that Mana was gradually gathering near Silfer, she was sensing Mana and increasing her interaction with it noticeably. Silfer's heart felt incredibly tranquil at this moment, and her composure allowed her to feel clearer, I can feel it. Silfer told herself, Mana is gradually seeping into my body, and my magical power is growing, I've never felt this way before. Who would have thought that he could have discovered this method on his own without anyone's help, Ellie is truly a genius, and for Ellie, I have to become stronger. In the moment she thought about her son's potential, Silfer unconsciously remembered a magnificent but gloomy mansion, to provide Ellie with even better conditions, I have to become strong enough to return to that place. A magical light enveloped Silfer, at this moment, she felt like she had awakened to a new horizon. Silfer felt mana gathering and flowing into her body, it was an immense power, unlike anything she had ever encountered. All the energy had gathered in one place. Silfer's strength also suddenly increased significantly. Silfer raised her hand and used the fire spell once again. The flames erupted powerfully just a second later, and the huge fireball was no longer difficult to control like before. Finally, the flames coalesced into the shape of a fiery horse, full of spirit. The three teenagers excitedly cheered for Silfer, Mom, you did it, congratulations, I can feel it too, your mana is much stronger, it's unbelievable. Silfer was moved to tears, this way, I'm sure I can become a level 6 powerhouse, thank you, thank you all, I will definitely work even harder. Elle breathed a sigh of relief, I'm so happy, Mom is smiling again. I wonder if I can soon find clues to level up like mom. For his true goal, to revive a goal on night. Throughout this time, Elle's mind was filled with thoughts of how to achieve this goal. To the point that he hadn't realized the change in Silfer. Seeing Silfer cry, Elle was stunned and blamed himself, if I had paid more attention and intervened earlier, mom wouldn't have been so sad. Looking at his little family, Elle couldn't help but feel worried. I wonder how long I can continue to live this peaceful life. After making significant progress, they all went home to eat, while cleaning up, Silfer said to Serena and Kana with a little embarrassment, I'm sorry, you guys had to eat lunch instead of breakfast because of me, Serena and Kana both smiled obediently and replied, it's okay, we got to see mom make progress, that's much more important, yes, it is. Silfer was touched and tears welled up in her eyes. Thank you, you two are so understanding. She burst into tears and lamented, but right after we finished eating, Ellie disappeared again, oh, I'm so lonely, he's been locking himself in the workshop lately, I haven't been able to even say a word to him. In the days that followed, El still spent most of his time in the workshop, scratching his head and sighing, creating the strongest golem on the continent is no easy feat. He wanted to create a golem that could think and act for itself. First, he would need to create something called a spirit, consider the sole core of it, however, creating a spirit was not a simple matter at all. Spirit magic is a level 8 spell and is known as one of the hardest to learn. The only remaining way is to use dark magic, by combining evil thoughts of hatred, anger, jealousy, desire, and submission, then a spirit will be born. The theory is there but it doesn't work in practice, this is still too complex for someone at level 6 like L. L looked pensively at the pages of design formulas, covered in writing, could it be that as long as I'm not level 7 yet, it won't work. However, what made L even more flustered was that reaching level 7 might be a long way off, as he still didn't have a new enlightenment about this level 7, and without it, he couldn't reach it. L wondered, how to awaken himself. He tried to think back, the first time his mother used that breathing method, it was successful. Did I miss something? While Elle was stuck, Serena pushed the door open and peeked in, um, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting, but we have to start now. Elle immediately got up, oh, it's time to supervise Serena's magic practice, I'm sorry, I'll be right out. Elle asked Serena kindly, you said you had something you were really confused about, right, Serena replied shyly. Sorry if this question is too basic, but I can't understand it no matter what I do. 
Serena hesitated and asked L, what is the essence of mana? L was stunned, seemingly not understanding her question, but, you can feel its response, right, the feeling of mana filling your body. Serena replied in confusion, no, not like that, I mean, I don't know how to explain it either. After a moment of contemplation, Serena tried to explain her thoughts, I guess you could say, the characteristics of mana, I can feel that there are many different types of mana mixed up in my body, but I can't understand what the differences are between their power and properties. Serena stammered, so I wanted to see if you could explain it to me, as L heard this, a light flashed in his eyes, the essence of mana, and its characteristics. L mumbled in repetition, the characteristics of mana, Serena nodded, that's how I feel, have you never felt that, L? L didn't say anything and quickly turned back into the workshop. While Serena watched in confusion, L was searching for something in a drawer. L poured out a pile of mana stones, making Serena even more confused. L continued silently and placed his hand on each stone. L carefully felt the flow of mana contained within each stone. Gradually, he understood, you could call it an enlightenment, yes, each mana stone, this one, and this one, and this one too. They are all different, and not just one or two types, there are many different powers mixed together to form a type of mana. L was overwhelmed by this new discovery, how could he have overlooked something so basic before, mana also has many different types. The enlightenment entered the depths of the seventh level, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, L said to himself, I want to understand this even deeper. L performed the breathing method, completely engrossed in the process, he refused to stop despite the massive impact as dense mana from around him was drawn into his body. With a growing sense of comfort, L didn't know how much time had passed, but he felt his mind gradually becoming enlightened, his eyes slowly opened. A deep joy and excitement filled L's heart as he entered the realm of seeking enlightenment, it was amazing, like a sea of stars, so beautiful. L relaxed and thought to himself, now that I think about it, in the game I played in my previous life, the composition of a unit was crucial for any attack, by understanding each component in each unit, one could create superior power when creating a combination specialized in a particular type of action. Moreover, this is my forte, with mana, by changing the combinations of mana, I can also create stronger magic. L seemed to forget Serena was still there and excitedly talked to himself, I have to experiment right away. Serena looked at L in confusion, not knowing what to say, L. L immediately cast a spell on the mana stones. In his heart, he thought, the different types of mana that Serena told me about. If I separate and implant them together, they could create a huge source of power. The energy generated was stronger than L imagined, making him a little overwhelmed, if this continues, I'll be swept away by this power, calm down, focus everything on the breathing method. L took a deep breath and continued to focus all his mind on the energy in his hand, becoming a level 7 mage is definitely not easy, but I have to try my best for that ultimate goal. The massive amount of mana shattered the limits within L's body, forming a new mana hole to hold the massive amount of mana that had just poured in. The mana swept through L's body, expelling all foreign substances, and then, his skin split, cracked pieces fell off, revealing a pristine, jade-like layer of his body underneath. L's face also transformed, he felt his body had become much stronger than before, the source of mana filled his blue eyes, radiating a brilliant light. A bird took flight before L's eyes, a sign that he had reached a new breakthrough. L woke up with a start when he heard Serena's startled cry, L, L. Serena was crying in front of L, are you okay? L sat up with a little dizziness, huh? why am I lying on the ground? Serena sobbed and recounted, just now, suddenly a gust of wind came towards you, and then you collapsed and passed out, I was so worried, I kept calling you, but you wouldn't wake up, are you really okay? L checked his body and was surprised to realize his skin had been regenerated, yeah, I'm fine, but more importantly. L happily grabbed Serena's shoulder, thanks to you, I leveled up. L looked at Serena with happiness in his eyes, thanks for telling me about the different types of mana, thank you. Serena blushed involuntarily, his level, it increased again. She watched L without blinking, L is so amazing, always trying his best. 
Suddenly, Serena curiously asked L, so what level have you reached, L? She hesitated before telling L the truth, I have a feeling your power has surpassed mine. L chuckled, you have to keep this a secret, okay? In that moment, Serena's eyes were filled with admiration for L, and her heart fluttered a little. L was incredibly excited inside, he could finally move on to the next stage of golem creation. The strongest night golem on the continent is not too far away now. Meanwhile, Silver sat alone on the hill, her gaze fixed on their house below. Looking at the peaceful little house at the foot of the hill, Silfer thought to herself, this place is truly perfect for a peaceful life, but maybe we'll have to leave soon. Looking at the image of El's father preserved in the pendant, Silfer muttered, Ellie is almost seventeen now, for him, I need to make this decision. Her eyes welled up, protect El, protect our son. Silfer sobbed softly, I'll try to protect our child, Rian. Time passed, and today was L's seventeenth birthday, but his face was serious. Serena watched L with worried eyes. After a while of tension and anticipation, L suddenly shouted, All right, it's done. Serena looked at the bubbling soup pot and exclaimed excitedly, Wow, it looks delicious, being the one who usually cooked in the house, she couldn't help but worry while watching L cook. Finally, Serena could breathe a sigh of relief, the three women in the family sat down to enjoy the special soup Elle had prepared. Silfer took a sip and praised, this is so good, Ellie is good at everything, isn't he? Looking at Kana's diligently eating, it was clear the soup was truly to her liking. Silfer hesitated for a moment before looking at Elle, but I still want to celebrate your 17th birthday myself. Elle continued to stir something in the pan with a bright smile, it's okay, mom. I love cooking, in my past life, I lived alone for 10 years, so cooking was a joy for me, now, it makes my family happy, so I love it even more. After stirring for a while, El excitedly announced, the main dish is ready. He placed a plate of fragrant kimchi fried rice in front of them and eagerly said, everyone, try it. El was incredibly eager to see their reactions, but also nervous, making kimchi fried rice here wasn't easy. He had to search everywhere for rice, cabbage, and spices for this dish. He also had to use magic to perfectly ferment the kimchi. Not hearing any response, El nervously turned towards the dining table, wondering what they thought. As soon as El turned back, he saw their excited faces, oh my god, this is so good. El felt like he had just won the World Cup, amazing. They ate with delighted sighs, it's so hot, this is spicy, hot but delicious, it's so spicy. The spiciness of the kimchi made them sweat, but they still enjoyed the meal, finishing every last grain of rice on their plates. After finishing their first plates, the three women excitedly said to El, Ellie, can I have another serving, me too, me too, El smiled warmly and said, of course. After the small family feast ended, El happily thought to himself, it feels amazing that everyone likes my food. As El was humming, Silfer approached with a serious expression, Ellie, there's something I need to tell you. El pondered, what is it, why are you so serious? El nodded obediently, yes, mom, but he couldn't shake off the uneasiness in his heart, wondering what it was about. A while later, after finishing washing the dishes, El went to Silfer's room, the atmosphere between them was uncharacteristically tense. As El waited for Silfer to speak, he became even more anxious, Mom, you're not saying anything, is it that hard to say? Silfer furrowed her brow, seemingly struggling, El observed her expression and wondered, maybe she didn't really like the food earlier, no, that can't be. After taking a deep breath, Silfer clenched her fist and spoke with determination, Um, Ellie, the truth is, there's something I've always kept from you. It's about my past, and about your father, you're old enough now, I think I should tell you. Silfer looked seriously into El's eyes. Mom, the truth is, I am the daughter of Duke Einhardt from the kingdom of Blyard, Silfer von Einhardt. El's eyes widened in shock, what? He was stunned, unable to believe his ears, the Einhardt family from the kingdom of Blyard. Among hundreds of kingdoms on this continent, the kingdom of Blyard is one of the five most powerful, and the Einhardt family is a lineage of mages who have produced countless talented mages. They say Duke Einhardt is about to reach level 8 magic. 
His son, a level 7 mage, also holds power in the kingdom, they are an upper-class family with a strong sense of propriety. L fell into deep thought after hearing what Silfer had said, actually, I've always been curious about your background. The necklace you wear is a treasure only level 7 or higher mages can craft. And all the books in this house are extremely rare, only nobles or mages from prestigious families can obtain them. After a sigh, Silfer began to elaborate, Your grandmother passed away when I was only four days old. I was raised by my older brother, who was much older than me, and my grandfather was very strict with me. When I was seven, I was promised to the prince of the Blyard Kingdom. But, what I longed for was freedom, I didn't want to be bound by anything, I just wanted to live the life I wanted. I was very frustrated and trapped in that suffocating life until I met your father, Rain Luvius, and fell in love with him, he was also a magician working for the Einhardt family. Even though he wasn't a skilled magician, nor did he have a striking appearance, he was the one who gave wings to my dream of freedom. I was supposed to marry the prince when I turned sixteen, but I decided to run away with Rain, finally, I pursued my dream of freedom. Although the Einhardt family constantly chased us, as long as I had your father, I was happy. However, within a year, we were caught, I recounted this with a choked voice, as if something heavy was weighing down my heart, a painful memory came back. Many days after I was brought back, my father, Duke Ayart, came to my cell to advise me, how long do you intend to live like this, do you love that man so much, he asked. I resolutely replied, release him, or I will kill myself for you to see. Ai Yart sneered, you are just as stubborn as me, no, you two are a perfect match, he's worried about you too, you know. Meanwhile, Rain was imprisoned and tortured, but all he thought about was me, is she alright, Ai Yart mocked me, of course, I don't know, but aren't you two always like this, he said. After a while of mocking my intense love, Ai Yart suddenly changed his tone, alright, I will let him go, he said. He looked at me with a tender gaze and said, after all, you are still my precious daughter. I was immediately touched by A.I. Yart's gentle demeanor. That very night, A.I. Yart allowed us to meet for the last time before our separation. I rushed to Rain and said, I'm sorry, because of me, you had to go through this, Rain hugged me worriedly, I'm fine, but is what they told you true, are you going to stay here because of me? Rain said honestly, it's like being held hostage, but I stopped him. Although I was sad, I still said firmly, because of you, I was able to experience happiness, even though that time was short, I felt true happiness, so. Please leave this place and live happily, I can't live in a world without you, I couldn't hold back my heartache and burst into tears. Rain looked at me with eyes full of sorrow and pity. After looking into my eyes, Rain finally understood and didn't want to betray my feelings, he took my hand and said goodbye, even if we have to be apart, no matter what happens our love is eternal. As their overflowing emotions were surging, a streak of light flashed across the darkness. The light cut across Rain's neck, reflected in my shocked eyes. Blood splattered everywhere, blood stained my clothes, splattered onto my fair skin. The sky seemed to collapse before me, my eyes went blank, like a lost soul, unconsciously repeating Rain's name, Rain, Rain. A.I. Yart smirked and said to me, I kept my promise to you, Silfer, I have freed him from pain. He said nonchalantly, as if bestowing a favor on me, I even allowed you to say goodbye to him before executing him because I love you so much. Ai Yart glared at me and growled, be grateful for that. I immediately collapsed in pain, disappointment, and helplessness. I screamed, but the sound choked in my dry throat, only tears flowed endlessly. Remembering that painful past, I continued, Duke Einhardt never forgave us for breaking the engagement with the prince and tarnishing the family's reputation. I was disowned from the family, but for the sake of reputation, my father let me live here and said I could return when I became a level 6 grandmaster magician. I choked back a sob and said, at that time, all I thought about was how to end my life. I looked at Elle with a loving gaze, at that time, Ellie, I reconsidered when I was pregnant with you. You are the greatest happiness I have felt since then. To let my beloved son, Ellie, live a truly happy life, I want to give you the best things in the world, you are my life. I hesitated for a long time before saying, so, Ellie, 
I intend to return to the Einhardt family. My words made Elle speechless. I slowly stood up, now, I have become a level 6 Grandmaster Magician, the Einhardt family will let me return. She resolutely reached out to Elle, that's the best place for a magician to learn, I can provide you with a better learning environment if we go there, so, Ellie, come home with me. Elle was stunned by my proposal, this was even more unbelievable than what I had just told him. He asked me, bewildered, why, I explained, now that I'm a level 6 magician, you can gain titles and privileges when you return to the family. Elle thought to himself, I really don't understand, why would you want to return to that awful family, he asked me again, but why the Einhardt family? I tried to persuade Elle, the treatment of nobles in this country, the strongest country on the continent, is very different from the Blyard Empire, the Duke Einhardt's family is almost equivalent to royalty. I want you to fully utilize your potential in the best environment possible. So, I hope you will consider this choice, the determination in my eyes was evident. L looked silently into those eyes, he saw that they were filled with worry and love for him, for L, Silfer was willing to sacrifice her own life and return to that hell. Finally, L could only smile, he sighed and agreed to Silfer's wishes and sincere love. L leaned back against the windowsill and smiled fondly at Silfer, all right, I'll go. Silfer immediately responded with a happy smile and warm eyes filled with love. Silfer hugged her son tightly, mom loves you, Ellie, she said, stroking his hair, I love you too, mom, Ellie replied, we should start packing. L left Silfer's room with a heavy heart. As soon as he stepped out, he was surprised to see Serena and Kana standing there. The two girls looked gloomy and said, Sorry, we didn't mean to eavesdrop. They hesitated before approaching Elle and asking, So, what about us? Serena, fragile and heartbroken, started crying, We're basically slaves, if we go to the Einhardt family, we won't be able to. L didn't blame them for eavesdropping but simply smiled kindly at them. L gently comforted them, We're a family, of course we'll always be together, I'm also thinking of getting you two new identities like registering you as mercenaries, so don't worry about anything, just be confident. The smiles returned to the two girls' faces, thank you. L turned and instructed them, there's a place I need to go, but I can't let mom know, can you two watch over mom for me, and also get ready to move, Serena and Kana immediately nodded, yes. L turned away with a reassuring smile, although his mind was racing, he couldn't let them feel the burden. L left the house with countless worries, I can't change mom's mind, if that's the case. There's only one thing I can do, L's eyes held determination and he acted immediately. First, L went to Dibel's shop, thanks to the cooperation with L, the shop's conditions had improved significantly. As soon as Dibel saw L, he welcomed him with enthusiasm, L replied with a smile, it's been a while, Dibel. Dibel said happily, thanks to the magic stone selling rights you gave us business has been great lately, thank you so much. L didn't beat around the bush, I'm here today to ask for your help, if business is this good, you must have an excellent information network, right? Dibel replied enthusiastically, of course, we're connected to countless information gathering groups across the continent, if you want, I can even tell you where the king hides his black money, haha. L immediately asked, so, please tell me everything you know about the Einhardt family and the Blyard Empire. Dibel was slightly surprised by L's sudden request. Looking at L's angry, hateful eyes that seemed to hold a deep grudge, Dibel was taken aback. What's with this atmosphere? I've never seen the kid with this kind of face before. Dibel swallowed nervously, he hesitated for a moment, but then agreed the Einhardt family, all right. The Einhardt family is a noble family with a 700 year history in the Blyard Kingdom. They are one of the most prestigious families in the empire, they've had three level 8 mages, and hundreds of other mages under their command. Earl A.I. Yard is very influential and can summon thousands of mages if necessary. Besides, there's that famous story about the engagement to the prince, just before the wedding, the young lady from the earl's family ran away with another man. The earl and the prince generously forgave her and ensured a discreet life for her, it was a crime that could have gotten her beheaded but because they forgave her and overlooked that great sin, they were praised by many nobles. L almost went crazy when he heard this, what the hell? 
For a fleeting moment, El's eyes flashed with killing intent, they actually did something so awful, using my mother as a political pawn to solidify their boasting. Dybul continued, however, there are rumors that the Earl is cold and cruel, capable of doing anything for the family's honor, it's best to stay away from them, El jumped to his feet, his anger boiling over, so that's it. El thought angrily, if we go back to the Einhardt family, they clearly won't accept mom, they'll most likely take advantage of her, if they dare to harm us, I'll make them pay. Just as El was about to leave, Dybul added, and hey, Tower Master Brian seems very lonely. Following Dybul's suggestion, El went to the magic tower. Tower Master Brian, in a childish pout, said to El, it's obvious, isn't it, isn't it normal for an old man to be forgotten? El comforted the Tower Master with a smile, that's why I'm here to visit you, but the Tower Master still looked sulky and turned away, humph, El tried to coax him again, I brought a gift too. The Tower Master finally turned around, a gift, El took out a bundle of papers and handed them to him. He said excitedly to the Tower Master, this is a pre-order for a golem knight. The Tower Master instantly became excited, jumping up, oh, oh, this is really. L added, however, creating a golem with its own consciousness is impossible, it needs a knight to control it, I doubt any mage could make a golem with consciousness. The Tower Master suddenly smiled slyly, hmm, is that so? L pretended to be naive and asked, what's wrong, the Tower Master asked frankly, it seems like you haven't told me everything you know, L replied casually, it's just that I've been experimenting and haven't gotten anywhere, so I'm tired. The Tower Master still kept his sly smile and looked at L, okay, if you say so, L laughed nervously to avoid the issue, thinking to himself, wow, he caught on quickly. L changed the subject, well, I'm about to leave with my family. I think we won't be able to come back, the Tower Master raised an eyebrow in doubt, what do you mean? After observing L, Tower Master Brian stroked his beard thoughtfully. He slowly stood up and walked towards L, looking at your expression, it seems like something big is going on. Tower Master Brian placed his hand on L's shoulder and looked directly into his eyes, all right, go, with your talent, you'll surely make a name for yourself on this continent one day. No matter where you are, I'm sure I'll hear about you. L smiled back, reciprocating the Tower Master's kindness. Thank you for everything. One day, I will definitely come back to visit. The Tower Master nodded. I'll be waiting. L returned to the workshop as night fell. All right, I've said goodbye to everyone. He was in the workshop alone and seemed very excited. Now, for the final preparations. L raised his hand and opened his magic inventory. From within the inventory, a golem knight appeared, its intricately crafted helmet giving it a lifelike appearance, while the metal exuded a sense of solidity. The golem knight was perfectly equipped, clad in full armor from head to toe, standing over three meters tall. El gleefully looked at the results of his research before him, he told the old tower master he couldn't do it, but in reality. He immediately commanded, wake up, golden knight. Responding to El's words, the Golden Knight began to show signs of life, a light flickered through the gap in the knight's mask. Afterwards, the knight moved naturally like a human, kneeling gracefully before El, a gesture showing respect to its master. With a respectful attitude, the knight bowed its head and said to El, My master, greetings. Although the Golden Knight could only speak in brief sentences, El couldn't help but smile in satisfaction, even though he couldn't place the best spirit within you. I will soon need you. He instructed it, from now on, just wait quietly in the inventory bag. The knight immediately nodded in response, Master, I will, wait, its intelligence may not be high, but its loyalty is commendable. A bright golden light erupted from the golden knight's body, and L watched as it disappeared into the space of his inventory bag. L sighed in relief to himself, the crystallization of all my magical knowledge, it will appear whenever I need it though I hope I will never have to see its power. L took a deep breath to motivate himself, all right, it's time to go. Meanwhile, at the Einhardt Marquis Mansion, A.I. Yart's son, Glutton, reported to A.I. Yart while playing chess, father, the investigation regarding the magic stone is complete, A.I. Yart scoffed, they've been hiding from us and making a fortune, haven't they? Glutton continued to move a chess piece with a smug attitude, I've found the source. 
Immediately after, A.I. Yart slammed another chess piece, capturing his son's piece. A malicious look appeared on A.I. Yart's face, finally found it. A.I. Yart frowned and questioned Glutton, but why did it take you so long to find the source of the magic stone, I told you to investigate years ago? Glutton hurriedly explained, the golem's protective layer was too strong. Even the top cold-blooded assassins from the Brad family were killed. A.I. Yart furrowed his brow in contemplation, H.M., a formidable opponent, does this mean they've discovered something others haven't been able to recover? Glutton nodded, the other magic towers are frantically searching for the origin of the magic stone. He reported thoroughly to A.I. Yart, Father, you know, it doesn't cost much to create, so if we produce the magic stone, it would be a magical artifact that could earn us a lot of money. A.I. Yart narrowed his eyes, a glimmer of ambition shining in them, H.M., indeed a fine item. He schemed and calculated, if I can sell it, among the top ten shops on the continent, the Einhardt family shop will be the strongest. Glutton looked at A.I. Yart's eager expression with a bit of surprise, Father, you rarely give compliments, the fact that you just praised the magic stone means it must be a very valuable artifact. Glutton, seeing this, became even more eager to show off, fortunately, I finally found the origin of the magic stone, Father. He said with a sly smile, surprisingly, the one who created it is a mage named Silfer. A.I. Yart's eyes widened in surprise at this. Glutton continued to report, to be precise, it's her son, L, but he's only seventeen years old. So I think Silfer is the one who created it. A cunning look spread across A.I. Yart's face, Silfer, the daughter I abandoned, is that Silfer, send someone immediately and bring Silfer here to me. A.I. Yart sneered instructing Glutton, make it clear that we will accept her back into this family, if you tell her we'll also accept her son, she'll agree, she's just a stubborn fool. A.I. Yart burst out laughing in delight, if we get the magic stone, the Einhardt family will return to its golden age once again. Glutton worriedly asked him, Father, what about the prince, will he be angry if Silfer returns, A.I. Yart nonchalantly waved his hand, don't worry about him, as long as we don't touch him, he won't do anything to us. A.I. Yart smugly thought to himself, to me, she was a waste, but the time has come for the daughter I abandoned to become useful to me. The next morning, the whole L family was ready to leave, Silfer felt a bit of regret as she stood in front of their peaceful little house. Her eyes were filled with sadness, as if she didn't want to leave. Seeing Silfer hesitate, L called out, let's go, mom. Silfer responded in confusion, I'm sorry. I didn't think we'd be leaving so soon, but we have to go now, my heart feels heavy. Elle looked into Silfer's thoughtful eyes and felt sad too. I said I would return to that family, but honestly, I'd be fine if I didn't go back to that place filled with painful memories. He pondered silently, I want to tell my mom that I've become a seventh level master mage. But in a world where people consider a 40 year old reaching level 7 a genius, I don't know how to explain to my mom why a 17-year-old boy has reached that level, I don't want my mom to look at me differently because I'm not normal. After a moment of contemplation, L resolutely clenched his fist, so I can't tell my mom everything now, if my power is accidentally exposed, it must be due to unavoidable circumstances. After leaving home, the four of them went to the teleportation gate in the city of Banzark. Silfer pointed to the gate and said, that arched door will take us to the capital, Keffermill. Silfer went to the guard and politely bowed, excuse me, but four of us want to go to Keffermill, how much does it cost? The gatekeeper shouted the price, 200 gold each, a total of 800 gold, Silfer was shocked upon hearing this, 800 gold. She couldn't help but complain, that's too expensive, the gatekeeper replied nonchalantly, can't afford it. He grabbed Silfer's wrist menacingly and threatened, almost everyone who uses this gate is a noble or very wealthy, if you can't afford it, then get lost. Seeing Silfer being bullied, Kana instantly vanished from her spot. Less than a second later, Kana's swift foot swung towards the gatekeeper's face. Just as her heel was about to land on his cheek, it stopped. Kana glared menacingly and warned, don't you dare touch my family, or you'll regret it. Elle and Serena were both startled by Kana's fierce reaction and her quick reflexes. Silfer turned around and looked at Kana, confused, Kana, what's wrong? 
The gatekeeper raised his hand to block Kana's foot, his hand trembled with fear, but he still muttered disrespectfully, Brat. As the situation escalated, a man stepped out from the side of the gate and said, Stop, look at the trouble you've caused in such a short time. The man approached Silfer and apologized, My apologies, madam, he was being rude while I was away. The polite young gatekeeper immediately grabbed the rude one and scolded him, Come here, now. The polite man turned to Elle and her mother with a smile and said, You wish to go to Kefermil, right? It takes about half a year to walk to the kingdom of Blyard, so the total cost will be four hundred gold. Silfer excitedly clasped her hands together in gratitude, That's amazing, I knew it would be around that price, there's a discount for more than four people, so the final price is three hundred and sixty gold, L breathed a sigh of relief, we almost paid eight hundred gold. Immediately after, Silfer handed the money to the gatekeeper. He quickly prepared to open the gate and asked, Are you all going on vacation? L cheerfully replied, No, we're moving there. The man laughed and said, I understand, with a family like this, I'm sure you'll feel at home. The eyes of the three people in the house immediately focused on Kana, the bodyguard who had just shown her strength. After a while, the man led them and invited them to the magical circle area. The four of them carefully stood inside the magical circle in the middle of the teleportation gate. Then, several rays of light moved like falling stars towards them. The three teenagers, seeing this for the first time, were surprised and excited. After only a few seconds, the four of them disappeared through the teleportation gate. At the same time, a brilliant light appeared at the gate in the capital city. In a blink of an eye, the four of them fell from the sky into the magical circle in the middle of the light. Serena looked around in amazement, we're here, Kana also looked around at the unfamiliar scenery and replied, yes, I think so. Although they had seen the city of Banzark many times, the three teenagers were still overwhelmed by the bustling scene and the huge buildings in the capital city, wow, so this is what Kefermil looks like. Silfer pointed to a large inn and said, we'll stay at that place today. She had a plan and told them, before we go to the Marquis territory, we need to register Serena and Kana as mercenaries. Silfer said with confidence, with their skills, they'll definitely be high-ranking mercenaries. She smiled brightly, seemingly forgetting her previous worries, let's pack up and go out to play, mom will take you all on a tour. Suddenly, a disgusting voice echoed, causing Silfer to freeze, is that you, Silfer? Silfer stopped in front of a group of people and stared at the most luxuriously dressed man among them, Prince Al-Qaid. Al-Qaid smiled warmly at Silfer, finally, I've met you again, Silfer. El was shocked and frowned at Al-Qaid, the prince, my mother's former fiancé. According to the information El received from the Dybel store after many investigations, after Silfer was captured after escaping from her family. El's father, Raynon Luvius, was brutally murdered, and it was by order of the prince. This event plunged Silfer into depression and she almost couldn't recover, it was all because of Al-Qaid's cruel manipulative hand behind the scenes. Al-Qaid pretended to be affectionate towards Silfer, you look healthy, I'm relieved, Silfer couldn't hide her tense expression when facing him, yes, your highness. He unexpectedly shrugged with a fake smile, relax. Al-Qaid continued to play the role of a good man and told her, We parted ways unfortunately, but I'm glad to see you again. He curiously pointed at the three people behind Silfer, Who are these children? Silfer nervously replied, Well, how should I say it? Kana innocently leaned into Serena's ear and whispered, He seems like a polite person, not like what we've heard. Unlike the two trusting girls, El's eyes stared suspiciously at Al-Qaid, this man. He's just pretending, El had already seen through the sinister face hidden behind Al-Qaid's friendly smile. Al-Qaid looked at Silfer with lustful, animalistic eyes, you're as beautiful as ever, you must be thirty now, but you're still so charming, the most beautiful woman in the kingdom of Blyard, you're perfect to be my woman. Al-Qaid didn't take his eyes off Silfer, as if he wanted to devour her, no matter what happens, I must have her. El couldn't contain his anger because he could see his hidden intentions after reaching level 7. Seeing Silfer being made uncomfortable by Al-Qaid, El stepped forward with a furious expression, You know my mother, ha! Huh? The next second, he smiled insincerely in response, Pleased to meet you, 
I'm my mother's son, L. L deliberately emphasized the word son to warn him, don't you dare look at my mother with those dirty eyes. Al-Qaeda's expression immediately turned sour and unpleasant, son. Between the two men, it was as if lightning had struck and a silent battle was about to erupt. Al-Qaeda chuckled, so you're her son, ha, ha, you really do look like her. L raised his chin, making sure Al-Qaeda remembered his face, and continued to smile amiably. Al-Qaeda, seeing a roadblock, used it as an excuse to retreat, I'd love to chat more, but I have business to attend to, when we have a chance, let's go grab a drink, shall we? L replied cheerfully, of course, farewell. When he arrived before Silfer, Al-Qaeda whispered with a completely different demeanor. Finally revealing his desire, he brazenly declared to Silfer, you belong to me. Silfer froze at his words, horrified that after all these years, he still hadn't let go of her. L, of course, heard those words and was about to make a scene, this bastard, he just, but he managed to contain his anger. Al-Qaeda left nonchalantly, thinking to himself, she will eventually return to her clan. He arrogantly thought, perhaps she has become a level 6 mage, beautiful and talented, she seems worthy of me. The duke's mind was filled with insidious schemes, taking her as my empress wouldn't be bad, I could also appease Duke Einhardt and secure his support, but first, I need to deal with that little brat. L, with murderous intent, followed Al-Qaeda's every move, barely suppressing his rage in front of everyone. Once Al-Qaeda vanished from their sight, L worriedly held Silfer, who was trembling in fear. Silfer forced a smile, um, sorry, I shouldn't make you worry, let's go to the mercenary guild and register. She tried to appear strong and cheerful, I'm sure you'll do great, my children. After that, they headed straight for the mercenary guild headquarters. The lobby was spacious and elegant, but seemed rather deserted. Silfer said to the receptionist, Excuse me, two of us would like to take the mercenary qualification test. The receptionist warmly welcomed them, Ah, yes, please come in. The male receptionist explained the rules briefly, Mercenaries are ranked from F to B. To determine your rank, you will fight the guildmaster, who is an A-ranked mercenary. Soon after, they met a man with a muscular build but a friendly face. Ha! Ah, two women today, are you alright with this? You two are so cute. The mercenary guildmaster confidently challenged Serena and Kana. Alright, why don't you both go at once? He even teased them, I'll go easy on you, so it won't hurt. The guildmaster's condescending attitude immediately angered the two girls. They resolutely signaled to each other that they would teach him a lesson about underestimating women. Soon after, the three of them stood on the arena, the guildmaster, still radiating confidence, declared, you can attack whenever you want. Kana and Serena clenched their fists simultaneously, showcasing their shared determination to take him down. The guildmaster still chuckled, give it your best shot, he. Serena and Kana confirmed in unison, you sure about that? The guildmaster laughed, don't worry, I won't be mad. The two girls exuded fierce energy, all right, then. Kana unsheathed her sword instantly. In a blink, she leaped into the air, disappearing from the guildmaster's view. Kana attacked from above, plunging downwards with her sword imbued with powerful energy, the blazing sword. With just one strike, she sent the guildmaster flying back eight paces. As Kana finished her move, Serena showcased her magic. She summoned a powerful whirlwind, swirling the guildmaster in the air, leaving him dazed. And just like that, Serena also easily defeated the guildmaster with a single move. After the battle ended, the two of them stood nervously, awaiting the results. The guildmaster, his mind reeling and his stomach churning, finally managed to utter a few words, B, they are beranked. L, upon hearing the news, clapped excitedly for the two girls, congratulations, you did great, you both achieved a high rank. Serena breathed a sigh of relief, thank goodness, Kana turned to Silfer, is this enough to protect mom now? It was clear that Silfer hadn't escaped the terrifying obsession of Al-Qaeda, as she stood there in a daze. Noticing Silfer's distraction, L gently called out to her, mom, Silfer startled, turning to face them. Silfer forced another smile, clapping for Serena and Kana, yes, you two are amazing, incredible. 
Elle saw the anxiety and fear in Silfer's heart but didn't know what to do to lift her spirits. Back at the inn, Elle left Silfer to rest in her room, still looking stiff, and went downstairs with Serena and Kana. Silfer's expression in her room was very complicated, he hadn't changed at all. Her anxiety surged due to the trauma she had endured, Silfer couldn't help but think in horror, he's still obsessed with possessing me, still wants to force me to be his empress. If so, Ellie will, she thought, remembering the loss of Rian. Silfer became increasingly confused, Ellie is everything to me, I would give up anything for Ellie's well-being, I can't let anything happen to her. Silfer furrowed her brow with worry, I want to return to my clan peacefully, but I met the prince here, Einhart will obey the prince instead of protecting Ellie, I have to ensure my clan will protect Ellie, to do that. Just then, El knocked on the door, interrupting Silfer's thoughts, Mom, I'm here. As soon as El appeared, Silfer immediately suggested, Ellie. What do you think about exchanging the method of creating magic stones for Einhart's, as a condition for negotiation? El was a little surprised by Silfer's suggestion, he was a bit confused about his mother's intentions. Silfer innocently told El, the whole continent is going crazy for magic stones, I'm sure the Marquis would also be very interested in that information, if you give him the formula, he'll protect you. El confidently reassured Silfer, Mom, I can protect everyone without having to do that. Serena and Kana also walked into the room at this time, and Mom, we're here too. The two girls smiled warmly and comforted the anxious Silfer, we'll protect you and El. The three teenagers suddenly took out alcohol and snacks, and laughed happily, Mom, please relax, let's celebrate and forget about all those unpleasant things. Elle chuckled and raised the bottle of wine, I'm seventeen now, I'm allowed to drink. Serena and Kana followed Elle with a pile of things, we've also prepared some food. Silfer was surprised by the small but unexpected joy they prepared, my children, since when? Looking at her son and two adopted daughters, who would be her support, Silfer couldn't help but feel incredibly grateful and loving, her eyes were filled with warmth and tenderness as she looked at them, and in this moment, she wanted to lean on her children without hesitation. After that, the four of them happily ate and drank, and a radiant smile finally returned to Silfer's face. While pouring wine, Elle thought, my parents in my previous life passed away very early, so I never had the chance to drink with them. Elle's heart was filled with regret, as life became increasingly difficult, he was still unable to do anything, he wanted to help them, but he was too young at the time. He looked at his happy little family and told himself, in this life, maybe I can become stronger, faster than others. In this life, I will definitely protect my mother with my own strength, something I couldn't do for my parents in the previous life. With a voice filled with warmth and tenderness, Elle smiled brightly, everyone, I love you, Silfer, her eyes filled with tears of happiness, replied, Ellie, are you drunk, you're such a lovely son. Elle made a promise to himself, but the sound from his mind echoed to the golden night, I will definitely not forgive anyone who dares to break this happiness. A bright light flashed from the gap in the knight's helmet, its deep and intermittent voice echoed in the darkness, my master, the order has been received. The next morning, after Silfer's spirits had lifted, they prepared to visit the duke's mansion, El was still somewhat anxious, hoping for a smooth day. He sighed and gazed out the hotel window at the bustling cityscape, mentally preparing for the worst-case scenarios. As the sun reached its zenith, El's family arrived at the gates of the Einhart family's mansion, a vast courtyard with a magnificent building appeared before them, prompting Serena to exclaim, Wow, it's so big! Even the usually quiet Kana had to comment, it's no wonder they're the most prestigious family, it's as big as the walls in Banzark, Serena nodded in agreement, yeah, it's amazing. In contrast to the girl's enthusiasm, Silfer felt heavy-hearted, she sighed softly, her mood unchanged. After struggling with the oppressive feeling for a while, Silfer tried to regain her composure by taking a deep breath. Silfer stared at the mansion with a determined gaze and walked straight towards it without hesitation. As soon as they saw Silfer approaching, the gate guards immediately asked, This is the Duke Einhardt's mansion, why are you here? Silfer replied, I'm here to see the Duke. The guard looked at her with suspicion, Do you have an appointment? If not, you can't see him. 
Silfer declared to the guard with unwavering strength, tell Duke Einhardt that after seventeen years, Silfer has returned. The guard, facing Silfer's radiant aura, was startled and exclaimed, Miss Silfer, forgive me, I will inform him right away. Immediately, the guard rushed into the mansion to deliver the news. Silfer felt a little anxious as she waited outside the mansion, she pondered, according to rumors, the Einhardt family's power had significantly declined after the annulment of the engagement. And after sending me away, father was so heartbroken that he fasted for a whole month, executing Raynon was the prince's order, so he had no choice, it wasn't that he didn't want to do it. Suddenly, the image of Inyart, furious after killing Raynon, flashed in Silfer's mind, he had said, be grateful, recalling that scene, Silfer couldn't help but wonder why he said those words. Seeing Silfer's uneasiness and deep contemplation, El approached and placed his hand on her shoulder, comforting her. Silfer was startled and turned to see her son's gentle smile and kind eyes. She seemed to calm down instantly, Silfer responded to El with a kind and trusting smile. At that moment, Inyart and Glutton emerged, their expressions a mixture of surprise and anxiety, Inyart's voice trembled as he called out his daughter's name, Silfer, Silfer responded with a polite nod, father, brother. Inyart rushed towards Silfer, his voice filled with emotion, I apologize, Silfer, it was my fault. Silfer stared at Inyart's reaction, bewildered, father, the one who always exuded confidence and pursued the honor and glory of the family is apologizing to me, then, her eyes filled with confusion, sympathy, and sorrow. Silfer thought to herself, there must have been a reason for father's actions, the feeling of disgust and fear towards this cold-blooded family vanished, and Silfer choked out, I apologize, father. Understanding Silfer's emotions, Inyard acted warmly, as if forgiving her, then looked directly at El and asked, is this your son? Silfer was slightly taken aback. She introduced him nervously, yes, he's my son, El, turning to El, Silfer tried to smile and said, Ellie, this is your grandfather, El replied in a choked voice, I'm El, sir, he seemed to struggle with his words, overcome with emotion, but only El himself knew he was forcing a smile. Inyart smiled warmly at El instantly, yes, I'm your grandfather, it's a pleasure to meet you. El quickly saw through Inyart's true nature in that moment. Although he appeared kind for a fleeting second, his eyes changed the instant he saw El. Furthermore, El noticed that Inyart immediately examined his mana, the Duke couldn't help but be astonished, no, it's impossible, a level 5 mage at that age. Even though he continued to smile at El, Inyart's mind was now filled with schemes, Silfer reaching level 6 was already surprising enough, but this little brat is level 5 at only 17 years old, I can't underestimate him. El knew exactly what Inyart was doing but felt no anxiety, the duke possessed the immense power of a level 7 master mage, but since El was at the same level, he could hide his true strength, the duke wouldn't realize he had already reached level 7. Glutton, seeing enough of this emotional reunion, suggested, Father, let's go inside and talk, Inyart nodded in agreement, all right, do as you say. Afterward, everyone quickly went inside the mansion. Sitting in the spacious living room, Inyart said warmly to Silfer, I've sent the two girls to rest with you, I want us to talk about family matters, a heavy feeling began to permeate the atmosphere, Silfer asked calmly, yes, what is it about? Inyart no longer concealed his ambition, he directly asked Silfer, is it true you invented the formula for creating mana stones, Silfer was taken aback by this unexpected question, she hadn't realized Inyart already knew about it. Inyart calculated inwardly, if we can sell mana stones, our family's wealth will double. And we'll have immense influence over the Empire's mages, the Einhardt family will become much stronger, and the royal family will no longer be able to rule the Empire. Inyart's desire grew stronger with each thought, that power will be ours, I can't miss this opportunity. El silently observed Inyart, greed filled his eyes, making it clear he was scheming about something. Inyart shamelessly made a demand to his once disowned daughter, Silfer, now that we're reunited, I hope we can be open with each other, contributing to the family is your duty. Silfer found it ridiculous, duty, she spoke directly without hesitation, but, there is a condition, Inyart raised an eyebrow, a hint of annoyance in his tone, a condition. Silfer looked directly into Inyart's eyes with a determined attitude, make El the Duke. 
both Inyart and Glutton were shocked and exclaimed simultaneously, What? Are you serious? Even L was taken aback by Silfer's request. Silfer nodded resolutely, Of course, Ellie is the one who created the mana stones. I had no part in it, you probably realized that while examining his mana, right, L is already a level 5 mage at only 17 years old. L's eyes widened in further surprise as he looked at Silfer, what, you noticed what he did. Silfer continued with determination, among all the level 8 master mages on the entire continent, no one has ever reached level 5 at 17 years old, Ellie will soon become a powerful mage who can shake the entire continent. The value of mana stones is recognized throughout the continent, combine that with the leadership of the most talented mage in the world. And the Einhardt family can become the greatest family on the continent, not just within the Blyard Empire, answer me, father, will you make him duke? And Yart chuckled and tried to stall, I can't make such a major decision right now, but Silfer was determined to push him, no, I came here with the purpose of making Ellie the heir, you need to decide now. The smile instantly vanished, and Yart was stunned by Silfer's transformation, she was no longer the weak, easily manipulated person she used to be. Silfer continued with a resolute attitude, Ellie will become even more powerful than you, if you can't give me an answer, then I can't reveal the secret behind mana stones to anyone. Inyart's face turned ashen, and his eyes gradually hardened with murderous intent, I've never seen her like this, she always obeyed me and glutton like a lamb, but now, humph, when she was a daughter, she was weak, but when she became a mother, she became strong, ha. Huh. After a while, Inyart spoke in a harsh tone, all right. He said reluctantly, I need some time to think, I'll consider this, Silfer pondered for a moment then nodded, I will wait for your decision. Afterwards, El and Silfer returned to the room Glutton had arranged for them, both of them walked silently without talking to each other, the corridor seemed to become longer because of their heavy steps. El finally managed to speak hesitantly, um, mother, what you said just now. Silfer smiled kindly and turned back to reassure El, don't worry but of course, he still couldn't stop worrying. Just as El was about to say something, Serena and Kana came out, they had been anxiously waiting in the room for a while, so when they heard the noise in the hallway, they immediately went out. Seeing the worried expressions on the two girls, Silfer gently embraced them and comforted them, Serena, Kana, I'm sorry, I left you like that. Kana and Serena nervously held Silfer's hand tightly, Mother, we were very worried. Are you okay? Silfer smiled lovingly and replied, Yeah, thank you both, I'm fine, have you seen your rooms yet, let me take you there. Seeing Silfer deliberately avoiding the issue, Elle didn't want to press her either, he just silently walked into the room with anxiety, I didn't expect my mother to say those words. He pondered thoughtfully, after all, there's no way the Marquis, he would agree to that condition, I need to plan more carefully for my future. After a moment of thought, L decided to summon his magic glasses. With his summoning, a square-shaped object began to form in front of him and extended to both sides, resting against his ear. After only a few seconds, the glasses that professional player Junhook used on Earth were reborn here. L pushed the glasses up slightly with a confident look. My eyes are not affected by astigmatism, but I need these glasses to focus better. When he gently raised the glasses upright, L suddenly remembered the memories of his past life. It was because of these glasses that his identity as a professional player was exposed. L unconsciously smiled, this reminds me of the past, the glory days of a professional gamer, although he never experienced real battles, his gaming career taught him the importance of maximizing the potential of support spells. Therefore, when creating the magic glasses, L had imbued it with a magic eye spell that allowed him to sense the flow of mana more clearly, L happily thought to himself, now I'm going to see what the Marquis is really thinking. Immediately L chanted, the invisibility spell, when reaching level 7, he could cast the invisibility spell with just a simple incantation. When the incantation took effect, L's body became transparent and his mana, which had been concentrated tightly beforehand, began to resonate with the surrounding mana in the air. L was perfectly hidden by the invisibility spell, traversing the complex in the Marquis Mansion, silently heading towards the Marquis private room. L's appearance now was almost indistinguishable from the surrounding mana and his breath was carefully concealed, it would be very difficult for anyone less skilled than him to detect him. 
El was searching for the marquee room when a voice from a room at the end of the corridor echoed, Father, what are you going to do? Are you really going to make that child the heir? He immediately approached the marquee door with extreme caution. Then, the extraordinary level 7 mage was able to pass through that barrier door relatively easily. El listened intently, and Yard held a dagger in his hand and said, Don't make that face, her son is certainly qualified for that position. He playfully tossed the blade in his hand, level 5 at just 17 years old, he's extremely talented. But a child who grew up in a foreign land for 17 years, he's not suitable for this family. As soon as Inyart finished speaking, the knife in his hand pierced the target on the wall. Inyart shrugged and said to Glutton, who knows if he's here for revenge. Glutton felt relieved that El wouldn't take his position, but he still looked annoyed, Silfer is also a level 6 mage, so she might be a big problem. Inyart snorted while choosing another dagger, a big problem, we have 20 level 6 mages or higher here, we won't lose. Inyart glanced at Glutton with a cunning look. Do you remember the letter I received from the prince? He laughed triumphantly. It says if I agree, he'll take Silfer as his queen. Glutton seemed worried and asked Inyart, but is that all right? She probably knows about it by now. Glutton hesitated and said, if she becomes the prince's queen. She might reveal that we secretly kidnapped talented individuals from the empire to brainwash them and force them to join our family's service. Inyart was furious when he heard that. Shut up. Glutton immediately fell silent in astonishment. Inyart glared at Glutton and warned him, even with soundproofing spells, it's still possible for secrets to leak out. El sat behind the screen and thought to himself, they really are a guilty conscience, just now I went around and found they installed a lot of magic traps, even a level 6 mage would find it difficult to disarm them, they're really careful. A bold thought suddenly flashed through El's mind, if these secrets are revealed, it could bring down the entire Einhart family. Glutton was scolded and quickly lowered his head. I won't mention it again, and Yart lowered his voice and replied, very well, there's no need to worry about the prince either. And Yart smiled maliciously again, the prince is involved in this too, he won't harm himself, Glutton asked him, so what do we tell him, father? And Yart waved the dagger in his hand the prince's proposal, the magic stone, El's talent. They are all valuable things, so what are you going to do? He suddenly handed the dagger to Glutton with a serious look. Glutton nervously and cautiously looked at the dagger in Inyart's hand, this is a test, if I can't make up for my past mistakes, then. He pondered for a moment, trying to find an answer that would satisfy Inyart, then swallowed his anxiety. Glutton reached out to take the dagger and replied, first. I'll tell the prince that I'll be happy to make Silfer his queen. He continued to plot his vile schemes, then I will capture El, I will use the method of creating the magic stone from Silfer to exchange for El's life, seeing Glutton pause, and Yark glanced at him sideways, oh, is that all? Glutton decisively threw the dagger towards the target, the sound of the flying knife slicing through the air was heard, he said coldly, no. When the dagger struck the target straight, Glutton glared and said, I will extract information about the magic stone and force Silfer to the prince even if I have to use violence, if she resists, I will seal her magic. His next words truly shocked El, then I will brainwash El so that he will be loyal to our family, we can show the prince a body that looks like El, and say that he died in an unfortunate magic accident. When Glutton finished his presentation, Inyart laughed heartily and clapped his hands, praising him, well done, Glutton you are truly my heir, very good, he excitedly patted his son on the shoulder, then I will entrust this task to you, I am waiting for your results, a spark of excitement flickered in Glutton's eyes, I will do my best. El witnessed everything and couldn't help but be filled with rage, truly a cold-blooded family. He tried to control the rising rage within him, why didn't I just refuse my mother's request then and avoid this cursed place? As his anger intensified, El started to regret and blame himself, it's because I overestimated my own magical abilities. And I thought I could fulfill everything that would make my mother happy, no matter what happened. I just wanted to respect her opinion. But because of my weakness, everything turned out like this. If they were just going to use me, I could still handle it. But they are involved with the prince and a bunch of dirty schemes, I won't forgive them, El clenched his teeth trying to contain his anger, waiting for a more opportune moment. 
but El couldn't do it, his anger was too great, mana in the vicinity of the room raged like a whirlwind, at the same time, the man around El quickly moved and formed a mass, attracting Inyard's attention, he was stunned to realize that someone was using stealth magic in the room. Inyart was stunned, his eyes widened as he looked towards the screen, that person has been sitting there since the beginning, I didn't even notice, he shouted loudly, who is there? L, no longer wanting to hide his true abilities, directly created a massive energy sphere. Inyart and Glutton were both stunned by the sudden appearance of the abundant mana, the magic of a level 7 mage was being cast right here. Before Inyart and his son could understand what was happening, El had already accumulated enough rage and energy for a massive fireball. They had no time to dodge as El emerged with a murderous expression. When anger completely took over his mind, he angrily roared, explode, a normal mage would take 10 to 30 minutes to cast a spell, but El was different. The powerful energy surged forth, captivating Inyart and his son with their bewildered eyes. Dozens of mana circles were spreading around L. Dozens of mana circles ignited simultaneously, level 7 magic that could kill thousands, and now it was exploding in the room located at the heart of the Einhart Manor. Even the defensive magic spread throughout the manor couldn't stop L's magic, a blazing inferno erupted, the range of L's level 7 magic wasn't wide, but in terms of power, it was stronger than a typical level 7 fire spell. One side of the manor, where Inyart's room was located, was completely blown up, the massive building had turned into hell with red flames flying around, creating a bleak atmosphere with shattered debris. As the smoke and flames cleared, Count Inyart and Glutton remained motionless, they were unharmed even by such a powerful level 7 spell, they were looking at L with bewildered eyes. Inyart exclaimed in shock, unbelievable, other mages would take half an hour to cast a spell like this this is a level 7 spell that can kill thousands. After the terrifying explosion, the Einhart soldiers rushed over, my lord, Lord Glutton, are you all right, who is? At this moment, El's voice echoed, it held a deep gloom that sent chills down the listener's spine, you are still alive. El was flying in the air, slowly descending, stopping about 10 meters above the ground, he looked down at Inyart and his son with a scornful, angry gaze, very well, my anger is too great to give you a quick and easy end. L's voice was dark and ominous, as if echoing from hell, I will surely make you suffer endlessly. I will make you forever regret, for daring to touch my family. A faint magical circle began to glow behind L, at the same time, spatial cracks started to appear. L pointed his hand towards Inyart and his son, his eyes cold, he declared in a sharp voice, misery, and destruction, for those who dare to stand in my way. In an instant, a golden light spread out like an explosion, blinding everyone, the spatial gate opened, and the golden knight stepped out with graceful movements. A majestic body, towering over three meters, surrounded by golden light, this was the first official appearance of the golden knight, causing the Einhart soldiers to panic in fear, that, that is, a golden knight, why is it here? Contrary to the soldier's stunned reaction, Inyart laughed gleefully, ah ha, 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 even his son couldn't understand what he was thinking. The greedy eyes of Count Inyart stared intently at the Golden Knight with a savage smile, excellent, this is perfect, even at this moment, Inyart was still thinking about the benefit of his family. The panicked soldiers tried to reassure each other, no one has a Golden Knight back, it's fake, I swear on the name Inyart that I will stop you. After that bold statement, the soldiers fiercely raised their swords and charged towards El and the Golden Knight. The Golden Knight, sensing the attack, immediately entered combat mode. The Golden Knight swung his sword horizontally, his sword path filled with the radiance of a swordsman, dazzling blue light shimmered and shone, it was a heavy blow, the aura emitted from the sword created a storm and attacked all five soldiers. The soldiers groaned, were flung back and then fell to the ground, Glutton exclaimed in shock, how is that possible? He looked in horror at the soldiers lying in pools of blood, all the knights have. Once again showing his unconventional attitude, Inyart burst into laughter as he saw his soldiers killed by the Golden Knight, ha, 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 of course, how could it be fake? Inyart laughed savagely, his eyes full of ambition, my family can become incredibly powerful with that thing. Greed had completely clouded Inyart's judgment, he roared, directing his soldiers, attack, the enemy is still alive, kill that bastard. 
and Yark ferociously pointed at L. We must force him to reveal the secret behind the Golden Knight. A cold light, as if able to freeze everything, emanated from L as he stared at Count and Yart. You're too greedy, your life is already luxurious enough, aren't you satisfied yet? L's warning had no effect, it was natural, and Yart responded with a mocking sneer. Unable to contain his boiling anger, L continued to cast level 7 magic, the Golden Knight's entire body was enveloped in a delicate blue hue of mana. L continuously pumped more energy into the Golden Knight, the layers of mana were constantly stacking on top of each other, becoming increasingly abundant. Intense mana erupted like a waterfall, pouring into every part of the Golden Knight, even Glutton, standing before L's power, was startled, that brat's mana is too strong. The blindingly bright light emanating from the Golden Knight overwhelmed Glutton, it was like the energy radiating from a high-level swordsman rather than a mindless golem, amazing, this powerful mana flow must be the level of a Grand Master Swordsman, no, even more than that. While not reacting as vehemently as Glutton, Inyart was shocked inwardly, someone could transfer so much power to a golem while only being level 5, but when I checked, the kid was indeed level 5. Now he finally understood, so back then. The person who used level 7 magic. The one who created the explosion capable of killing thousands. Could it be, and Yart's face turned more panicked than ever, he was so engrossed in his ambition of the Golden Knight that he forgot about this. And Yart turned his gaze towards L, was he really a level 7 mage? At that moment, L turned his head and looked down at him. When their eyes met, a mocking smile appeared on L's lips, and Yart was certain of his guess upon seeing that smile, dare you deliberately deceive me, the youngest level 7 mage. Inyart's expression instantly changed, he was so furious that his veins bulged, and he launched an attack on L, you arrogant brat. Unable to contain his raging anger, he cast level 7 magic directly at L. Despite facing one of the Empire's most powerful mages, L remained calm, he looked at Inyart with icy eyes. To counter Inyart, L raised his hand and created a shield. Inyart's attack was like a mosquito bite, completely blocked by L's magical shield. After blocking the attack, L continued to stare at those two vile creatures. A sense of contempt rose within him, you and my uncle, the two of you who deliberately tried to take advantage of me and my mother. No, these two don't even deserve the title of family. After staring at them for a while with deadly eyes, L opened his mouth with a cold voice, I. Just as L opened his mouth, Silfer's voice rang out, Ellie, what's going on? Serena and Kana, who had followed Silfer here, were also surprised to realize that the previous explosion was caused by L. L's previously terrifyingly cold expression immediately softened, his expression changed dramatically into one of worry, my mother is here. Although L knew this was impossible, he prayed that Silfer wouldn't appear, it was because he wasn't confident enough to show Silfer what he would do in the future, and L was also afraid to tell Silfer the truth about that filthy, despicable, and cruel conversation between Inyart and his son. L recalled every word Glutton had uttered, I'll get the information about the magic stone, then send Silfer to the prince, even if I have to use force, if she dares to refuse, I'll seal her magic. He also recalled Inyart's malicious and smug expression as he clapped his hands and praised his son, you're very suitable to be the heir. L was stunned by Silfer's appearance, what should I do if my mother finds out? Silfer pressed L with an angry voice, Ellie, answer me. But deep down, she was worried, I've never seen Ellie go this crazy before, could something serious have happened? L looked at Silfer, not knowing what to say, his heart was full of conflicting emotions, torn between telling his vulnerable mother the truth or not. Finally, after countless internal struggles, L sighed, I have no choice. He decided to give up on hiding the truth and began to use magic to inform everyone of what had happened. Count and Yart saw L's actions and frowned in puzzlement, is it the recording magic, it's a magic that can store information like a video recording. And Yart immediately understood what L was about to do, could that brat have recorded the conversation earlier, if this is exposed, our family is finished, I have to erase that thing immediately. And Yart's heart pounded with urgency, he shouted to the knights who were gathering at the epicenter of the explosion, kill it, it's the one who caused the explosion. Silfer, seeing this, quickly shouted to stop him, father, what are you saying, you haven't even asked the boy why. 
Counting Yark glared at Silfer with terrifying eyes. Shut up, but Silfer refused to back down, Ellie is your grandson. And Yard ignored Silfer and hastily urged the knights on, hurry, he's a high-level mage, so be careful when attacking. The knights, believing the situation to be urgent as they saw the count's urgent and frantic shouts, quickly drew their swords and began to approach L. L turned his gaze towards the knights surrounding him and said to the golden knight, push them back, but don't kill them, L wasn't being merciful, he just didn't want to kill anyone in front of Silfer. The golden knight, who had been silent and waiting for orders, immediately raised his large golden sword, as you command, my lord. The golden sword was the symbol of the golden knight, L had poured a lot of effort into it, and now the aura emanating from the sword was comparable to that of a divine sword. As the golden knight displayed the power of the golden sword, the knights became tense and raised their swords high, they shouted for morale, destroy that sword. L quietly looked at the group of people who didn't know their limits, he thought to himself, it's pointless, the golden sword is what established the symbol of the golden knight. The sword was forged by a dwarven artisan using the purest steel, almost without any impurities, and was encased in magical metal as a magical seal. The blade was coated in gold and further enhanced with a counter-attack enchantment. Not only that, its sharpness and piercing power were further enhanced by magic, therefore, the golden sword must be on par with a holy sword. L thought to himself, it's the same in the game I played in my past life, no matter how strong an army is, it will eventually be defeated by another if it doesn't constantly upgrade. You have to increase the stats of an item as much as possible, I'm a pragmatist, not an idealist. When the Golden Knight began to approach the knights, they showed obvious tension and also produced an aura on their swords. The golden sword in the Golden Knight's hand also glowed, but its aura was rainbow-colored, the golden sword was already twice the size of the swords the knights were holding, so its aura was also many times larger than theirs. The Golden Knight slashed his sword horizontally, bright green and gold light flickered, shining like falling stars in the night. The sweep of the sword was very gentle, but it was a heavy blow to the knights, the aura emanating from the golden sword created a storm that swept away the knights standing nearby. Inyart and his son were astonished once again, what the hell? The knights of House Einhart were shaken back by the first attack, don't underestimate us. The golden knight approached the knights and swung the golden sword again, its movement was much faster than the knights. The knights created auras on their swords to resist the golden sword, but it was clearly a miscalculation, when the golden sword and the knight's swords collided, all of the knight's swords shattered. Then, another storm continued to rise and swept the knights away instantly. When the golden knight turned to another group of knights, they were all panicked and flinched back. The knights standing before the golden knight were like lambs before a tiger, they began to fear and stammer, no, no way. Although the Golden Knight's aura had suppressed the knights, they did not give up and tried to encourage their comrades, don't, don't panic, the Marquis order is absolute, we must kill him. As the knights were regaining their fighting spirit, a rescue force arrived. The White Wing Knights, a squad under Marquis and Yart, appeared, the knights exclaimed upon seeing them, Captain. L carefully observed the knight who had just arrived on horseback, that's the captain of the knights, so he must be at the peak of Grand Sword Master level, right? The leader of the White Wing Knights, Baron Rompel, quickly dismounted and knelt before Inyart, apologies for the delay, Marquis. Inyart urged Rompel, hurry. Rompel immediately nodded, as you command. Then, Rompel stood up in a dignified pose facing L, I am the captain of the Marquis Einhart's knights. After introducing himself, he turned to his knights and drew his sword, the enemy. Must be punished, with the knight's shouts, a blue aura emanated from Rompel's sword, enough to boost the morale of the army. L was not the slightest bit worried by Rompel's aura, he calmly said to the golden knight, activate level 2. At the same time, a soft, shimmering golden light emanated and colored the surrounding space, the golden knight, upon receiving the command, immediately broke the seal. The Golden Knight's entire body underwent a powerful transformation, its body contours became sharper and smaller, like a seasoned gym-goer with toned muscles. The Golden Knight had to operate in stages, it had been resting in the bag for too long and needed to operate sufficiently in Mode 1 before upgrading, 
because it had already had enough movement against the knights earlier, it could now advance to level 2 without any difficulty. The knights, seeing this sight, were even more panicked, what, what's happening, it's changed. L chuckled to himself at the knight's bewildered expressions, that's not all, though. At this moment, the golden sword also transformed, the aura on the sword gradually gathered together. Then, the aura rapidly accumulated, forming a giant blade twice the size of the original. Not only were the lower-level knights shocked, but Rompel was also stunned, sword energy. The golden knight charged directly towards Rompel, who was gaping at the sword energy on the golden sword. Rompel instantly stepped forward and swung his sword, showing off his prestige. Do I look weak, even with sword energy, you're no match for me. Rompel and the Golden Knight charged towards each other simultaneously, with their powerful sword energies. Clang, a deafening sound reverberated as the two blades clashed under the knight's expectations of their commander, a high-level swordmaster. A huge explosion followed by a dazzling light illuminated everywhere. El calmly watched the clash without the slightest worry, according to his calculations, at this level, the Golden Knight could fight a swordmaster like Rompel without any difficulty. After the blinding light disappeared, the revealed scene shattered the hearts of all the knights. Rompel's bloodstained sword was stuck straight into the ground. He was kneeling on one knee, his entire body covered in blood. Rompel groaned upon seeing that the Golden Knight had reduced him to this state with just one strike. No, I can't believe it, I. Before he could finish his sentence, Rompel collapsed unconscious with a short groan. The Golden Knight had defeated a high-level swordmaster in a single blow, there was no reason for the lower-level knights not to be terrified, they began to tremble, no way, the captain, he. Having dealt with Rompel, the Golden Knight moved again, aiming directly at Inyart and the knights behind him, and swung its blade down. Inyart quickly activated his shield, but he only protected himself and his son, leaving the knights to be blown away by the Golden Knight's sword energy. Inyart sighed and mumbled to himself, criticizing the knights who had just fallen, they died too quickly. L, who had been quietly observing from the sidelines, was paying attention to a group of people in black robes standing in the distance, they were gathering together, this time, it's mages, it seems all the mages in the Marquis family have come here because of the commotion. L thought to himself, as predicted from the Einhardt family, they have a mage force on par with the magic tower, this won't be easy. Even though he knew this fight would become more difficult, L had already taken an irreversible path, he turned towards Silfer and said in a low voice, Mother. L hesitated before asking Silfer, What is this magic storing? Are you ready to know the truth? L looked seriously into Silfer's eyes. Silfer raised her hand without hesitation, of course, she thought to herself, Ellie must have a reason to do this, it must be storing something very serious, something that could harm not only my father and brother but also the Einhardt family. Inyart looked at them, his heart filled with worry, I can't let her see that. He wanted to attack immediately and erase the contents El had stored, however, his watchful eyes couldn't leave the Golden Knight, this golem's abilities, unless one of the top ten strongest mages on the continent is here, it can't be taken down. Inyart turned his gaze back to L, his unease rising, even if this kid is a level 7 mage, if I, Glutton, and the mages in the family all fight together, we can definitely overwhelm him, but if he tries to escape, we can't stop him, in that case, everything would be over, the Einhardt family wouldn't be able to exist. Inyart gritted his teeth, frustrated, as he sank into his chaotic thoughts, what should I do? While Marquis and Yart was lost in thought, L was casting magic on Silfer. The magic L is casting is a spell of isolated space, allowing a person to enter a private space completely separated from the outside world. Serena and Kano walked over out of curiosity, Mom, we can't see inside. After L used the spell to give Silfer a private space, her memory record was opened. Each scene began to appear before Silfer's eyes like a film reel. The story of the prince and his request letter. The secret about the brainwashed people and the magic stones. The story of Inyart and his son plotting to brainwash El and turn him into a mage to serve their family. Every heartless and callous expression of the two was vividly and realistically recreated. The vivid images and sounds hit Silfer's eyes, leaving her stunned. 
Silfer couldn't believe such immoral and cruel stories had happened behind her back. A groan escaped Silfer's mouth, her eyes filled with disgust and fear. A feeling of utter despair caused Silfer to collapse. Returning to reunite with her family after seventeen years, Silfer never thought that her family would try to use her as a sacrifice. The disappointment tore her heart apart. I thought my father always saw me as family, and we would always be father and daughter. I was so happy, but it was all a lie. Besides that, witnessing them plot to force her into giving up the magic stones made Silfer tremble in fear, tears streaming down her face, and a feeling of self-reproach filled her mind. Silfer sobbed in self-reproach, I knew the dark side of the family better than anyone, yet I still brought Ellie here. There's no warmth here, those wicked people. I thought what happened to me wouldn't happen to Ellie. But those people didn't just want to use me, but Ellie too, they even planned to brainwash him. I thought I would never forgive my father for killing my husband. But I couldn't hate my father because I believed the prince ordered him to do it. But it wasn't true, these people don't know what love or family is. Everything they do is for power. That's the nature of the two of them, which I've never acknowledged. No matter how painful it is, no matter how much I want to deny it. This time, I have to accept the truth. After Silfer came to terms with it, the isolated space around her disappeared, she tried to swallow her tears, it's better to be sad and disappointed than trapped in a world of lies. Elle quietly watched Silfer's expression, his heart filled with worry that she wouldn't be able to handle the shock. Silfer strode forward with a determined attitude, telling herself, I have to face the truth. She looked up at Elle with unwavering eyes, Ellie, Mom won't run anymore. While relieved that Silfer hadn't completely collapsed, Elle still felt a pang of sympathy for her strength. A glimmer of light flashed in Elle's blue eyes, he furrowed his brow as he looked at Silfer's teary eyes. Elle quickly realized, those tears, mom can't hate them no matter how much pain they caused, because they're her family. While Silfer doesn't hate them, Elle is different, he glared at Inyart and his son, at the same time, the man around Elle began to churn as if responding to his will. Elle glared with murderous intent spreading through the air, the two of you, I will give you your final judgment. Elle immediately raised his hand in anger. A phoenix with feathers as black as a raven was summoned. The phoenix roared, as if to tear apart the space. The deafening sound echoed everywhere, causing the knights to clutch their heads and writhe in pain. Even Glutton couldn't withstand the terrible pressure of that scream, the power was so great it forced him to kneel down on the spot. Seeing his son's state, Inyart didn't show any remorse, instead, he spoke with a hint of admiration, oh, using dark energy to lower your opponent's spirits, you can even shake Glutton with a level 5 spell. How did you manage to reach level 7 at 17? Inyart chuckled and glanced at L. Well done, L, your talent is amazing. He even had the audacity to suggest, It's not too late, would you like to become a member of the family? L immediately glared at him with contempt and disgust. Inyart's eyes were now filled with greed, not being able to draw a talented person like you into the family is a huge loss. He began to tempt L with conditions, If you join our side, I can assure you I'll overlook what you've done, as if nothing happened, I'll guarantee your safety, your mother's, and those children too. While he appears to be tempting you, in reality, he's threatening Silfer's safety to intimidate you, and Yart grinned with a perverse and savage laugh, what do you think? El still stared at him with cold eyes, this strange feeling, is it a brainwashing spell? He silently mocked in Yart, not only my father and other mages, but now even me, you've got your hands on me, you disgusting old man. L looked down at Inyart with a jumbled mess of emotions, anger, hatred, contempt, disgust. After a moment, L finally broke the silence, I have a question. Seeing L still maintaining a hostile attitude, Inyart felt a bit resentful inside, humph, I can't brainwash him, he really has reached level 7. L coldly asked him, how could you do that to your family? He didn't want to evoke any affection from Inyart, he was just curious because he couldn't understand why the man acted this way. After a second of surprise, Inyart calmly smiled, showing his teeth. His sinister smile gradually transformed into the savage laughter of a true villain. Inyart casually replied, Many nobles sell their children to gain family prosperity, that's perfectly normal. 
El was shocked and stared with wide eyes at Inyart's indifferent attitude, he immediately realized that the old man was a devil. Inyart calmly continued, now it's my turn to ask, where did you learn this powerful spellcasting, you've reached level 7 at 17, amazing. He revealed his desire for power and strength like a hungry devil, tell me your secret. El silently lowered his head for a second then casually tossed his hair back in a cool manner. Under everyone's curious gaze, El calmly declared, I researched it myself. Inyart pressed him again with a hostile attitude, are you kidding me? El casually shrugged and replied, it's true, I researched everything myself. At that moment, Inyart's anger flared, he was furious at El's dishonest answer, seems like you don't want to tell me the truth, in a flash, El saw the devilish shadow that had deeply entrenched itself in the man's heart. El bluntly replied, yes, why should I tell you the truth, your kind is the type I hate the most, the type of person who treats their family as tools to achieve their desires. El suddenly extended his hand, but I have a proposition for you, Inyard immediately asked eagerly, what is it? El started to hit Inyard's weak point, if my family and I leave now and spread the truth about what you did, you will face big trouble, won't you? Inyard pretended to be innocent and asked back, what are you trying to say? He smirked triumphantly and took out a coin, this coin contains magical recording, it records everything I saw earlier. Seeing this, Count Inyard's heart became anxious, what, but El played a silent game to toy with his tense heart. Inyart thought more and felt increasingly anxious, frustrated and uncomfortable, this truth would threaten Einhart, but the truth that the prince was involved in the kidnapping and brainwashing was equally harmful. If a conflict erupted between the empire and countless families whose children were kidnapped, even a mighty empire like Blyard could collapse. El casually pointed his sword at the anxious Inyart and his son, you too, if you don't want me to spread this truth everywhere. Then fight, no one is allowed to interfere. I think I need a good fight to feel better, if you can defeat me, I'll destroy the coin and disappear. Feeling this was an easy condition to overcome, Inyart didn't hesitate and told his son, get ready, glutton. As a mage of the same level as El, he declared confidently, if we attack him at the same time, we will have more advantages, give it your all. Inyart's mouth couldn't stop smiling, and his arrogance encouraged glutton's spirit, he also smirked with an arrogant laugh, all right. Seeing the two gradually control the man around them, El also started focusing his energy. El breathed slowly, the energy rising from his dantian boosted the reaction of the man around him, and the mana spreading around him quickly became denser. El concentrated his mind on the spell, a massive amount of mana quickly accumulated in his hands, you underestimate me. I'll show you what despair is, El yelled as he launched the thunderball towards Inyart and his son. The energy flow of the three level 7 mages began to collide. And the inevitable result was a shocking explosion in the night sky, people could even see a corner of the capital illuminated as if it were daytime. Meanwhile, in the royal palace, a secret meeting was taking place, entering the grand palace where Emperor Oscar resided, Duke Klein knelt on one knee and bowed his head, Your Majesty. Oscar said in a low voice to Klein, I'm sure you've heard the news, there are witnesses who claim that level 7 magic was used, Klein respectfully replied, yes, your majesty, I have heard about it. The emperor closed his eyes and pondered for a few seconds then said to Klein, this is a very serious matter, if it's related to Einhardt's magic experiments and the explosion is the result of it, then they must be held accountable, but, if it's a private matter of the count's family, then let it drag on for as long as possible, then we'll deal with it. Klein raised his head and looked at Oscar with a bit of surprise, may I ask why, your majesty, the emperor smiled with a cold look in his eyes, the count's family has too much power, this is a good opportunity to suppress them a little. Oscar asked Klein with a suggestive question, do you think so, Duke Klein, a flicker of fear appeared in Klein's eyes, but he still politely replied, I agree with that, your majesty. Klein couldn't help but feel fear in his heart when facing the emperor, what a scary person he was, he had previously said that there needed to be a strong enough opposing force in the empire, and secretly help the emperor, Duke Einhardt sees his power. But now that he is too strong, he wants to stab him several times, it is true that his majesty, the one who holds all the power. Oscar ordered Klein in a low voice, 
I will give you ten knights from the royal guard and one hundred men from the central guard, you'll do fine, I entrust everything to you, Duke Klein. Klein immediately raised his head and replied, Yes, your majesty. He didn't dare delay, stood up and said, Then, I'll take my leave. As Duke Klein was about to leave, a voice came from outside, Your Majesty. Al-Qaid happily walked in, Oscar frowned at his son, What is it, Al-Qaid? He immediately replied, I have a request. Al-Qaid glanced at Klein, You're going to Count Einhardt's place, right? Klein nodded, Yes, Your Highness. Al-Qaid pretended to be full of enthusiasm and said to Oscar, Then, please let me go with him, I will use this opportunity to sever the Count's power. Al-Qaid secretly thought in his heart, well, that's just what I should do. Meanwhile, Oscar was also pondering Al-Qaid's request, he understood that his son must have another reason besides just wanting to subdue the Einhardt family. Oscar guessed right, Al-Qaid's real target was Silfer. All that was in this prince's mind right now was his desire for Silfer, I'm sure this time I'll make her mine. Oscar seemed doubtful and asked Al-Qaid back, oh, do you think you can suppress the Count's family? Al-Qaid immediately gave a seemingly legitimate reason, yes, your majesty, I will carry out that matter, also to gain more experience. Oscar chuckled, thinking his son had grown up, approved, go see what's happening at the Viscount's family, Al-Qaid, pleased, bowed respectfully, yes, your majesty. Shortly after, Klein and Al-Qaid departed from the palace, Al-Qaid politely said to Klein, I am delighted to work with you, Duke Klein. Klein responded to Al-Qaid with a courteous compliment, because you're also involved, I wonder if I truly need to intervene. Despite showing humility, Klein was met with Al-Qaid's arrogant expression and mocking smile, well, it's only natural. Al-Qaid's arrogant attitude irritated Klein, causing him to furrow his brow, but he said nothing more. Yet, Al-Qaid still wanted to demonstrate his authority in front of Klein, everyone, show me your determination. The soldiers behind him immediately shouted a few words of support for Al-Qaid, further fueling his pride and causing him to raise his chin to the sky. And so, Al-Qaid, proud and arrogant, led his troops towards the Einhardt mansion. Meanwhile, the battle at the Einhardt mansion was still intense, more than half of the mansion had been reduced to rubble after El's relentless attacks. El didn't want to prolong the battle to avoid disadvantage when facing two opponents, Mana concentrated densely in his hand, and the Hand of God spell was activated, a giant hand, condensed from mana, seemingly three meters tall, began to attack Inyart relentlessly. Inyart didn't show any fear, instead, he laughed with amusement, oh, you cast magic quickly and powerfully. He seemingly had no intention of dodging the giant hand grabbing at him, usually, the body would be split in two when executing a counterattack at this moment but if he used the Einhardt secret technique, it would be a different story. At the same time, behind an yard, Glutton was chanting and concentrating his power into the flames on his hand. Glutton launched a fiery storm, the most powerful spell within the sixth level range, at L, aiming to buy time for an yard to begin his chanting. Caught off guard, L immediately cancelled Hand of God and swiftly dodged to the side, and yard, smug continued to accumulate mana while Glutton's fiery storm was still raging, what do you think, even a sixth level spell can be used in such a short time? The fiery storm spiraled towards L, he quickly created a wall, and the flames crashed against it. Seeing L forced to retreat, and Yart then launched a lightning bolt, the person who had blocked Glutton's fiery storm was still too inexperienced to face me. Though the stone wall was a defensive spell with an advantage over fire magic, it couldn't withstand the power of a sixth level spell and was quickly destroyed, shards of broken stone flew everywhere. As the shards flew back towards L, he immediately cast a spell upon himself. A magical shield gently enveloped L's entire body in a blink. The stone fragments flying towards L, who was wearing the magic shield, were instantly deflected back. Then, the dense mana surrounding L began to create a violent storm, sweeping the falling rocks like rain down upon Inyart and his son, causing them to cry out in astonishment, no, that's impossible. L, unfazed, continued his attack with the same technique Glutton had just used, fiery storm. The sixth level spell was completed by L in less than a minute, he was casting magic at a terrifying speed incomparable to other mages, and its power was no less impressive. 
the sight stunned Glutton, shocked. That kid had only glanced at the Einhardt secret technique once, yet he could transform it faster than me. I was already superior to other mages of the same level because of my incredibly fast spellcasting speed, but this, unbelievable. Damn it, after cursing, Glutton quickly increased his mana and used a defensive spell. After chanting three times, a translucent barrier formed around him. Like most mages in a crisis, Glutton used a shield spell and then fled using instantaneous teleportation. Glutton's body gradually disappeared into an empty space, just when he thought he'd withstood the fiery storm, the shield cracked. A bit of luck allowed him to teleport out just as the shield shattered in the storm. The next second, not far away, Glutton's figure reappeared. His body floated in the air after using flight magic to escape L. He frantically looked around, searching for him. L suddenly appeared behind Glutton, his voice cold and mocking, too late. Glutton panicked and quickly turned his head, a natural reflex, what, his fear grew, this kid is too fast. At that moment, L was already chanting the next spell, his eyes were filled with killing intent, ready to end Glutton immediately. Glutton, terrified, stumbled backward. While L was chanting, Glutton ran again, using acceleration magic, he darted off, but L remained calmly standing there, watching. It turned out he had finished chanting, the web entrapment seal spell had begun to activate, threads of mana chased after Glutton like predatory snakes, L clicked his tongue, mocking Glutton, too slow. Both Glutton and L were seventh level mages, so the invisible magical network didn't have much effect, but L's goal wasn't high either, just to distract Glutton's nerves and he succeeded. Seeing the web trap that L created was merely a third-level spell, and Yart grinned arrogantly, Glutton can still handle this magic. Spider web magic like this is weak against fire magic, so Glutton quickly used fire to burn it away. Seeing L's mana threads dissolving rapidly, he shouted with glee, these things can't do anything to me. And Yart stood to the side watching with a proud look, he smacked his lips to show pity for L, what a pity, L. He arrogantly revealed a triumphant smile, your web entrapment magic is nothing compared to fire magic. But that was exactly L's intention, when using high-level magic, he needed time, even for a moment, he thought he would have enough time to attack during that gap, and his plan succeeded, as the web entrapment magic disappeared, L suddenly appeared in front of Glutton. L cast a close-range attack spell, cornering Glutton against the wall, he was almost unable to counter. However, when Glutton was cornered, he unexpectedly sneered. At that moment, Inyart cast his spell, as if they had planned it beforehand, he had accumulated enough mana and acted at the crucial moment, well done, Glutton, everything is going as I planned. Inyart laughed triumphantly, aiming his attack at L, everything is about to end. And the spell he cast this time was Thunderstrike, a 7th level lightning magic spell more powerful than lightning bolt, after Inyart chanted, a bolt of lightning ripped through the sky and struck down. Both Inyart and his son looked proudly and arrogantly at the blazing yellow lightning striking down, with electric sparks flying out, creating a feeling of being enveloped by the entire area. Even L was astonished by this devastating lightning magic, it was a thunderous attack that could electrocute thousands if it hit soldiers in iron armor. The bright yellow light of the lightning striking straight down at him flickered in L's eyes but he didn't dodge it, instead, he just stood there, staring blankly. In that split second, L suddenly smiled. For others, lightning strike might be the most powerful magic, but for L, it was magic easily countered by earth knowledge, a lightning rod, with a shout, L conjured a giant steel pole. It was a scientific magic capable of drowning any thunder magic in an abyss of despair, the steel tip vibrated with a loud boom and quickly swallowed Inyart's giant lightning bolt. Under the astonished gazes of Inyart and his son, the lightning strike disappeared neatly as if it had never been there, the lightning rod, having just destroyed the lightning, trembled as if it had just had a full meal. Everyone watching was stunned, this feeling was even stronger for the one who had created the lightning strike, impossible, it was absurd. Inyart's fatal blow had vanished pointlessly, all his nerves were focused on the lightning rod that had swallowed the lightning without a trace, what kind of magic was this? Meanwhile, L looked at his achievement with a proud look, not bad, huh? 
while everyone was shocked and curious, especially with Inyart's hungry gaze fixed on the lightning rod, El smirked. He laughed carelessly, mocking Inyart's stupid question, why should I tell you, revealing information to the enemy is not the act of a fool. The Earl and Yart's expression immediately twisted with the arrogant sarcasm of El's words. In fact, El was secretly laughing inside, as he had never had the chance to try out this idea before, he never expected it to be this successful. El smiled proudly at the lightning rod, it worked well, indeed, all the lightning had been absorbed by the lightning rod. El valued compatibility when using magic, and for years he studied the mutual polarization properties of spells. Usually, fire magic was considered the opposite of water magic, but this wasn't a good defense method. This is because fire magic can boil water and burn the user. Using basic scientific knowledge from Earth, El had studied a lot since he was a child, curious about how magic systems interacted. Eventually, he deduced the principle of operation, fire magic can be sealed by earth magic, and wood magic seals water magic. Stone and metal magic can block wind magic. But lightning magic alone is a complex countermeasure. Stone and earth magic can block it, but if the lightning magic is too strong, this method won't be effective. That's when El got the idea of a lightning rod from his previous life. Now, he was extremely satisfied with his experiment. Great, this was the first time I tried it, but it completely sealed level 7 lightning magic. After a moment of pride in his research, El glanced coldly down below. His eyes pierced straight at Glutton, who stood there dumbfounded by what he had just witnessed. Glutton quickly realized that El was targeting him again, and his face stiffened with fear. Remembering the cause of this war, El roared in anger, a deafening sound, it's over here. Of course, El had no intention of punishing Glutton lightly, even if he was just a supporting antagonist, he gave Glutton a full-fledged hand of God right in the face. Glutton was hit by the giant hand, pressed flat onto the ground like the Buddha subduing the monkey king under Mount Five Elements. Glutton immediately fainted, blood gushed out of his body, feeling like all his internal organs were crushed, his insides completely chaotic. Inyart turned his head to look at his son, stunned. But could do nothing. At this moment, El laughed again, his sharp eyes challenging in Yart, one down, now it's a one on one battle, ha. Huh? El smirked provocatively at in Yart, you went down too quickly, ha. Huh? Well, I won't say that I can't show you my full skills since it's just the two of us now, but I can assure you that things will be tougher for you from now on. El calmly looked down at Glutton and clicked his tongue as if offering condolences to the Einhart family he'll be bedridden for about a year, and it's not sure whether he can regain his magic skills or not. After a few seconds of silent mourning for the unfortunate glutton, El pointed his finger at Inyart's face and declared, Now, you are next. El chanted the spell for magic arrows, and dozens of arrows rained down on Inyart, it was a low-level spell, but because it was used by El, its power and speed were unimaginable. After what just happened, Inyart didn't dare underestimate El anymore. He was even a little panicked, his magic was no joke. To resist the rain of arrows, Inyart quickly set up a mana shield covering his body. When El's arrows were blocked, he continued chanting the spell to use powerful fire magic like a flamethrower towards El. El gently leaned away from the flames and immediately prepared for the next attack. El shouted with full energy, infinite magic arrows, when the word infinite was mixed into the spell, small but countless magic arrows were created around him, mana erupted from his dantian, and the dense mana in the air constantly reacted with each other, creating hundreds, thousands of magic arrows just from one spell cast by El. A bright light flickered in El's eyes, full of excitement, even though they might look small and weak when standing alone, combined, they would become very powerful. Inyart gritted his teeth, bitter, he couldn't believe El was using such a low-level magic to fight a master like him. Confident in his level 7 abilities, more than enough to block those tiny arrows, Inyart defiantly created a giant shield. The shield blocked one wave of arrows after another, constantly bombarded like a downpour, finally, the seemingly solid shield began to crack. The cracks on the shield spread wider, and even though it hadn't broken yet, the force from the countless arrows was enough to put so much pressure on him that he couldn't stand firm anymore. Inyart shivered with panic at the feeling of contempt overwhelming his mind, 
he screamed in frustration, No, no way, I can't lose to this insignificant magic. A man as arrogant as Inyart would naturally feel annoyed in this situation, he sighed inwardly, How can I be held back by this second-tier magic, while I'm called one of the most powerful mages on the continent? The more Inyart looked at El, the more horrified he became, How is it possible, a seventeen-year-old kid like him? His eyes widened in panic, No, he's only seventeen years old. He became more and more suspicious and uneasy, this talent and strategy, like someone who has experienced countless battles, was this some kind of joke played by a grand mage? In a fleeting moment, Inyart seemed to see a glimpse of El's past life, after all, who are you? Who is? While Inyart was lost in his own thoughts, his shield finally reached its limit and shattered. Inyart couldn't react in time, the moment the magical shield shattered, his life was also destined to end. Magic arrows pierced through the shattered shield like broken glass, and without hesitation, they began to strike Inyart's entire body. It was an indescribable pain, not just countless arrows piercing his heart, but El skillfully controlled them, avoiding vital areas that could cause instant death, instead focusing on parts where the opponent would feel the strongest pain. After hundreds of sharp, piercing arrows penetrated Inyart's body, he fell to the ground amidst the terrified gazes of everyone, the Baron. The knights were so shocked they stammered and trembled, oh my god, it's unbelievable, and Yart's current state is horrifying, blood is oozing from every pore, soaking his entire body, he looks more miserable than a corpse. El calmly landed on the ground before Yart's completely exhausted body. El stared at Yart with a vengeful gaze, I will not kill you, but I will take your magic away. I will give you the same ending you wanted to give my mother, El growled, speaking to the unconscious Yart but it seemed as if he was talking to the demon in his heart. El made his decision without hesitation, and Inyart lay sprawled on the ground, unaware of the horrors that awaited him. His rage flared up once more, El yelled, I will tear you apart, at the same time, the man around him started to swirl violently, and he immediately cast a spell. Perhaps no one could stop El's rage at this moment, he resolutely chanted, Break bones. Just as El was about to cast the level 6 spell that could shatter all the bones inside a person, he was startled by a familiar voice, stop it. El stopped his actions, then turned his head and shifted his gaze towards Silfer behind him. When El turned to face Silfer, he saw sadness in her eyes and a sense of unease, even though he was seeking revenge for her. The rage in El's heart suddenly subsided, and a feeling of guilt washed over him, even though he was not at fault. El looked at Serena, the innocent and fragile girl with fear in her eyes, it was clear that everything that had just happened terrified her. Then he looked at Kana, although she appeared strong on the outside, Kana was actually quite vulnerable inside, and she must have been shocked to see El unleashing such bloodshed. Finally, El's gaze rested on Silfer, she frowned, her expression gloomy, and pleaded, please, that's enough. Standing amidst the ruins and witnessing the fallen lives, Silfer tried to persuade El, Ellie, stop it, son. El looked at his mother in shock, he couldn't understand what she was thinking, a heavy feeling settled on his mind, and Silfer's gaze seemed to suggest he had just done something wrong. At this moment, Silfer was experiencing a mix of emotions, I know how talented Ellie is, but I didn't think he could reach level 7 at this age. He created a golem that no one could replicate, its power could defeat a high-level swordsman in one blow. While I was oblivious, not paying attention. He has already become such a powerful magician. But the person Ellie is fighting is his father, I cannot forgive him for trying to kill El, but I can't let El kill his grandfather either. With the simple thought of not wanting El's hands to be stained with blood, Silfer firmly told her son, you've taught them a lesson, I don't think they'll dare to do it again. However, Silfer's plea was met with a firm refusal from El, he explained, I can't let it be like this, if we forgive them, they will come back to seek revenge one day. Silfer tried to persuade El, what you are worried about might be true, but what you are doing is not right, if you take away the Baron's magic, they won't be able to act rashly anymore, however, things will not be simple after that, because the Empire will not stand idly by. El thought more carefully about Silfer's arguments, mother is right. The Baron holds a significant position in the Empire, if I take away his magic, the Empire will oppose us and hunt us down. 
If I push this further, not only I, but everyone else in my family could be in danger, I really just want to tear him apart, but. After weighing the pros and cons, L sighed and made his decision, all right. Let them be, as L's mood calmed down, the swirling man around him dissipated, and the danger threatening in Yart ceased. L approached his family and said in a gentle voice, with our abilities, we can go anywhere, let's go to a peaceful place and live, Silfer also sighed with relief and nodded, all right, let's go. As they were about to leave, Silfer nervously grabbed L's sleeve, her face filled with embarrassment and regret, she hesitated and said, you were right, I was foolish. Silfer awkwardly explained, I tried to make you a baron to succeed the family, but now everything has turned out this way. She looked at her son with eyes filled with a mix of sadness, regret, and heartache, power might be important, but the love between our family is equally important. Hearing Silfer's confession, L bowed his head in thought, yes, you are right. As he looked up at the three women, L's entire body seemed to glow with a soft, warm aura, he gently proposed to Serena and Kana, I want you two to come with me, will you come with us? The three women opened their eyes wide at Ella's appearance like an angel bringing warm rays of light to their lives, Serena and Kana were surprised for a moment because they never thought they had the right to decide their future, themselves, they always feel guilty about their slave background saved by Ella and her mother, and think that following them is obvious. After a few seconds of staring at Ella in a daze, Kana replied excitedly, of course, we will always. Stay together, Serena added softly, a radiant smile spreading across her face. Silfer silently nodded and smiled at her son, agreeing with their decision. Elle could finally let go of his negative emotions and laughed brightly, thank you everyone. Before leaving this place of sorrow and lack of humanity, Elle turned to call the Golden Knight. The Golden Knight, who had been waiting at the side, immediately stepped forward. The Golden Knight knelt down solemnly and bowed deeply, showing his respect to El, yes, master. El happily said to the Golden Knight, you did a great job, I'll give you a name. El seemed to have a name in mind and was just waiting for the right moment to say it, your name will be Tana, she announced, after being named, the Golden Knight's entire body emitted a brilliant light, as if a kind of response expressing joy, gratitude, and loyalty to his master. El smiled contentedly turned toward her family, and began chanting the spell to open the spatial portal, now then, let's go. At that moment, a deep voice reached their ears, I won't allow that to happen, an enigmatic figure emerged from the shadows, drawing everyone's attention. Before anyone could clearly identify the newcomer, a light flashed from behind the Golden Knight's helmet. Immediately afterward, a surge of energy like a raging wave swept toward El's family, thankfully. The Golden Knight reacted quickly, standing in front of them to block the unexpected attack. The Golden Knight raised his sword to parry the attack, a golden light erupting as the two energies collided. The green and gold energies clashed, pushing against each other, creating waves of light that spread outward. L looked at the mysterious middle-aged man who was generating immense power, his expression turned shocked, he's so strong. While L was still pondering the identity of this powerful newcomer, Al-Qaeda suddenly appeared with an arrogant smile, ha ha ha, it's actually Duke Klein, captain of the Royal Guard. Seeing Al-Qaeda, El's face instantly turned pale, the prince, then the person beside him must be, the head of the Royal Guard, one of the ten master swordsmen on the continent, El, not daring to underestimate the situation, immediately commanded the Golden Knight, Tana, activate level 3. As the final seal on the Golden Knight was broken, the mana flowing around him became even more intense. In the blink of an eye, the Golden Knight underwent another transformation, previously, he had been straining to block Klein's attack, now, however, he seemed more relaxed, effortlessly stopping the powerful energy from his opponent. Then, a surge of power erupted from the Golden Knight, in an instant, the Knight's energy pushed Duke Klein back. Klein let out a surprised groan, after stumbling backward, he immediately swung his sword, dispersing the energy wave heading towards him. At a glance, it was obvious who had caused the commotion, Duke Klein took a small breath and looked at L, he didn't back down, even when facing the gaze of a grand swordsman, who are you, Klein asked. Klein looked at L with clear, powerful eyes, full of passion and honesty, he spoke with sincere admiration, well done, a talent like you should stand with the Empire. 
L stared intently at Klein, a man who appeared to be very upright. Klein continued to speak rapidly, but unfortunately, you attacked the Einhardt family, an important family of the Empire, it's the same as challenging the Blyard Empire. With a hint of regret, he sighed, shook his head, and spoke to L. I don't want to have a conflict with a young talent like you, but. Seeing Klein hesitate, Alkai barked loudly, What are you saying, Duke Klein? Alkaid acted as if he were commanding Klein, for the honor of the Empire, we can't let traitors like them die easily. While urging Klein to fight, the prince's gaze was lustfully directed towards Silfer, standing behind L. He chuckled and mumbled, We have to kill them, to capture Silfer. Seeing those lustful and lecherous eyes, L clenched his fist in anger, that bastard. With that despicable act by Al-Qaed, L made a decision instantly. He looked at Duke Klein and spoke in a cold voice, I'm sorry, Duke Klein, but I have no intention of joining the Empire. Because I want to kill that bastard, L, brimming with killing intent, pointed at Al-Qaed, declaring his death sentence. He had planned to leave peacefully, but the prince had decided to stick his neck into the noose. L commanded the Golden Knight, Tana, stop Duke Klein. The Golden Knight responded with a series of clipped words, Master, yes, sir. A halo of light flashed in the Golden Knight's hand. At the same time, a blade bathed in brilliant golden light appeared, the gleaming sword shone like a mirror, reflecting the sparkling light. Klein remained undeterred by the Golden Knight's imposing presence, he confidently raised his sword and challenged, Come on, then. Beside him, El stood facing Al Qaeda and began floating in mid-air, you're facing me. El looked directly at Al-Qaeda with a cold gaze that flashed with killing intent, then, let's begin. Receiving El's icy gaze, the prince, though he showed no outward sign, felt despair in his heart, El's bleak words continued to flow, I spared you once, but you dared to look at my mother with that kind of eyes, I won't forgive you anymore. As El was brimming with killing intent, Silfer's soft, gentle voice rang out, Ellie. Silfer, full of anxiety, pleaded with L, let's just go, all right, fighting the prince is too dangerous. L looked at Silfer, surprised, he noticed the anxiety consuming her mind. L smiled gently at Silfer and shook his head reassuringly, don't worry, mom, I have everything planned out, it's much more dangerous to let him go. Then, L turned his gaze back to the front. He had changed his mind and no longer felt the need to emphasize a direct confrontation with the prince. Of course, El still only had one goal, the prince, however, his attack method would be different from his initial plan. After El chanted a spell, countless magic arrows began to appear around him, the infinite magic arrows that had defeated Baron and Yart were used once more, in the blink of an eye, hundreds of magic arrows shot down to the ground at once, aiming straight at the prince's group. Master swordsmen have bodies as hard as armor, different from mages and ordinary people, even if El's magic arrows had the power of third-level magic, they would hardly be able to inflict any damage on them. But El's purpose in using the magic arrows wasn't to inflict damage, he used them to bind his opponent's movements. Like now, with the roar of a knight, they all quickly swung their swords, the magic arrows shattered upon impact with their blades, but this was exactly what El wanted. While the knights had no spare time because they were busy intercepting the flying magic arrows, El seized the opportunity to cast another spell, he floated in the air with a giant hammer. The hundreds of ton hammer swung towards the prince with El's deafening roar, the prince, momentarily confused, turned around and let out a startled yell, A. Hey. Despite that surprise, the giant hammer still struck the prince directly. The prince's body, struck by the giant hammer, bent into a C-shape, anyone seeing this would want to ask, is your spine all right? Mouth foaming, the prince screamed in despair as if the whole world had collapsed, the unbearable pain hit him, for him, who always took pleasure in the pain of others, this pain was both foreign and terrifying. L watched with glee as the prince writhed in pain, he must have some internal injuries from that blow, external wounds can be healed by magic, but internal ones will take time to heal. As the prince's scream echoed, Klein's eyes immediately turned to him, he worriedly shouted to the prince, who was struggling in pain, your highness. Duke Klein groaned helplessly, I want to save him, but if I'm careless, I'll be the one who dies, the golden knight is so powerful that even I feel threatened, it's like a single moment of negligence could lead to a disastrous end. 
Duke Klein's eagerness to check on the prince's condition as soon as possible revealed a weakness. Immediately, the Golden Knight seized the opportunity to launch a more relentless attack. Just as the Golden Knight was about to deliver his final blow, he heard El's command, Tana, stop, go to the other world and wait. The Golden Knight responded to El's command with glowing eyes. Right in front of Klein, a radiant golden light erupted from the Golden Knight's body, another, world, wait. However, Klein refused to stand idly by and watch the Golden Knight disappear, he roared, I won't let you go anywhere. Immediately, Klein swung his sword towards the Golden Knight, dozens of radiant sword blades appeared above his head, aiming directly at the Golden Knight. The radiant sword blades quickly launched forward, attacking the Golden Knight as he prepared to disappear. The radiant sword blades shot out with precise control, striking the Golden Knight's left arm and left leg. Unable to withstand the sharpness of the radiant blades, the Golden Knight's left arm fell off. Klein chuckled smugly, as if he had achieved a great feat, all right, just keep it like this. But Klein's joy was short-lived, the fallen arm flew back up and attached itself to the Golden Knight's elbow as if nothing had happened. The Golden Knight even swung his newly attached arm as if deliberately trying to irritate Klein's premature joy. Klein froze, dumbfounded, upon witnessing this scene, he simultaneously gave up on trying to stop the Golden Knight. Afterwards, the Golden Knight completely disappeared into the other side of the spatial rift. Duke Klein burst into bitter laughter in a state of collapse, ha ha, ha ha ha, I thought I had him, but in the blink of an eye. With the formidable Golden Knight no longer a threat, Duke Klein's gaze shifted to L, the young man was also looking at Duke Klein. L nodded slightly, expressing respect for a venerable master swordsman, then, he took out a coin. As L snapped his fingers, the coin shattered, a green light poured out from its interior, flowing into another location. Then, he calmly looked at the fallen Marquis and said, I said I would destroy this, not that I wouldn't make a copy of it. L shifted his gaze to the prince, who was still sprawled on the ground, writhing in pain, your actions have been fully recorded in this law-keeping artifact. L uttered a threat as he stared coldly at the prince, if you continue to pursue us, I will spread these things around. Then, L turned his gaze back to Duke Klein, nodding once more, sorry for the commotion. A shimmering green light gradually emerged around L, he sincerely spoke to Klein with all his respect, I hope we never meet again as enemies. Klein's eyes widened as he looked at L, in the depths of his eyes a clear reflection of respect emerged in return. L used instant teleportation, in a blink of an eye, he and the other members of his family were engulfed by a white, swirling current of air and disappeared. After L left, Duke Klein was a bit disappointed, what a genius, I wish we had met in a different situation. After a sigh, Klein turned back to look at the battlefield behind him with a confused mood, anyway, how should I deal with this? After that, the incident at the Marquis Mansion was swept under the rug, but news of the youngest level 7 mage possessing power equivalent to that of a grand mage, and his golden knight began to spread, everywhere, it was L's sensational debut on the continent. A few days later, Ella and her family settled into a new home isolated from the rest of the world. Since early morning, Ella had been sitting thoughtfully thinking about something, his fingers slowly tapping the table, seemingly in a very relaxed mood. Her blonde hair sways every time Elle's head moves slightly, giving a fresh and noble feeling, at the same time, her handsome face and sharp jawline give off an attractive masculine feeling, Elle is lost in thought, remembering the great chaos he caused in the Blyard Empire. Basically Elle destroyed the Einhardt Mansion, slapping that family's high-ranking mages in the face. And seriously injured the prince, if Elle returns to Banzark, it will only cause harm to others. Even if right now, right here, the Empire chased after L and beheaded him, he still wouldn't be able to complain. But L already has the records of their secrets, so they won't be able to chase and kill him. And the battle also helped L learn many lessons. L happily thought to himself, my casting speed and the exact spell combinations I created were better than anyone. I can definitely become stronger if I learn a few additional spells. The more Ella thought about it, the more proud she felt, the Golden Knight's strength was quite amazing. Inconclusive with the great swordsman Duke Klein.
Ella thought excitedly, five years of diligently burying herself in research was truly worth it. He began to calculate bigger plans, if he could create more golden knights, maybe he could even conquer all five continents, but to create a golden knight medals take about three years, and the amount of money needed to create them is also extremely large. Actually, the most important thing I learned in that battle was the power of the collective, there are things that cannot be done solely by relying on one's own strength. After hearing rumors about L, many countries hired people to search for him, certainly some of them had bad intentions. This is also something that makes me think, I need to create power for myself before they can touch me, but how can I do that? While L was wondering what to do next, Silfer knocked on his door. Different from before, Silfer is now a little hesitant every time he comes to see L, Ellie, Mom, can I come in? Ella of course didn't want her to be like that and kept trying to close the distance between them, he gently replied, Yes, Mom, come in. With Ella's consent, Silfer carefully opened the door and entered the room, following her were Serena and Kana, based on their shy expressions, it could be seen from that incident that they were quite difficult, behave when facing each other. However, seeing his family members showing off their radiant beauty no matter where they were, L felt his complicated thoughts and worries quickly disappear, he smiled and asked Silfer, what's going on? Silfer seemed hesitant for a while, she hesitated for a long time before she could speak, Ellie, my son, how long have you been this strong? At that moment, L felt Silfer's attitude towards him had changed, he sighed softly and explained to her, I hid this because no one would believe that I could reach this level at this age, and I know if the bad guys found out, I would put us all in danger, I. L was flustered for a moment. I can't tell my mother about my past life, after a few seconds of stammering, he smiled warmly and continued, but, I'm still your only son, L. Silfer's face relaxed when she heard her son's comfort, Ellie. She thought to herself, that's right, no matter what level he reaches, he's still Ellie. When she had thought it through, Silfer smiled brightly, I'm sorry, although I knew you had your own reasons, but I treated you differently from before. L shook his head slightly as long as Silfer understood, and he threw out a light joke to change the atmosphere, oh no, actually, the reason I hid my skills is because what if everyone found out I was a genius, then I'd end up with a bunch of fans, Silfer immediately laughed, ha, ah, you have to be humble. When the tense atmosphere was dispelled, L continued, actually, I also have something to tell everyone. All three women looked at L curiously, what is it, L explained slowly, because of that incident, we can't go back to Banzark. L pointed at the map of the continent and said, So, I'm thinking about what we should do, on the east side of the Serdian continent, there are five empires and many other magic towers. L spoke with more and more enthusiasm, the west of the continent is divided into hundreds of countries, apart from a few strong countries, there are many places that don't have magic towers, so I have decided that I want to build a magic tower in a country that doesn't have one. Kana asked L in surprise and curiosity, a magic tower. L nodded in response, it's where we went to meet the tower master Brian, only mages level 7 and above can build a tower, the power of the magic tower can kill tens of thousands of soldiers when there's a war, so countries often willingly spend a huge amount of resources to support the magic tower. Kana exclaimed in amazement when she heard L's explanation, and Serena continued to question him, so, where are you going to build the magic tower? L pointed at the map, here, it's the Tolian kingdom, located at the far west of the continent. It has a vast territory and fertile plains, a large population, and a military force stronger than neighboring countries. It's a powerful country, but they don't have a magic tower, and nearby there's monster territory, even a rare dragon, so every year, they suffer a lot of damage, especially from the Manticore Valley. L continued to present his plan with confidence, if we propose to conquer this place, the Tolian kingdom will surely approve. Silfer felt that wasn't enough reason for L to choose this land, she asked, is there anything else? L nodded and continued to explain, the king there is a good person, and the nobles under his command trust him, it's just that, the princes seem to have conflicts with each other, but he can't do anything, Silfer tilted her head and looked at L, isn't that bad? L shook his head, it's alright, there are some mages interested in power, but the magic tower usually won't get involved in politics. 
he resolutely planned the development strategy of his magic tower, so the problem we need to focus on is the monsters in the Manticore Valley and the Orc Forest. El confidently predicted, I'm sure the kingdom's forces can easily handle the Orc Forest. But if they send all their forces there, they won't be able to fight the monsters of the Manticore Valley, if I can take care of the valley for them, then the influence of both the magic tower and the kingdom will increase. Hearing El, the three women pondered, their future is closely related to this, so they have to think as carefully as possible. Then, Kana carefully spoke, but the question wasn't about the magic tower, but about herself, can I find someone to teach me swordsmanship there? El understood what she meant, he said, oh, right, because I'm not a swordsman, I can only teach you the technique of gathering chi in the Dantian, so I thought that I should find a swordsman who can teach you. El answered as if he had anticipated everything, surely there will be someone suitable in the Tolian kingdom, after all, their military potential is very strong, we can find it together, hearing that, Kana's eyes immediately lit up, thank you. After Kana, it was Serena, she looked at El with burning eyes full of longing, please continue to teach me. Serena expressed in confusion, we, really feel that we're very weak when we saw what happened last time, I thought at least I could protect myself. But seeing how strong you are, and all the people fighting with you at that time, I realized I couldn't. Serena and Kana held each other's hands tightly, they agreed and resolutely said to El, we want to become stronger. At that moment, El was a little surprised when he saw the desire and determination of the two girls. He smiled warmly and replied to Serena, Okay, then I'll teach you. Seeing the two girls with so much will and determination, Silfer didn't want to be left behind. She looked at El with a firm look, Me too, I want to be stronger. El couldn't help but laugh at this adorable scene, Okay, let's all give it our best shot. He smiled brightly and asked his family members for their opinion again, now then, does everyone agree with the plan? When he got a unanimous nod from the three women, El excitedly shouted, let's go, to the Tolian kingdom. Meanwhile, in the Tolian kingdom, one of the strongest kingdoms in the west of the continent, all the surrounding countries had less than half the strength of the Tolian kingdom, so they could almost claim to be the head of the west continent, however, the Tolian kingdom didn't do that. This is because it borders the west of the monster territory, one of the three major death zones on the Serdia continent, in winter, when annual food is scarce, over 100,000 orcs and 10,000 trolls pour in like a flood, and to prevent that, the Tolian kingdom has to mobilize a huge army every year to stop the monsters, if they arrogantly declare themselves the strongest, their army will face a higher risk from the power of another country. Today is another day for the monsters to go out for food, and unfortunately, the army of King Ridoff, who rules Tolian, has to pass through here. The knights heard the sound in the forest and immediately raised their swords and alert, Your Majesty, please be careful, the number of monsters seems to have increased to an unprecedented level. Ridoff, filled with anxiety, couldn't hide his sigh, at this rate, the people of the kingdom will be in danger, is there no hero to save us? At this time, in the bushes, the shadows of the waiting monsters are gradually emerging, they are eagerly looking at the people below with hungry, greedy eyes. A fierce battle took place between the royal guards and a group of monsters, thankfully, they were strong enough to handle them and escape the forest, while the guards rested, the king of the Tolian kingdom, Ridoff, stood alone by the cliff overlooking the capital, his face etched with worry and sadness. Hearing Ridoff's melancholic sigh, the captain of the royal guards, Duke Lias, anxiously approached him, Your Majesty, are you all right, is something troubling you? A look of deep sorrow was visible on the king's face, his wrinkles deepening, he sighed and told Lias, I'm just thinking about my three sons. Redoff continued to sigh unconsciously, Ha, ah, their battle for the throne is getting worse and worse, I fear the kingdom will soon fall into ruin. Lias sat down beside Redoff and comforted him with a genuine heart, Your Majesty, please don't worry too much, after the rain, the sun will shine again, I am confident that these conflicts will benefit the future of the kingdom. Lias tried to lift the king's spirits, for the sake of the kingdom, Your Majesty, you should consider utilizing the hidden strength within the royal family and appoint the third prince, Judmian, as the crown prince. If the eldest prince, Maxil, or the second prince, Cran, becomes the king, then the Tolian kingdom, Lias hesitated, 
likely afraid that his following words would further distress Ridoff about his princes. Ridoff's heart was filled with so much sadness that he couldn't help but sigh. As a loving father, how could King Ridoff not understand his children? Ridoff didn't hesitate to express his thoughts to Lias. Maxil treats people like inanimate objects, he is cruel and violent. As for Cran, although he doesn't show it, he is just like Maxil, both of them are unsuitable to be king. Unlike them, Judmian is warm and kind, he has a friendly personality and was born with the qualities of a leader. I know, for the people, Judmian should be king, he possesses the qualities of a true king, but 90% of the nobles support Maxil or Cran. Ridoff became even more troubled as he thought about it, only two people support Judmian, first, the master swordsman and captain of the royal guard, Duke Lias. The second is the master swordsman and leader of the knight's order in the capital, Count Lummel. Such support is barely enough to hold on for now, it's a precarious balance because they are the leaders of the two most prestigious knightly forces, but if the eldest and second princes join forces to take down Judmian, this balance will be broken. Ridoff hung his head in frustration thinking about the unresolved power struggle, just thinking about it gives me a headache, I've neglected all matters of state because of this succession battle, and the monsters keep pouring out of the forest. I must stabilize the court and subdue the monsters, what should I do, how can I take care of everything, the king muttered, his mind filled with fatigue and worry. Seeing Lias remain silent for a long time, Ridoff finally looked behind him, what is it, Duke Lias? Now, King Ridoff noticed the knights standing in a battle-ready stance, their eyes alert, focused on the forest. With his eyes still fixed on the forest, Lias silently drew his sword and spoke gravely, Your Majesty, please stay here. The knights simultaneously drew their swords with worried expressions, something, is surrounding us. Behind the bushes, someone was truly lurking but a quick glance revealed they weren't monsters, it seemed like King Ridoff was constantly encountering trouble since leaving the palace. A knight in the royal guard cried out in alarm, are the monsters here, then, the leader of the first guard group, Bell, who was behind him, instantly turned his head. Bell stealthily glanced at his comrade and gave a sinister smile. Immediately, he suddenly swung his sword, attacking his comrade from behind with a crafty, triumphant expression, even with his professional swordsmanship training, the knight couldn't react quickly enough and was inevitably injured by the traitor's blade. King Ridoff and Duke Lias were both stunned by Bell's actions. Lias trembled, not from fear but from the feeling of betrayal coursing through his body, the duke, still clinging to a shred of hope, yelled at Bell, what are you doing, why are you attacking your comrade? Bell shrugged at Lias' indignant tone and spoke as if it were obvious, comrade, well, isn't the world a chain of betrayals, from the start, we never gave our all to you out of loyalty, there's no need to react so strongly. Now, the Shadow Knights emerged from the bushes, they, along with Bell, advanced towards King Ridoff, Lias immediately raised his sword and commanded his guards, protect the king. As he stepped forward, Bell glanced at King Ridoff behind Lias and let out a sinister smile, wait a bit, your majesty. With a defiant and sarcastic voice, Bell declared to the king, I will personally behead you, then, he and the shadow knights began to confront the royal knights, the royal guard, already outnumbered, was now ambushed and betrayed, leaving them in a very disadvantageous position. Amidst the bloody battle, King Ridoff, who knew neither swordsmanship nor magic, could only watch helplessly, I trusted them, but they are traitors, oh, lord. Ridoff sighed in despair, dear lord, you have forsaken me, in the Tolian kingdom, what will become of it? Meanwhile, in a spacious conference room, the expansive space and high ceiling allowed for airiness in all directions, creating a sense of grandeur that was overwhelming, a large round table stood in the middle of the room, where an old man in a red robe sat, chanting an incantation to open an online meeting. Duke Troll, the leader of the Hellfire Lion Knights, one of the top three royal knights of the Belisek Empire, the strongest empire on the continent, spoke first, what's so important that we have to meet when our master isn't here? Karasman, the master of the Red Tower, known as the strongest fighter among the magical towers, remained silent, continuing to listen. Facing Duke Troll's question, the others nodded in agreement, you know we're all very busy, right? Karasman simply gave a slight smile and said, 
our master ordered me to deliver an important message to everyone, there are two things. First, the plan to assassinate King Ridoff in the Mandacore Valley is currently underway. The results will be sent back to us as soon as it's done, the ambush location is perfect, and there's practically no room for error. When the king dies, the eldest Prince Maxil will be immediately crowned under the support of the majority of the kingdom's nobles. Afterwards, Karasman's gaze shifted towards an old man in a blue robe with a gentle expression, his name is Ryzen, the owner of the Blue Tower and an eighth-level master mage. Karasman spoke as if giving Ryzen an order, you will use your golems to wipe out the monsters and deploy your army to occupy the neighboring countries. Ryzen responded with the pride of someone possessing the most advanced golem creation technology on the continent, that's easy for the strongest and only golems on our continent. But right after Ryzen's proud declaration, Karasman poured cold water on him, second, there's news of a night golem appearing in the Blyard Empire. Ryzen sprang up from his seat and stared at Karasman with wide eyes, he spoke in a flustered tone, what, what do you mean, I'm the only one who can create a night golem? Karasman calmly responded, calm down, Ryzen, a major event occurred at the Marquis Einhardt's manor, and then, Rumors spread about the appearance of a seventh-level mage and a night golem, their power is no joke. Ryzen anxiously awaited Karasman's next words, but Karasman seemed composed, as if deliberately making Ryzen feel threatened. Karasman continued slowly, they say this guy's power is at least on par with a grand master, what's more, the golem is said to have its own consciousness. Faced with rumors that even Karasman seemed to believe, Ryzen groaned in astonishment and worry, its own consciousness. Karasman immediately replied, I can't be sure about that since I haven't seen it myself, but more importantly, Ryzen, what level of golem can you create? Ryzen pondered for a moment before saying, since the Orharthon magical metal disappeared, I haven't been able to create golems with consciousness anymore. And currently, we can only create one golem per month. Ryzen, no longer the amiable man he was before, began to complain grumpily, damn it, someone else besides me can create a knight golem, and it's a golem equal to a master swordsman with consciousness. After a moment of contemplation, Karasman said, that's not a big issue, it takes years to perfect that kind of golem, but we can't just sit idly by either. Karasman once again ordered Ryzen, I'll assign you the task of gathering information about this golem, understood. Ryzen immediately nodded, even if Karasman hadn't asked, he would have investigated it himself, the feeling of rivalry and envy surged within him as someone else had achieved something he had spent his entire life trying to accomplish, in his heart, Ryzen thought, I don't know who it is, but if they can create something I can't, I have to meet them personally. Meanwhile, L's group had arrived in Virtus, the capital of the Tolian kingdom, L didn't immediately go to the palace but was still contemplating something. Sitting on the wall outside the capital, L pondered, I've reached Tolian, but how can I meet King Ridoff? The simplest way is to meet them directly, if L, a level 7 mage, wants to build a magic tower in their country, the Tolian king would greet him barefoot immediately, but L dismissed that option, this is not good, I'm a fugitive, if I show up publicly like that, Duke Einhart or the Blyard Empire might intervene. That's not what L wants, noise doesn't suit his tastes. L furrowed his brow and continued to ponder, I want to meet him as secretly as possible, what to do now, I can't sneak into the palace either. L rolled around, muttering to himself, what should I do? Suddenly, Silfer approached him and said, L, I'm so hungry, let's go see if there's anything to eat around here. L paused his thoughts and sat up immediately, okay. Just as he was about to lead them into the capital, a wave of overwhelming power hit his senses. L jumped up from his seat, startled, what kind of power is this? Although Duke Einhardt wasn't pursuing his family, L remained vigilant, he easily recognized the power he had just felt, it was definitely at least a master swordsman level. After focusing for a while, L was able to pinpoint the source of the energy, it was from the north, Silfer was a little worried seeing L's reaction, L, what's wrong? L didn't answer Silfer but continued to search for the precise location, finally, he discovered it was from that uninhabited forest over there. L looked towards the forest, not far from the palace, he wondered, it must be someone related to the palace since it's so close, 
could this be a clash arising from the intensifying struggle for royal power? Seeing El not reply, Silfer became even more curious and followed him, Ellie, oh, El, El got up and walked hastily, I'm sorry. El immediately flew up and instructed Silfer, go ahead and eat first, you don't need to wait for me. At this point, after a fierce battle, most of the knights in the royal guard had fallen, only two remained, along with Duke Lias, protecting King Ridoff, they're too numerous, and they wear dark armor, making them difficult to spot. The guards and Ridoff were gradually surrounded, and the king couldn't help but feel fear, if this continues, they'll soon be overwhelmed. Just then, a dark knight raised his sword high and leaped towards the king. Ridoff was so terrified that he couldn't scream, he opened his eyes wide and stood rooted to the spot, watching the dark knight charge towards him, is this my end? Suddenly, a gust of wind blew past, El's magic was cast, and a shield appeared before the king just in time to block the dark knight's blade. King Ridoff, having narrowly escaped death, was both shocked and astonished, he quickly turned his head towards El, what? All their eyes were focused on El simultaneously, he hovered in the air, his voice firm and slightly irritated, I don't know what's going on, but. A sneak attack, that's never a good thing, I can't just ignore it, flying through the air, El looked down at the dark nights with cold eyes. Everyone was stunned by El's sudden appearance, he sneered at the dark nights, do you need more time to justify your actions? The dark knights stood there, staring at El dumbly, they hadn't expected to encounter a mage and were taken aback. Drawing on his knowledge of the Tolian kingdom, El was almost certain that the king, Ridoff, was among that group of people, he continued, his voice cold and his eyes sharp, thanks for providing me with this opportunity, but you're dead. At the same time, a faint golden aura began to radiate from El, causing the king's group to be even more amazed. While everyone was still looking at El with doubt, a knight in the royal guard suddenly shouted, Please, protect his majesty. Lias, hearing this, immediately yelled, You, what are you saying? He could be the enemy. Meanwhile, El's eyes gleamed with delight. Thanks to that hasty knight, El was able to confirm that he was indeed the king, King Ridoff of the Tolian kingdom. El immediately seized the opportunity to impress Ridoff. He looked down at the crowd sternly and began to play the role of a hero. I understand. El looked at the Dark Knights and said with a somber tone, So, these are the bad guys targeting His Majesty. El raised his hand and declared to the astonished crowd below, I can't forgive these despicable beings. Immediately afterward, he chanted, Woe and destruction to those who stand in my way, a magical circle appeared behind him, its radiant light spreading everywhere. El's voice echoed alongside a cracking sound in the space, a spatial gate was quickly opened and the hand of the Golden Knight slowly emerged from the crack. The Golden Knight stepped out of the spatial crack with an explosion of brilliant golden light, his majestic, imposing appearance and immense size were even more accentuated under the illumination. For a moment, everyone stared at the Golden Knight as if they were entranced, Ridoff stammered, barely managing to utter a few broken words, Golem, Knight. Ridoff's eyes widened, and his mouth wouldn't close in the face of El's unexpected and impressive introduction, could this be the boy from the rumors? Ridoff looked up at El with admiring eyes but still couldn't believe it, no way, he's just a teenager, but I can feel an overwhelming power emanating from him, who is he? As Ridoff felt, a monstrous amount of mana was swirling around El, the mana reaction reached its peak, and the thick mana concentrated around him to such an extent that even ordinary people who couldn't sense mana could feel its presence, after finishing his incantation, El's hand slowly raised, a faint blue light wrapping around his hand like a fog. As El's arm slowly extended, he cast his magic, and a column of blue ice descended from the sky landing right in front of Ridoff and Lias, however, the ice shards didn't affect them but spread out under El's control, targeting the location where the Dark Knights were standing. After immobilizing the Dark Knights, El commanded the Golden Knight, cut them down with one strike, Tana, remember to leave a few alive. The Golden Knight immediately acknowledged the order and advanced, yes. King Ridoff was still in awe, he looked at the ice path El had just created, his face mesmerized, he couldn't believe it. Seeing the Golden Knight swiftly moving towards them, the Dark Knights panicked and shouted in alarm, Damn it, I can't move. At this moment, 
the Golden Knight was charging forward with agile movements that seemed out of place for his three-meter-tall body. While charging towards the Shadow Knights, the Golden Knight simultaneously summoned his golden sword. The massive blade appeared along with a dazzling beam of sword energy, seeming to overwhelm the aura of all the knights standing nearby. The Golden Knight swung his sword in a horizontal arc with a brilliant aura, the sword energy and wind generated by the heavy blade swept away the Shadow Knights with overwhelming power. The sound of the Shadow Knight's bones breaking under the Golden Sword's slash could be heard vividly, followed by a painful scream as they felt their bones being ripped apart from their flesh, they fell down in a pool of blood. King Ridoff was immediately captivated by the magic and swordsmanship displayed by El and the Golden Knight, such power. These two individuals, truly are the legendary figures of the tales. After the Golden Knight dealt with the Shadow Knights with a single slash, El praised him, Well done, Tana. The Golden Knight knelt on one knee and bowed his head before him, Thank you, sir. Redoff couldn't hide the joy welling up within him, The highest level mage in our kingdom is only level 6, If he stays here, then we will have a level 7 mage, And there is also a master swordsman who is close to level 7. Seeing the smile on the king's face, El stepped forward, Your Majesty, are you injured? El introduced himself to the king with a warm smile, I am Elimus, but you can call me El. King Redoff quickly spoke, realizing that even a moment of hesitation could lead to missing the greatest opportunity of his life, Thank you for your help, El politely responded, It's nothing, I just dealt with the bad guys. El glanced at the captured Shadow Knights and told the king, I've left a few for interrogation to find out who is behind this, I hope everything will be dealt with quickly. Redoff seized the opportunity and said, You not only saved my life but also acted with such consideration, saying thank you isn't enough, I would like to invite you for a meal, it sounded like a polite social invitation, however, the hidden intention was clearly to attract L. L understood this and everything was unfolding according to his plan but he pretended to be hesitant to maintain his value, hmm, what should I do, sure enough, Redoff began to plead, please give me this chance, I beg you. L chuckled triumphantly inside, he had expected Redoff to react this way, he, I can't believe he actually humbled himself. After a moment of pause, as if pondering, L finally nodded, all right, seeing L accept his invitation, Redoff was overjoyed, thank you. Redoff excitedly told L, then I will inform the mages in the palace so that you can be teleported to the palace tomorrow, L politely nodded, thank you, your majesty. Then, a circle of magical light appeared under L's feet, his body gradually disappeared, well then, I'll take my leave, see you again. King Redoff gleefully smiled as he watched L's figure slowly disappear, I am very much looking forward to tomorrow. Duke Lias approached King Redoff, who was beaming with joy, I am glad everything is settled, your majesty, the knight golem and that power, it must be the mage from the Einhart family incident. Lias looked exhausted after facing the shadow knights, but his face was still bright, he excitedly told the king, perhaps he can also help us deal with the monsters. Redoff also happily laughed and replied, I think he might even reach level 8, today's encounter was like a drought meeting a downpour, Duke Lias also burst into laughter, seeing the king's cheerfulness, he was happy too, but he still sighed softly, we almost lost our lives here. Back at the inn, El immediately told Silfer, Serena, and Kana exactly what happened in his appointment with the king tomorrow. Silfer listened to El's story and exclaimed in a worried tone, What, you met King Redoff? El nodded in confirmation, Yes. I helped him when he was ambushed in the forest, so he invited me to the palace to thank me, Silfer was still in shock, looking at L, everything happened so fast, I'm a little overwhelmed, it's good that you met him, but how do you plan to get him to help you? L confidently said to them, I've already planned it all out, leave it to me. The three women saw L's confident glow and excitedly exclaimed, really, tell me, I want to know too, me too, but L teasingly said in a mysterious tone, I'll tell you later. He. Just as everyone was enjoying themselves, a slurred voice rang out along with the sound of heavy footsteps approaching them, Hey, ladies. Two tall, drunk men suddenly approached and put their arms around Silfer and the two girls, they chuckled with leering faces, Hey beauties, wanna go out with us? One man even dared to reach out to Serena, it'll be a lot of fun. 
As his rough hand was about to touch Serena's chest, L grabbed his hand and squeezed it tightly. He smiled and said as politely as possible while suppressing the anger boiling inside him, Please remove your hand. The drunk man looked at the young L with disdain and a rude attitude, Who the hell are you? L smiled gently and whispered in his ear, I said, Remove your hand. Meanwhile, his hand squeezed tighter, as if about to break his bones. The man, feeling the unyielding power, turned pale and hurriedly obeyed, Yes, yes, sir. Immediately afterwards, the two men ran away, not daring to look back. Serena and Kana both blushed at El's heroic rescue, but the issue here was that with their abilities, taking care of those two men wouldn't be difficult. Silfer, having experienced romance, immediately noticed the admiring and infatuated gazes of the two teenage girls, oh my, these two girls, he, Silfer playfully suggested to El, Ellie, they seem quite scared. L responded with a nonchalant and indifferent air, Oh, they are just drunkards, of course, I know you guys will be fine, you're both strong, his attitude surprised all three women. Kana said in confusion, Oh right, thanks for helping, Serena was also taken aback and reluctantly smiled, next time we will handle it ourselves, Silfer could only sigh in exasperation at his son's naivety. The next morning, a peaceful and clear sky signaled a smooth day for L. L was ready to meet King Ridoff, before leaving he cheerfully instructed his little family, everyone, have fun. All three women said goodbye to L with radiant smiles like blooming flowers, Silfer happily said to him, be careful, Serena and Kana also cheered L on, good luck, see you later, immediately after, L used instantaneous teleportation, a pure white light enveloped his body and he disappeared in a blink of an eye. Meanwhile, at the palace of the kingdom of Tolian, everything was prepared to welcome El. An elderly mage sat sprawled on a chair in front of the teleportation gate installed inside the palace, muttering, Ha, ah, they told me to dismantle the magical barrier, who's so important. This was Dasilin, a level 6, mage in the court mage of the kingdom of Tolian, he seemed bored, constantly complaining, Ha, ah, when will that person arrive? Just then, suddenly, a surge of mana was felt in the teleportation gate, Desilin excitedly stood up, oh, this is, such a strong mana field, this is level 7 magic. Desilin's eyes widened with excitement, amazing, his surprise was understandable, because this amount of mana was something he could not keep up with. A pure white light spread throughout the room, L appeared along with the radiance. He curiously looked around the magnificent palace and exclaimed, wow, this is beautiful, Desilin excitedly walked up behind L, so, you're the mage who just saved his majesty. L was a little confused by the sudden question, he turned back, oh, yes. Desilin suddenly rushed forward and hugged L tightly, his eyes filled with tears, finally, the kingdom has a level 7 mage, I've finally lifted this burden off my shoulders. L was stunned by Desilin's affectionate act, a man over 70 years old, he was bewildered and wondered, What's wrong with this old man? Desilin kept holding L tightly, refusing to let go. L became increasingly confused. What's wrong with this old man? He finally asked, bewildered. Hey, hey, old man. Desilin realized at that moment that he had been acting recklessly and might have scared L. He immediately released L and scratched his head awkwardly. Oh dear, I've been rude. I'm just so impressed by your incredible magic, he chuckled. Desilin looked at L with eyes sparkling with admiration, you're so young, this is the first time I've seen a level 7 mage this young. L, still flustered, felt even more embarrassed by Desilin's burning, eager gaze, what's going on with this guy, he thought. While avoiding Desilin's strange gaze, L noticed a huge pile of books in the room. And all of them were about magic. For a moment, L saw a reflection of himself in those books, his younger self, just as enthralled by magic and immersed in books. Seeing Desilin's passion, similar to his own, L smiled at him, Desilin awkwardly stood a little further away from L, trying to regain his composure, I apologize, his majesty is waiting for you, let me take you to him, along the way, could you tell me a little about the magic you've attained? Witnessing Desilin's enthusiasm for magic, L felt even more empathy for him, his passion for learning about magic was truly immense. As Desilin led L towards the king, L didn't hesitate to show him a simple spell, conjuring a blue flame with abundant mana circulating around it. 
Desilin's eyes were glued to the flame in El's hand, filled with excitement. You can use magic this powerful in a blink of an eye. Even among level 7 mages, you're on a completely different level. Desilin muttered theories as they walked, truly burning with a pure passion for learning. Goodness, how can I achieve that? Could it be? El smiled while scribbling something on a piece of paper. He answered Desilin's questions wholeheartedly, and the conversation was pleasant. He thought to himself, perhaps his unique passion for research has drawn me to him. While walking down the palace corridor towards the king, El stumbled upon a captivating sight. From the royal palace window, the capital of the Tolian kingdom stretched out before him, a vast and beautiful land, worthy of its reputation as a powerful nation in the west of the continent. It was surrounded by vast plains, fertile with plentiful food resources. The land also boasted abundant underground resources and minerals, in El's eyes. The Tolian kingdom was truly a wonderful place. Seeing El stop and not answer his questions, Desilin stopped too and looked at him with a melancholic expression. El burst into laughter. Why is he making that gloomy face? To comfort Desilin's fragile heart, El handed him the piece of paper he had just been scribbling on. This is a theory about magic that I came up with. It has many similarities to studying magic and mathematics. Desilin cradled the paper like a treasure, his face beaming with excitement. Oh my goodness, this method, it's incredible. This theory seems simple, but it's also extremely clear and coherent. El smiled and instructed Desilin, I don't intend to share this with anyone else, but because you seem genuinely interested, I'll teach it to you. Keep it secret from others, please. Desilin cheered like a child. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, King Redoff was waiting impatiently in the banquet hall for Desilin to bring El. Redoff nervously tapped his fingers on the table. Desilin is late again. He must be lost in his magic stories again. Just then, Desilin's voice came from afar. Your Majesty, our guest has arrived. Hearing Desilin's cheerful tone, Redoff straightened up in his regal posture. Bring him in. Desilin entered first and politely invited El in. El appeared with a friendly smile. Please excuse my intrusion. The king greeted El warmly. You've arrived, Elmas. Redoff hadn't finished his sentence when Desilin interrupted him with unconcealed excitement, Your Majesty. He enthusiastically introduced El. This is the great mage who has changed the course of history. Redoff, knowing Desilin's personality well, reminded him, Desilin, behave yourself. Redoff felt slightly helpless in the face of the seventy year old mage who acted like a child. He sighed and said, I saw Elmas's abilities yesterday with my own eyes, so, can we just have a conversation between the two of us? Desilin stammered in response, Oh, I apologize, Your Majesty. El noticed something strange at this point, just the two of us. El scanned the room with his eyes and pondered, Now I notice, there are no knights around the king. He must have had them all leave so I wouldn't feel threatened. Redoff seems to be concerned for me. In a closed room like this, if a knight were sitting across from a mage, it could be perceived as a threat. Seeing Desilin leave at the king's request, El smiled and nodded at him. Thank you for bringing me here, Desilin. Desilin replied warmly, Next time we meet, tell me more about your research. Before closing the door, Desilin tried to salvage the situation and said to El with a cheerful voice, Make sure you do. Redoff sighed once more, exasperated by the light-hearted nature of the kingdom's only level 6 mage, oh my, ha. Touched by Redoff's consideration, El knelt on one knee and bowed respectfully, Your Majesty, I sincerely thank you for inviting me here today. In response, Redoff unexpectedly knelt down, showing no hesitation in disregarding the difference in their statuses, he gently placed his hand on El's shoulder, Elmas. El was taken aback by the king's action. Redoff looked at El with sincere goodwill. Get up. I should be the one thanking you. I want to express my heartfelt gratitude for saving me from danger yesterday. Immediately, Redoff and El both stood up. The king clapped his hands a few times, signaling to the servants. Soon, steaming hot dishes were brought in, and a grand feast was laid out before them. Redoff smiled politely and said, It may look a bit simple but all the dishes will be served at once. He tried to create the most comfortable atmosphere for El. Please don't be shy, since it's just the two of us, feel free to talk. Witnessing Redoff's concern for him and looking at the feast, neither overly extravagant nor overly simple, El thought to himself, 
King Ridoff seems to be a very dedicated man, even in the smallest details. Ridoff gracefully lifted a bottle of wine and said, I've prepared the finest wine in the kingdom, would you care for a glass? El accepted it with a friendly smile, thank you, your majesty, I'll enjoy the meal. El raised the glass of wine in his hand and pondered, if he's already so sincere and meticulous, I don't need to play any tricks, let's just be honest with each other. El spoke directly to Ridoff, your majesty, I'm guessing you intend to recruit me because you want to build a mage tower within the kingdom, correct? Ridoff was slightly taken aback and flustered by El's bluntness. He didn't intend to beat around the bush either, the king looked directly at El with a determined and sincere gaze, that's right, but it's not just about increasing the kingdom's strength. Ridoff explained with a sorrowful voice, monstrous creatures have attacked our kingdom many times, and countless people have lost their lives because we weren't strong enough to stop them, therefore, I only hope that you, Elmas, will come to our kingdom and prevent such losses from happening in the future. The king continued to speak with a sad tone, it's a shame, but I must admit that the Tolian kingdom is now divided into three parts, the faction of the first prince, who occupies almost half of the kingdom, is facing off against the faction of the second prince, if there's bloodshed at any moment, it would be no surprise. Because the factions are all trying to preserve their forces, the western territory of the kingdom has been ravaged by monsters, with no one willing to stop them. Ridoff solemnly told El about his expectations, for the people of this kingdom to feel safe, I want to make it a peaceful kingdom, to do this, we must destroy these monsters. And building a magic tower can be used as a means to prevent war with other kingdoms. Moreover, it will also help the third prince, who is more peaceful, to ascend the throne. After expressing his thoughts, Ridoff seriously asked El, Illumis, for the happiness of the people of the Tolian kingdom, could you stay in our kingdom, the peace of the kingdom is all in your hands. El carefully observed Ridoff's every move, his eyes sparkling with a firm will, it was definitely not a look of personal ambition. El was thus able to be certain of his previous plans. With a friendly smile, El nodded at Ridoff, all right, I'll do my best to help the Tolian kingdom prosper. Ridoff breathed a sigh of relief hearing El's answer, he happily continued, that's the right decision, thank you, regarding the construction of the magic tower in the future, I will definitely support you as much as possible. El began to talk about the conditions he had considered so far, but, I have a few conditions, first, I need three years. King Ridoff's face twisted in a mix of fright and disbelief, three years, we don't have that much time. Ridoff couldn't hide his anxiety, one of the devastated territories I mentioned before, the land of Duke Luvius, won't be able to hold on for much longer. After trying to regain some composure, he explained in more detail, peace was maintained for a while thanks to a talented mage, however, after he was suddenly kidnapped by a mysterious group, the monsters increased too much and that land suffered a fatal blow. El was stunned for a moment, kidnapping mages, that must be the work of the Ainshart Marquis family, and the Luvius family is the family of his father. King Ridoff continued to explain the current situation in that land, right now, it's being defended by the exceptional abilities of Duchess Raoul and Luvius, who is also quite talented like the previous duke. She's the only granddaughter of the late Duke Luvius, she has exceptional swordsmanship, a striking appearance, and is a skilled businesswoman. Ridoff spoke with sadness and couldn't hide the wrinkles that appeared from his worry, however, if the monsters attack again, I fear that this time we won't be able to prevent the Luvius family from facing the threat of annihilation. El shuddered at the cruelty of the Ainshart Marquis and the consequences he had caused for his family, after a moment of silence, El shook his head and told King Ridoff, but the three years can't be reduced, it's essential to have that much time to build the magic tower. As King Ridoff was disappointed and his face was filled with sadness, El calmly cut a piece of delicious steak and said, instead. El smiled and raised the piece of steak as if it were a small matter that he could solve in one bite, let me clean up the Manticore Valley. King Ridoff widened his eyes for a moment, the Manticore Valley, are you talking about that death-filled land, is that even possible? El nodded firmly, yes, I need three years to clean up that valley, how many Manticores are there? Ridoff nervously replied, about 10,000 manticores appear every year, and in the central area, there are about 50,000. 
L pursed his lips with a thoughtful expression, 50,000, it's going to take some time if that's the case. King Ridoff still seemed hesitant to believe L's plan, he asked him with a skeptical tone, but really, can you really save our kingdom from the Manticore Valley? L smiled confidently and replied, it seems your majesty has forgotten who I am, I'm the youngest seventh level mage on this continent. Oh, and, I also have a golem knight, L laughed gleefully, looking into Redoff's eyes to reassure him. Hearing L's words, King Redoff woke up as if from a dream, he realized his mistake, right? Redoff thought to himself, I almost forgot because of his youthful appearance, but this young man is a seventh level mage. And with a golem knight by his side, nothing is impossible. Looking into L's determined eyes, filled with confidence and enthusiasm, King Redoff finally felt more at ease and placed his full trust in the young man before him. After a moment of contemplation, he solemnly spoke to L, thank you for bringing peace to our kingdom. L nodded in agreement with Redoff, you can count on me, your majesty. After their discussion was finished, L quickly stood up, it seems it's time for me to leave, seeing this, King Redoff said with a hint of regret, you're leaving already. L replied with a polite smile, yes because I still have to arrange future tasks, thank you for inviting me here today. Redoff regretfully saw L out to the door, feel free to visit any time, oh, by the way, Illumis, can you tell me your exact age? L smiled and answered his question, I'm 17 years old, farewell. When the door to the room closed, Redoff was still amazed, 17 years old and already achieved such a level, that's incredible, but most of all, can he really clean up the Manticore Valley? The Manticore Valley, it's called one of the three major forbidden zones on the continent, millions of monsters flock here because of the dark spirit of the Demon King left on this land, it's where the Demon King descended in the past, and the monster-infested land of today was formed. It's considered the Valley of Death, where over 50,000 Manticores reside. But more than that, they're twice the size of regular Manticores. And their strength is terrifyingly superior. The Manticore King reigning over this place is the greatest threat to humanity. The Manticore King's forehead is adorned with a gem soaked in blood. It holds the power to rule over all Manticores on Earth. The power of the Manticore King is greater than that of 100 Manticores combined, it's estimated to be stronger than 100 knights specializing in swordsmanship. Villages disappearing due to Manticore attacks are not uncommon. And right now, Ken Village is facing the same situation, the constant Manticore attacks have worn down the village's defenses. Today is the day the Manticores begin their annual attack on the village, and the young men of the village have rushed to join the fight to protect their home. The knights were slightly terrified at the sight of two Manticores, they worriedly told each other, it takes dozens of us to deal with one Manticore, how come there are two at the same time? Miter, the captain of Ken Village's guards, shouted to encourage the knight's fighting spirit, we cannot let them enter the village. Miter gripped his spear and prepared for battle, everyone who can fight, join the fight. As Miter's spear emitted a soft blue glow of aura, unwavering faith was evident in the eyes of those who went to defend the village, what a captain, Miter is truly outstanding, he's only nearly thirty years old but already reached the level of a mid-level expert. A manticore ferociously charged forward, Miter gritted his teeth and focused all his strength into the spear, in that moment, a powerful blue light shone on his spear. The manticore roared menacingly at Miter, as if challenging him. Without hesitation, Miter leaped high into the air and aimed his spear at the head of the charging manticore, the aura spread throughout his body. Miter plunged his spear into the manticore's head with all his might, after a resounding roar of pain, the manticore struggled but the spear remained embedded in its head. Miter sat on the manticore's head and held the spear firmly, he signaled to his comrades, we have to finish it now, everyone shoot. Following Miter's command, the archers immediately drew their bows and aimed at the two manticores, who were being held back by his attack. Sensing danger, the manticore turned and tried to flee, but in less than a second, dozens of arrows were embedded in its body, causing it to let out continuous shrieks of pain. One manticore collapsed after the hail of arrows from the people of Ken Village, no matter how strong the manticore was, it couldn't withstand this attack. As quick as lightning, Miter leaped off the dead manticore's head and pulled his spear out. 
Immediately, he rushed towards the manticore that was trying to flee and swung his spear, severing its throat, this is the last one. Miter jumped to the ground and cautiously looked around, is it over? Before he could let out a sigh of relief, he was startled by the appearance of another manticore, even bigger than the previous ones. The people in the village defense group were also startled and exclaimed, what, another one, just by looking at it, this manticore is even stronger than the previous two. Miter immediately stood up, ready to fight, but he was also terrified by the magnificent and imposing manticore that had just appeared, they just keep coming. Miter tried to boost the fighting spirit of the knights who were demoralized by the previous two manticores, just one more. Seeing that most of the archers looked exhausted, Miter thought to himself, this is the first time I've seen one this big, it will be very difficult to fight it with just the villagers who are already worn out. A flicker of fear crossed Miter's eyes, but the feeling passed quickly because he was a professionally trained knight. Gripping the spear in his hand, Miter rekindled his fighting spirit and used all the energy he had accumulated. With the spear emitting a blue aura, Miter boldly brandished his weapon in front of the manticore, I will fight you to the end, come on then. Challenged by Miter's words, the manticore instantly charged towards him with ferocious speed, simultaneously spewing a ball of fire from its mouth. Miter did not back down from the manticore that was gathering energy in its mouth, he unleashed a brighter aura than before and cautiously aimed his spear to stop the manticore's advance. Feeling like it was being mocked by being blocked by a small spear, the manticore roared and launched a stream of fire from its mouth. Miter immediately knelt on one knee and plunged his spear into the ground, prepared to withstand the intense flames surging towards him. A powerful explosion occurred when the flames collided with Miter's energy, the deafening sound echoed everywhere and the ground seemed to shake. A blinding flash of light appeared, filling the village defenders with shock and fear, they looked at Miter with astonishment and worry. Through the smoky haze of the flames consuming Miter's body, one could only faintly see his silhouette tightly gripping the spear with both hands. As the flames dissipated, Miter gasped for breath, nearly exhausted, he mumbled, how is this possible? Miter was horrified as the manticore continued to walk towards him, how is it still intact after that explosion? In the moment the manticore saw Miter's scared and panicked face, it let out a cunning smile. The manticore lunged with its wide open mouth full of sharp teeth, but Miter couldn't even stand up, all the energy in his body had been depleted, he slumped his head down with resignation, is this the end? As Miter prepared to give up everything, a force of rescue appeared and unexpected swords slashed across the manticore's body. The manticore roared in terror and fell to the ground right in front of Miter, blood stained its massive body, and all the warriors of Ken Village and Miter stared in amazement. After the manticore fell, a pair of small feet slowly walked towards them. A female warrior appeared with a muscular physique and a radiant aura, her sword, despite having just sliced the manticore, was still completely free of blood, she spoke in a slightly cold tone, it's over, L. At that moment, Miter saw the girl's face, he was surprised to see it was a girl who looked barely twenty years old, dressed in magnificent armor, with a beautiful face and flowing red hair like a war goddess, he wondered, how could a girl, who looks under twenty, take down that manticore in one move, she is truly powerful. Elle appeared right behind Kana and clapped in admiration, amazing, Kana, you're really good, you must quickly find a new teacher. Kana blushed with embarrassment at Elle's unexpected praise, she shyly replied, no, no, I still have many flaws. L didn't pay attention to Kana's expression and continued to walk past her towards the defenders of Ken Village, don't worry. He reassured the still shocked and bewildered warriors, I have no intention of harming anyone. L smiled warmly and innocently declared, I am a magician who will bring everyone a peaceful life, because this place will be my land in the future. As soon as Miter heard L's audacious declaration, his face turned pale. He struggled to stand up on his trembling legs weakened from exhaustion, what do you mean by that? Despite being in a weakened state, Miter didn't forget his responsibility, he pointed his spear at L and asked in a firm voice, tell me, how did this place become your land? Kana grabbed the spear from Miter's hand and said in an angry, menacing voice, how dare you? Be disrespectful to L like that, Kana's aura erupted fiercely, her presence was extremely terrifying, 
exceeding even the highest level of swordsmanship experts. Kana couldn't control her anger when Miter dared to point his spear at those who had just saved his life. This was not only an insult to El but also an act of ingratitude in her eyes. As Kana's aura erupted fiercely, Miter let out a soft groan and stepped back. He was incredibly intimidating, appearing young yet radiating an overwhelming presence. El hurriedly stepped forward to ease the tense atmosphere. Kana, stop, we are outsiders, it's natural for them to be apprehensive. In an instant, Kana's energy, which was exploding just a moment ago, vanished as if washed away by El's single word. Kana glared at Miter with a cold expression, a stark contrast to the bashful look she had when looking at El. She sternly warned Miter, don't be disrespectful. El calmly explained to the Ken villagers, apologies, it seems I am not very good at expressing myself. He briefly outlined his plan, I want to drive the manticores out of this land and build a mage tower. El's words caused Miter to fall into deep thought, he didn't respond immediately, simply staring intently at him. Upon hearing those words, the faces of the villagers lit up, a mage tower, so, a level 7 mage will protect this place, protect us. After a moment of contemplation, Miter spoke with a face full of doubt, it's hard to trust strangers, so, what about us? After observing Miter's demeanor, El gradually realized, I understand, he's the leader of this village. El calmly replied, just live your lives as usual, his answer left Miter even more surprised, huh, usually, the new lord of a land wouldn't be so easygoing. El nonchalantly shrugged and explained, once we drive away the manticores, everyone will be able to live in this vast valley, I'm not a cruel lord, so I won't levy any more taxes than you're currently paying. El gave them a gentle smile and said, my wish is the same as his majesty's, I hope everyone can live happily. The villagers' eyes, once filled with despair, began to gleam with hope, their emotions were vividly conveyed to El. At that very moment, another manticore approached, its heavy footsteps pounding the ground with powerful force. El glanced at the newly arrived manticore with annoyance, well, looks like someone wants to disrupt our conversation. El calmly stood in place, chanting an incantation, a magical circle appeared beneath him, he said to the Ken villagers, please be at ease. Then, a series of sounds of cracking space followed, and a dimensional rift opened, three golems emerged from it, they were the experimental golems that El had created through various methods before crafting the Golden Knight. El confidently looked up at his towering golems and declared to the villagers, I assure you, I won't let them bother you anymore. El immediately commanded the three golems, go, the eyes of the golems lit up as they received their master's order. The golem couldn't respond like the golden knight, but it quickly charged into the attack, its movements were slightly slower than the golden knights but were still considered faster than any other golem. Next was an incredibly simple upward swing of its arm, not even requiring the sword to be drawn. And with a smack, the golem's hand smashed down on the manticore, flattening it as if it had just squashed a mosquito. The villagers gaped in astonishment, unable to speak, only Miter could utter a few exclamations, how can it defeat a manticore so easily? After ending the manticore's life as easily as Pi, the golem turned around and bowed its head before El, reporting its mission accomplished. El turned towards the villagers with a bright smile and asked, now, do you believe me? Miter had been shocked ever since he witnessed El summon the golems, his eyes, like those of the villagers, gleamed with hope, just having these golems would be enough to ensure safety. Miter stared intently at El, who seemed to be radiating a gentle aura, that mage must be incredibly powerful, perhaps he can transform the Manticore Valley into a place where humans can live. After careful consideration, Miter sincerely bowed before El, please forgive my rudeness. El laughed heartily and responded, that proves you are a capable leader, it's natural to be suspicious of someone you've never met. Miter enthusiastically shook El's hand, thank you. Miter suddenly exclaimed in alarm, oh, I have to go to the other side of the village, there are manticores there too. But El didn't seem the least bit hurried upon hearing this, he cheerfully reassured Miter, don't worry. Everyone was bewildered, not understanding what El meant, in reality, he had already planned everything out before showing up on this side of the village. According to El's plan, on the other side of the village, Silfer and Serena were gaping in amazement, it really is El's golden night. 
the Golden Knight had finished off two manacores without breaking a sweat, Serena and Silver, despite not being strangers to the Golden Knight's combat prowess, were still astonished, it's so powerful, truly amazing. It was unclear if it was because of being praised by beautiful women, but the Golden Knight seemed very proud. L, meanwhile, was still casually chatting with Mitre, can you gather the village representatives, I want to discuss the detailed plan. Shortly after, the individuals with positions and responsibilities for managing the village quickly gathered, their eagerness was understandable, as they all wanted to meet the village's savior. L swept his gaze across the meeting participants, as usual, he always wanted to assess carefully before acting. L couldn't help but be surprised internally, oh, I thought an elderly village elder would be here. But the majority of those present were young men, and moreover, they all had sturdy physiques. L looked at them, and his eyes sparkled with a hint of curiosity, they all radiate the same aura. He carefully observed each person, wondering, do they have a specific reason for being here? As the eyes of everyone, filled with skepticism, converged on L, he quickly spoke to break the tension, thank you for coming, my name is L. L didn't hesitate to ask them directly, I know it's a little rude to ask this so soon, but you all practice the same swordsmanship, right, even the aura you radiate is the same, that's not a power you can achieve just by training within the village, why are such outstanding young men here in the Manticore Valley? Mitre, after a second of being stunned by L's unexpected question, immediately fell into thought, pondering whether or not he should reveal their background to L. After a moment of reflection, Mitre smiled and replied, Indeed, the sharp eyes of a great mage can't be fooled. Mitre began to recount the whole story to L truthfully, We are knights of Baron Jamer's family. Baron Jamer is renowned for his exceptional swordsmanship, he reached the mastery level of swordsman when he was only thirty years old. The struggle for royal power was becoming increasingly fierce, with plots to entice the Baron everywhere, however, the Baron and his many pupils beside him had refused all attempts at persuasion, this rejection became the source of misfortune. When the attack in the monster territory began, no one came to his aid. After all, they all thought that if they couldn't entice the Baron, then it would be best to let him die. Mitre said in a choked voice, finally, he and five thousand soldiers fought a battle to the death with the monsters, and the result was the complete annihilation of the army. Mitre became more agitated as he spoke, fueled by resentment, we were squire knights at the time, the Baron told us before he left that if he couldn't return, we should run and join someone else to survive. At this point, all the young men present seemed very sorrowful, Mitre continued, his voice heavy with grief, however, we didn't want to run after the nobles who had turned their backs on him. Therefore, we all decided to settle here and try to protect this place to the end as a way of showing our gratitude to him. Mitre's story ended, L looked into his red-rimmed eyes and then around, the other members also had red eyes, he couldn't say anything, although their sadness had been conveyed in its entirety. L still couldn't fully understand. Actually, L wanted to scold their foolishness, with their abilities, they could have received knighthood in another country, their families could have had a comfortable life, but why did they bring their families to this place called a death zone and live such a miserable life? L couldn't sympathize with their naivety at all, but he also understood that each person had different thoughts and ideas. L told himself, since we all live in different circumstances, it's no wonder that we don't think exactly alike, just understand the differences and use them as an opportunity. L waited a while for their sadness to subside before speaking, actually, destroying the monsters isn't that difficult for me. L's words immediately attracted everyone's attention, their sadness was swept away without needing any comfort, I'm thinking about doing a few things with the manticore. He excitedly outlined his plan, however, manticores have a strong bond with each other. Therefore, we must first eliminate the Manticore King, L confidently declared to everyone, as if it were a trivial matter. Everyone was surprised by L's words, also because his words were so unusual, they had never seen the Manticore King since they came to the Manticore Valley, but L nonchalantly spoke as if it were normal, I'll handle everything, you just need to help out. Mitre was the first to voice the doubt in everyone's minds, um, eliminate the Manticore King, is that feasible? L confidently and brightly replied, whether my words will come true or not, just wait and see the outcome. 
At this moment, the Manticore King was still comfortably resting in the valley it ruled, it had never directly gone out to conquer any village because its minions were enough to terrify the people, whether El could easily subdue it was still an unknown. After an emergency meeting with the Ken villagers, El didn't immediately go to the Manticore King but instead teleported to another land taking a deep breath of the familiar air that had been with him throughout his childhood and adulthood, El happily said to himself, it's been a while since I've been back here. El stood on a high hill overlooking the city of Banzark in the kingdom of Cassius, the place hadn't changed much since the last time he was there. Dibel's shop is now much bigger than before, it's grown like a mansion and is among the top 100 shops on the continent, its position continues to improve. Since his business has flourished, Dibel has always happily immersed himself in his work, and now he even has to hire a secretary to help with his business. After fiddling with the pile of documents for a while, Dibel handed it to the secretary and said, Fill out this application form for me. The secretary nodded and took the papers, saying, Yes. Dibel was extremely satisfied with the current state of his business. After being allowed to sell magic stones from L, his shop had developed rapidly. Dibel thought about El and unconsciously smiled, the boy is an important customer and also the kid I've watched grow up, I hope good things happen to him. At that moment, Dibel happened to read the news about the incident at the Einhardt mansion, the Einhardt Baron's residence exploded, what the hell is this? Dibel was both surprised and worried, could it be El? He remembered that before leaving for the Blyard Empire, the boy had asked for information about the Einhardt Baron. Dibel fell into deep thought, and his heart was burning, could he be involved, I couldn't get any information, I hope he's safe. Dibel was so lost in thought that the secretary had to call him several times, Sir, Sir Dibel, finally, Dibel startled and looked up at her. Dibel asked the secretary in confusion, how long have you been standing there, the secretary looked at him with worried eyes, I've been calling you for a while. The secretary told Dibel, the most high-class customer you mentioned is here. Dibel jumped to his feet, his face a mix of excitement and astonishment, the most high-class customer, no way. As if they had telepathic communication, Dibel had just thought of L when the boy suddenly appeared, it's been a long time, Uncle Dibel. L smiled happily and greeted Dibel. But Dibel stared at him with wide eyes. L chuckled at Dibel's surprised reaction, he was still as straightforward as always, I want to talk to you about a few things, Uncle. Dibel rushed over and grabbed El's hand, making him jump, are you alright, are you hurt anywhere, is everyone okay? Dibel's face clearly showed worry, I heard that the Einhard Baron's house had an incident. He breathed a sigh of relief seeing El safe and sound in front of him, I was worried you were involved in that. After a few seconds of surprise, El smiled affectionately at Dibel, uncle, thank you, everyone's fine. L chuckled, seeing Dibel so flustered for the first time, it's nice to have someone worry about me, Dibel shyly adjusted his glasses and tried to appear calm as usual, I apologize for being so excited, I've known you since you were seven, so I get a little emotional. Dibel politely invited L to sit down before talking more. He was still a little embarrassed by his previous lack of composure. After clearing his throat a few times, Dibel calmly sat down and asked L, so, what do you want to talk about? L hesitated for a moment and replied, actually, I want to create a magic tower, Dibel is the first acquaintance L told about this plan, so he's a little nervous. Dibel opened his eyes wide in surprise, a magic tower, so the rumors are true. L had guessed that Dibel would react like that, he smiled and replied, yes, it does sound unbelievable, doesn't it? But you are actually a level 7 mage, El's casual remark was like a bolt of lightning to Dibel, it wasn't envy, but pure shock. Dibel gaped, unable to hide his astonishment, ever since you were a child, I knew you would do great things, but I never imagined you would become a level 7 mage at such a young age. After regaining his composure, Dibel asked El, so where are you planning to build it? El replied with a naive tone, in the Manticore Valley. Dibel was hit with another shock, the Manticore Valley, you mean one of the three restricted areas of the continent, you mean the monster territory, the Manticore Valley, really? Faced with Dibel's barrage of questions, L maintained a calm smile, as if nothing was out of the ordinary, yes, it is, seeing this expression, 
Daibel couldn't help but think to himself, this kid is truly unfathomable. He pondered for a moment, any country would welcome someone who wants to build a magic tower. So it could choose any beautiful location, but... It went and chose to build a magic tower in monster territory, I simply can't understand what it's doing. After a moment of reflection, Daibel didn't oppose L, he smiled and said, all right, L was a little surprised by Daibel's reaction which differed from others who had heard about this crazy idea, you haven't even explained anything to me yet. Daibel looked at L with complete trust, everything you do is very novel and interesting, I guess you already have a plan. Seeing Daibel's curious expression, L didn't hesitate to start explaining his plan, yes, actually. L explained the business he wanted to pursue to Daibel, Daibel's expression was initially curious, but as L's story continued, astonishment began to appear, culminating in a look of complete awe. Daibel fell silent for a while before saying with admiration, that's truly fascinating, just thinking about what can be achieved makes my heart race. Daibel clearly showed excitement about L's plan, if that business deal is successful, my shop will rise to the top 10 on the continent. Daibel couldn't hide his excitement, I'll start recruiting people to build the tower right now, when do you plan to start construction? L smiled contentedly, his idea having received a positive response, but soon after, he seemed worried and asked Daibel, as soon as possible, but will it be very difficult? Daibel pondered for a moment before saying, hmm, the Manticore King lives there, so, I don't know how many people will be willing to go. Upon hearing this, L was no longer worried, instead, he sighed with a mysterious smile, don't worry about that. After finalizing the discussion with Daibel, El returned to the Manticore Valley, a wild and mysterious land where humans have yet to set foot. This land retains its pristine wilderness because the Manticores reign supreme, with tens of thousands of them, making it very difficult for ordinary people to deal with. The ruler of this place, the Manticore King, awakened, sensing an unfamiliar energy source encroaching upon its territory. It roared, revealing its foul mood, standing up, it stood six meters tall, its massive body completely overshadowing the other manticores. The manticore king's overwhelming power was further evident in the dark aura that emanated from its body. Its combat ability surpassed even a master swordsman, and its sense of smell was incredibly keen. As soon as it pinpointed the direction of the strange energy source, the manticore king began to run towards it. Usually, Manticore kings have guards by their side, but this one was different, it was confident in its own strength, confident that nothing could kill it. Therefore, its independent pursuit of what was disturbing its territory was a form of self-assurance and pride. And finally, with that pride, the Manticore king launched itself forward like a missile, without giving much thought to where the strange energy was coming from. Very soon, it arrived, with burning red eyes full of fury, it bared its fangs and claws, threatening the enemy. The enemy standing before it was L's three golems, they looked old, but the three golems were overwhelmingly large compared to the Manticore King. The three golems, without L's control, simply stood like stone statues, although they were emitting energy that stimulated the Manticore King's keen senses. The Manticore King roared angrily, threatening the mindless golems that dared to intrude upon its territory. L slowly appeared, a smug smile on his face, you've fallen for it. However, the smile only lasted for a brief moment, as L took a closer look at the Manticore King, he exclaimed in astonishment, I can't believe it, just as I heard, you are a monster. L sat perched on the golem's shoulder and exclaimed in admiration, you're much bigger than the other Manticores I've seen before, at least you need to look like this for the others to listen to you. While L was examining the Manticore King, the King's movements were very slow, perhaps it was the composure of the strong, a powerful dark energy enveloping its entire body. L quickly sensed a dangerous aura in the dark energy naturally enveloping the Manticore King's body, ha, huh, it's probably quite dangerous. The dark aura perceived from the Manticore King was an ordinary strength, it was much stronger than L initially thought, and it was difficult to gauge its extent, he unconsciously mumbled, I need to check just how powerful it is. L calmly stood up and declared, now then, shall we test our strength, ordinary people would risk their lives if they wanted to try, but L has golems, so he is completely confident, even if a golem breaks, it will continuously be restored. 
Seeing El's arrogance, the Manicor King naturally became even more irritated, who would like someone challenging their authority, so, it quickly entered a combat state. One of the three golems charged towards the Manicor King like a whirlwind. The golem swung its iron fist and aimed directly at the Manicor King's midsection, delivering a blow. However, before the fist could reach the Manicor King's body, the golem was kicked away. The Manicor King even put on a show as if mocking the golem for daring to approach it. El's eyes widened in surprise, it's too fast. The first golem fell after just one kick from the Manicor King, a large section of its stomach was torn, and it lay motionless immediately. The remaining two golems charged forward simultaneously, attacking the Manticore King from both sides to prevent it from focusing. One of the two golems struck the Manticore King's face hard, with a loud slap sound signaling the blow's impact, but the golem's attack seemed to do no damage to the Manticore King at all. The golem's iron fist couldn't even scratch the Manticore King's skin, let alone break its teeth or jaw. Seeing this, El furrowed his brow with some concern, the attacks aren't doing anything to it, Manticores have unique regenerative abilities and truly tough skin. The Manticore King immediately counterattacked after the golem's feeble punch, it bit into the golem's shoulder and began to pull violently, as if tearing at a piece of meat. It took only three seconds for the Manticore King's sharp teeth to completely sever the golem's steel arm, its eyes flashing with a terrifying murderous intent. It gleefully looked at the golem that had just had its arm bitten off and lay motionless on the ground, its relaxed posture showing that it was the true master of the game. At this moment, behind the Manicor King, El's remaining golem charged forward to attack. The golem seized the opportunity to attack from behind while the Manticor King was still reveling in its powerful counterattack. However, unlike the golem's expectation, the Manticor King, with its keen intuition, quickly detected someone trying to ambush it, and it gently swung its back leg up, striking the golem in the face. A light swipe from the Manicor King shattered half of the golem's face, and it fell to the ground just like its two companions. The Manicor King flapped its wings, creating a whirlwind that showcased its overwhelming authority and strength, the swirling wind kicking up dust and obscuring the surroundings. As the whirlwind forced El to squint, the Manicor King charged forward with a roar that shook the earth. For reasons unknown, El stood calmly and remarked, It's much stronger than I thought. Calmly, he observed the golems and assessed the opponent's strength, the golems' recovery rate was very slow, which proved just how powerful the opponent was. After a moment of contemplation, El raised his hand, ready to summon the Golden Knight, if so, then now, Tana. However, before El could act, the Manticore King suddenly pounced with its sharp claws. El was caught off guard and found himself in a precarious situation, his panic causing him to forget that he could still use instant teleportation. And so, the Manticore King slapped him, roaring triumphantly with its eyes ablaze, the expression of a victor evident on its face. El was sent flying back ten meters, screaming in pain, unable to do anything as his body bent from the momentum, his bones cracking. El landed face first on the ground, the Manticore King approached with glee, pouncing on him, it looked at him with amusement, as a cat might look at a mouse, seemingly intent on playing for a while longer. But strangely, El's entire body emitted a faint blue light, and his form slowly dissipated like a bubble. The Manticore King was baffled, not understanding what was happening until El's voice echoed from the cliff above, Oh my, oh my. El breathed a sigh of relief as he looked down at the confused Manticore, it was indeed the right decision to create a doppelganger, just in case. El chanted, opening a spatial rift, and muttered, it would have been better if I could have handled it with just those basic golems, but oh well, truly worthy of the title of Manticore King, this is exciting. As the spatial rift widened, it was, of course, followed by the appearance of the Golden Knight. The Golden Knight landed gracefully, his entire body radiating a brilliant aura that further stunned the Manticore King. El looked down at the Manticore King and conceived a bold idea, he told the Golden Knight, Tana, today, fight without using a sword, according to Plan B, the Golden Knight immediately responded, acknowledged, my master. Even standing before the Manticore King, the Golden Knight looked rather small, the Manticore King roared at him to assert its dominance, clearly underestimating the Golden Knight's size. The Golden Knight charged forward, and just like the three golems before, 
he used only his fists, however, the Golden Knight's speed was clearly a significant improvement over those of the golems. The Golden Knight leaped, unleashing a devastating punch towards the Manticore King, however, it was faster, dodging the spot the Golden Knight aimed for. The Manticore King lunged forward, counterattacking the Golden Knight with its signature cat-like claw attack. But as its massive paws descended, the Golden Knight had vanished. The Golden Knight gracefully dodged the Manticore King's attack and then stepped back to gather momentum. Before the Manticore King could react, the Golden Knight was already a step ahead, swinging his leg to kick it in the face, its keen intuition once again allowed it to turn its head and dodge in time. The Golden Knight slumped to the ground due to the momentum of the kick. Just then, a powerful dark energy stream, like a storm, erupted from the Manticore King's mouth, heading towards the Golden Knight. Seeing this, Al furrowed his brows in worry, even Tana, this is too difficult. In that moment, when victory seemed assured, a bright and confident light flashed in both El and the Golden Knight's eyes. The Golden Knight finally revealed his true strength, channeling his energy into a punch aimed directly at the Manticore King's face as it strained to unleash the dark energy. The Manticore King, believing it had the upper hand, hastily lunged forward. The moment the Manticore King entered the Golden Knight's range, he unleashed a lightning-fast punch, striking it squarely in the face. The Golden Knight's powerful energy blast knocked the Manticore King back instantly, sending it tumbling backward in shock and panic. As the Manticore King lay defeated on the ground, its breath shallow, the Golden Knight approached, ready to deliver the final blow. The Golden Knight's previous attack had been aimed at killing the Manticore King, but it had managed to withstand it, so, as the Golden Knight leaped onto the Manticore King, ready to deliver a final blow. El suddenly stepped down from the cliff and told the Golden Knight, Stop, enough. It was unclear why El hesitated and said, There's no need to end its life, was a compassion rising within him. The Manticore King, spared from death, looked at El with gratitude, truly worthy of being a Manticore King, it was clearly not a mindless monster like the others. The Manticore King immediately rose, regaining its initial majestic and imposing appearance. But then, its expression changed quickly, no longer resembling a renowned Lion King, but a domesticated cat. El was also surprised by this outcome, thinking, perhaps it's just a big cat. Then, what was bound to happen, did happen, El brought the Manticore King to meet the villagers of Ken. Miter, upon seeing the Manticore King, was so startled that he stammered, what's going on here? The Manticore King rubbed its head against El like a playful kitten, El nonchalantly told Miter, Well, I've adopted this Manticore King. Miter looked up in horror at the massive figure of the Manticore King approaching him, he couldn't believe it, if a monster this large went berserk here, then. El chuckled and told him not to worry, it's just a big cat, try petting it. Miter was sweating profusely when he saw the Manticore King grinning friendly in front of him, what? The Manticore King licked Miter, causing him to freeze in fear and unable to move, El chuckled and said, It's kind of cute, isn't it? When the Manticore King settled down in a corner, Miter finally dared to ask El, El, what are you going to do with this monster? El replied, The Manticore King's strength is at the level of a semi-grandmaster, and he also has the power to command other Manticores. I plan to ask him to help take care of other Manticores. Miter's eyes widened in amazement at El's bold idea. With the villagers' astonished and admiring gaze, El happily declared, We will build a magical tower. To make this place a safe land where everyone can live. Three months have passed since the Manticore King disappeared from the valley and became El's pet, the construction of the magic tower has been running smoothly without any obstacles. El created an instant teleportation portal connecting the Dybel store. With the Manticore Valley, the teleportation portal operates stably and is very helpful for the construction process. Thanks to the teleportation portal, the store's hired workforce and expensive materials used to build the tower are delivered quickly. The exterior of the magical tower has quickly begun to take shape, the construction speed is beyond El's expectations. Currently, all of El's plans are progressing smoothly in parallel, generally speaking, nothing can stop his progress now. El has also solved the problem of the manticores hiding in the forest neatly. Instead of chasing them away or killing them. 
Elle decided to open up a space for them to live in a part of the forest without affecting the villagers. Everyone will be amazed if they know the truth. But thanks to this, the villagers have been able to build houses near the magic tower and expand their lives in the Manticore Valley. After El completely renovated Ken Village, 15,000 people migrated here in just a few months. Gazing at the dramatic change in the landscape after just a few months, Silver exclaimed in amazement, This place has become peaceful, it's not the same anymore. Silver happily told her children, It's unbelievable that this place used to be a monster forest that terrified people, Serena smiled and replied, That's good, Mom. Kana said coldly, but it's not finished yet, El nodded in agreement with her, yes, there's still a lot to do. Serena curiously asked El, so what's the next plan? El pondered for a moment and told them, from now on, we'll have to spend a lot of money, so our priority is to secure funding for the construction of the magic tower. El suddenly smiled mysteriously and told the three women, also, I'm about to meet an important person. Both Kana and Serena reacted strongly to El's words, Ha, huh, an important person. Kana whispered nervously to Serena, Sister, who is he talking about? Serena couldn't hide her nervousness either, I don't know either. The two girls immediately expressed their feelings to Silfer, I've never seen El like this, who in the world could make him want to meet them like this? Silfer, after a few seconds of thought, suddenly smiled, she clearly understood what the two girls were worried about, and instead of sitting around uneasily, Silfer suggested they go meet El's important person together. Then, they went together to a beautiful beach and El told everyone, I'm so glad you all came along. El was excited and didn't understand Serena and Kana's psychology at all, anyway, there's someone I want to introduce to you all, Serena forced a smile and replied. We all want to meet the person important to you. Seeing the nervous looks of the two girls, Silfer couldn't help but burst out laughing. The two girls felt that Silfer was teasing them, so they turned around and pouted. Mom, Silfer quickly hit her chuckle. Oh my god, I'm sorry. Silfer turned her attention to the pristine beach and asked Elle, But where is this? I can't recognize this place except that it's a beach. Elle excitedly told them, how about this, isn't it amazing, this is the west of the Tolian kingdom, they have a lot of seafood here. But because there are almost no high-level mages here, this is a poor territory because they can't sell seafood. Elle excitedly stopped and told Silfer, oh, but I'm sure you'll be surprised to hear this, the name of the lord here is. Before Elle could finish, a loud explosion interrupted their conversation. All four of them looked up nervously towards the sky in the direction of the sound. Ha, huh, what was that sound? A thick column of black smoke rose, immediately attracting their attention. Kana pointed in that direction and shouted, It's coming from the forest. At this time, in the fortress deep in the forest, a horde of orcs was launching an attack. The archers standing on the ramparts aimed at the orcs and started attacking them. A rain of arrows poured down on the orcs in a flash but the orcs only waved their hands and easily blocked the small arrows of the archers. While one orc was using a mace to block the arrows, another orc was carefully looking up at the ramparts for a weak spot to attack. After a while, it suddenly kicked the wall and leaped high. The orc found a rough spot on the rampart and clung to it to climb. It quickly climbed to the archer's position. The soldiers screamed in panic, it's climbing the wall again. Hurry up and pour oil down so they can't climb anymore. Seeing the orc nearly reaching the top, the soldiers panicked. Commander, we've run out of oil, we can't get any more right now. The commander was starting to lose his composure, what? The commander fearfully looked down at the orc, if this continues, we'll be defeated, what do we do now? At this moment, a strong female voice boomed, leave it to me, the soldiers immediately turned their heads towards the girl. The person standing before the soldiers was none other than Duchess Rowlin, the woman who had defended the castle amidst the orc forest for years. With overflowing confidence, Rowlin commanded the soldiers, protect me. Immediately, she leaped onto the wall and looked down. Seeing the orc trying to climb the wall, Rowlin clenched her teeth and cursed, you bastards. Don't you know when to stop, as soon as Rowlin finished her words, she jumped straight off the wall. She ran along the wall, defying all laws of physics, and charged towards the climbing orc. With a clean strike, Rowland disbalanced the orc and sent it tumbling off the wall. 
Rowlin glanced at the orc with a smirk, you're as stubborn as I am. Then, she dove towards the remaining orc standing on the ground, the orc's face was contorted with anger as it raised its club, ready to attack Rowlin. Rowlin charged down, taunting the orc, you're angry because I took care of your comrade, what good comrades you are, ha ha. An aura began to engulf Rowlin's sword, a powerful stream of energy just as rumored. She swung her sword straight down, cleaving the orc in half as easily as cutting through cake. After finishing the job, Rowland stood with a cool demeanor and said, Sadly, failure isn't my preference. The soldiers on the wall cheered loudly as they witnessed Rowland's easy victory, truly, Lady Rowland is different. Rowland turned around to bask in the applause, but the sight before her made her scream in horror, Oh no! The hand of the orc that had fallen earlier had managed to reach the top of the wall. In a blink of an eye, the orc launched itself off the wall with its club raised, ready to strike, Rowlin panicked and screamed a warning to the soldiers, Run, I can't believe it still had the strength to climb up there. The orc looked at the soldiers with a triumphant grin, while the soldiers, as if petrified, stood frozen in place, staring at it. As the orc was about to smash its club down on the soldiers, a fireball shot towards it. The fireball struck the orc directly, instantly turning it into roast pork. Rowland's eyes widened in astonishment, magic, who is it? It was L, stepping forward with an air of ease, that was a little dangerous. He gave Rowland a friendly smile and politely said, sorry for scaring you. L smiled at Rowland with a tender gaze, incidentally, I've been wanting to meet you. Meanwhile, outside the castle in the forest, three women were struggling through the leaves, trying to find their way back to him. Serena worriedly called out El's name, where did he go? Silver looked around, a little worried too, this kid is wandering through this dense forest and not getting lost, how's that possible? After a while of struggling to find their way, Serena finally found the path out of the forest. Serena sighed with relief and said to Silver and Kana, we're finally out, Silver anxiously asked Serena, did you see El? Serena quickly stepped forward and happily replied to Silfer, Oh, there he is, L. Serena and Kana arrived just in time to see L speaking to Rowlin in a gentle tone, Incidentally, I've been wanting to meet you. Rowlin's eyes sparkled as if she had just encountered someone from her dreams. The scene left Serena and Kana speechless, stunned with shock. After a moment of bewilderment, Serena whispered to Kana, Is that her, the person L mentioned? Kana replied nervously, I, I think so, could she be his girlfriend? Rowland's next action answered the two girls' questions, she pointed her sword towards L and asked, What do you mean you wanted to meet me, this is our first encounter, don't try to play any flirting games. L flinched slightly as the blade pointed towards his face, Oh, my apologies, it's just that I'm very happy to see you. He continued cheerfully to Rowland, It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. My name is Elimus, I'm a mage from the kingdom of Tolian, I came here because I have something to tell you. Rowland looked at El with a skeptical gaze, from the kingdom, why should I believe you? Without saying much, El immediately displayed a portion of his power to Rowland. Rowland's eyes widened in amazement at El's action, his mana level is very unique. She immediately sheathed her sword, thinking, with that much power, he seems to be telling the truth. Rowland politely placed her hand on her chest, displaying sincerity, I have been rude to the one who saved this territory, please forgive my narrow-mindedness. Right after, Rowland smiled kindly at El, come, I'll escort you to Duke Luvius' mansion. El's family was then invited to the mansion, it looked like any other mansion, quite elegant and beautiful. Rowland personally served tea to El's family, I'm so sorry, there's nothing but tea, El smiled and nodded in response, thank you. Silfer took a sip of tea and politely complimented, perhaps it's because the duchess herself served it, but the tea is excellent. Rowland responded shyly, apologizing for not having anything better to offer everyone. L looked thoughtfully at the cup of tea on the table, it was delicious, but just regular tea leaves that anyone could buy. He silently assessed, looking around the castle, noticing nothing particularly expensive. Her attire was also simple. Perhaps this family was facing more difficulties than he initially thought, thinking about this, L's hand involuntarily clenched, a feeling of frustration rising in his heart. 
Rowlin only began to inquire after taking a seat, asking why everyone had come. L responded with a gentle smile, explaining that the Duke Luvius' territory had suffered attacks not only from orcs as before, but also from manticores, but now she had nothing to worry about. Rowlin was surprised upon hearing this, asking, You will help us. L shook his head, saying, No, there's no need, from now on, the matter of the monsters in the Manticore Valley has been taken care of, I have built a magic tower in the Manticore Valley. He happily informed Rowlin, there will be no more attacks on this territory. Seeing Rowland staring at him with wide eyes but remaining silent, L hesitantly called out to her, Duchess, to which Silfer immediately replied, she's probably just shocked. After a moment, Rowland regained her composure, exclaiming, oh, I'm sorry, are you being serious, now that I think about it, I haven't seen the manticores lately. L smiled, assuring her, all the manticores will leave soon, you can rest assured. Rowland suddenly furrowed her brow and her eyes welled up with tears. She burst into tears while thanking Elle, thank you. Shaking with emotion, Rowland sniffled, telling Elle, this is the happiest news I've heard in years, thank you so much. Elle was a little surprised by Rowland's reaction, thinking, she's already so happy, what am I going to do now? He smiled enigmatically, thinking, I haven't even mentioned that I intend to make this family the strongest in the kingdom of Tolian. After a moment, Rowlin wiped away her tears, saying, I'm so impolite, even if the kingdom sent you, why did you come all the way here yourself? Silfer immediately spoke up, explaining on Elle's behalf, oh, Elle's father is a member of the Luvius family. She told Rowlin, it seems he truly cares, his father is Raynon Luvius, and I believe Elle and Rowlin are cousins, right? Rowlin was astonished once again. She nodded and confirmed to Silfer, yes, Raynon Luvius is a member of our family. She recounted with a tinge of sadness, he protected the territory from the monsters, but one day he was kidnapped. And since then, he disappeared without a trace, no one has been able to find any information about him. Rowlin stared at El with wide eyes, saying, I didn't know he had a son. El smiled affectionately at Rowlin, I think we're family, Duchess. Serena and Kana finally let out a sigh of relief, their hearts finally at ease. Elle continued to speak to Rowlin, when family members face difficulties. I think we should help each other. Elle encouraged Rowlin, so, Duchess, you will succeed in protecting the people in this territory. Having been without anyone to rely on for a long time, Rowlin couldn't contain her emotions and burst into tears again. She choked out, I'm sorry, I'm being weak in front of you all. Silfer smiled gently and encouraged Rowlin, I think you're very cool, Duchess, Rowlin shook her head shyly, no, I'm not. Rowlin finally managed to smile again and politely told Silfer, just call me Rowlin. Silfer laughed happily at Rowlin's cuteness, then, I'll introduce myself, my name is Silfer. Serena also smiled brightly and introduced herself, I'm Serena. Kana remained expressionless and told Rowlin, I, Kana. L was the last one to speak, I'm L, I hope you'll take care of me from now on. Rowland said enthusiastically to them, if you don't mind, I'd like to take you to a famous place in the territory, do you like the sea? All three women from L's family looked curious and interested, the sea. Rowland winked at them playfully, the weather is beautiful today, how about it? Rowland then took them to the most beautiful area of the sea in the territory, the three women couldn't help but exclaim in amazement, it's so beautiful. Rowland smiled and said to L, this is the only place our territorial duke can be proud of. L nodded and asked her, the ocean water is so deep and clear, I think there must be a lot of seafood, right? Rowland replied, yes. She chuckled and told L, we have more than enough but we can't get rid of it, so, we just leave it there, there's no way to export it, so. L immediately suggested to Rowlin, how about you sell me that seafood? Rowlin looked at L in astonishment, what, seafood, all of this, how? L smiled gently and told her, we need as much seafood as possible, you don't have to worry about transportation. L continued to persuade Rowlin, if you put it in a magic box, transportation will be extremely easy, please accept our offer. Rowland smiled and replied, looking at your expression, it seems you already have a special plan, am I right, 
Well, I hope you'll take care of me in the future. L laughed mischievously, replying to Rowlin, so, another business deal has been successfully concluded according to my plan, however, what L would do with the seafood he purchased remained a secret that he resolutely refused to divulge to Rowlin. The elixir, it boosts the body's regenerative capabilities and is used to heal wounds. The blood of the manticore is a crucial ingredient for creating the elixir, and the churches have used a special purification method to produce it. However, the amount of elixir produced is too little compared to the demand due to the rare ingredient, which has allowed the churches to reap enormous profits. But recently, the supply of manticore blood has suddenly become difficult at the main source, Dibel, so a fierce battle has erupted between the churches to compete for this rare ingredient, and it has also driven its price up. The sudden disruption in supply made the church anxious, with the excuse of being busy, after making his partner wait for about a month. Dibel visited the Reynard Church in the Dajek Empire, the high priest Virek had only greeted him for a moment before he exclaimed in surprise, What, you have 300,000 bottles of manticore blood? Virek opened his eyes wide in astonishment, Is that true, Dibel? Dibel replied, Yes, high priest Virek, I know someone who has a lot of manticore blood, I immediately thought this place must be in dire need of it, but how much can you take? Virek hurriedly calculated and said, The church is in dire need of the elixir, so we need at least 10,000 bottles, and at most, 30,000. Dibel sighed in regret, Oh, that's much less than I thought, I can bring back at least 100,000 bottles. Virek was astonished when he heard this, 100,000 bottles, seriously. His mind raced with calculations, 100,000 bottles was a huge quantity but it wasn't impossible if he mobilized the neighboring churches, this was a golden opportunity to increase his influence and earn extra profits, he couldn't let this chance slip away. After a moment of hesitation, Virek hastily confirmed the order with Dibel, Dibel, I will take 100,000 bottles, however, Dibel looked at him with concern, are you sure about this? Seeing that Virek didn't understand, Dibel quickly explained, every church on this continent wants to get their hands on manticore blood, so, I will sell it for 300,000 gold coins, no less, what do you think? Virek calculated the profit and saw that it was still profitable, moreover, the price of the elixir had not stopped increasing due to the gap in supply and demand, he happily grasped Dibel's hand, very good, Dibel, you will become our church's biggest partner. Virek asked Dibel with curiosity, but who in the world could supply such a large amount of those precious ingredients? Dibel grinned and replied, to put it simply, it's the most talented mage in the world. At this moment, El stood at the top of his own mage tower, looking down at the Manticore Valley with a satisfied smile. El exclaimed with pride, what a beautiful sight, I can't believe this used to be the Manticore Valley. It was all thanks to his recent plan progressing so well, El swayed on the top of the tower with excitement as he looked down at the warehouse at the foot of the tower. The villagers were transporting crates of manticore blood out of the warehouse, thanks to the distribution of manticore blood, the village was gradually becoming more stable. Earlier, after subduing the manticore king, El had moved the remaining manticores in the forest into the subspace. He had fed them seafood bought from Count Luvius and managed them carefully the villagers had been able to obtain blood from the manticores easily and started distributing it to the churches. The fierce manticores, who had once terrified the entire kingdom, had stopped attacking humans thanks to the manticore king's management. The manticores were no longer allowed to attack humans, but their need to find food was natural, therefore, they were given seafood, and in exchange, they willingly provided their blood. Thanks to their special regenerative ability, the manticores could still live normally after having their blood drawn, creating a stable blood supply, making the impossible possible. And because of feeding the manticores nutritious seafood, the quality of their blood was also higher than other types on the market. The villagers could earn a lot of money as the trade progressed smoothly according to El's plan. Moreover, almost none of the construction workers knew that the mage tower was built in the manticore valley. Because the construction workers were transported through the teleportation gate, they didn't know where the mage tower was built. Despite that, people still marveled to each other that the mage tower here was no less impressive than those in most other cities. 
However, L always reminded himself to stay alert, even though there were no threats to this place yet. While L's intuition was telling him to be cautious, inside the mage tower, Kana's hurried footsteps echoed through the hallway. L quickly sensed Kana's steps heading towards his office, and he immediately teleported back. L appeared in the office just a few seconds later and could hear the footsteps approaching in a very hurried manner. Kana burst through the door with a panicked expression, L. L saw her worried expression and asked anxiously, Kana, what's wrong? Kana was so flustered that she couldn't articulate clearly, it's. Serena, she, Kana couldn't even finish the sentence before she started sobbing. Seeing Kana's tears flowing freely, L instantly realized that something serious was happening. Immediately, he ran to Serena's room with Kana. As he opened the door, L exclaimed, Serena. Silfer was sitting beside the bed, taking care of Serena, the girl seemed to be unconscious and didn't react to Elle's call. At that moment, Serena was in a daze with hot, heavy breaths, but her skin was pale, not like she had a fever. As Elle approached the bed, he immediately asked Silfer, Mom, Serena is sick, can you check her? Silfer replied in confusion, Yes, I don't know what's wrong with her either. Silfer looked at Serena with concern, her face pale, her breathing heavy. Immediately, Elle grasped Serena's wrist and channeled mana into her to check her health. After a moment, Elle's expression became stunned. He said to Silfer, Serena's body doesn't have any mana left, but a different kind of power. It's not the dark aura from demons or the divine aura from heaven. Elle hesitated and spoke his conjecture, if I'm right, the new power in Serena's body is divine power, if we make a mistake, Serena could be targeted by the entire continent, L's expression turned more serious. Seeing her son so resolute, Silfer was speechless in shock, what, Kana was equally horrified, how could this happen? L frowned and looked at Serena, we can't waste time, they may have already noticed, Kana, take care of Serena. Kana glanced at L with worry, okay, okay. Then, L turned to Silfer and said, you need to set up a barrier around the valley, Silfer looked at his son with worry, right now. L quickly turned and left, I'll probably be out for a while, but don't worry, mom. The next moment, L stepped through the space portal and teleported to the highest point of the valley. On top of the wizard's tower, L carefully scanned the entire area and began to calculate his plan. He tried to hold back a sigh of worry, how long would it take to set up a barrier around the whole valley? But no matter how long it took, he had to do it properly, L looked up at the sky with determined eyes. Then, he stood there and cast magic, releasing a huge beam of energy straight up into the sky above the tower. The energy beam, after shooting straight up a few hundred meters from the top of the tower, began to split into tens of thousands of small beams of light like fireworks. Then, the energy beams intertwined with each other, forming a dome that slowly enveloped the entire valley. Meanwhile, at the Vatican Basilica in the capital of the Holy Kingdom of Gaia, a bright light was spreading inside the basilica. The Pope was showing satisfaction standing in front of a bright light like sunlight. Ah, this is, this day will be recorded in history, this is the first prophecy in three hundred years. At that moment, a resounding sound came from the sphere of energy in front of him, where the soul of darkness shines to exist in a world swept away by the flow, sometimes it is kind but sometimes it is frightening. In a place never understood, its beauty shines amidst the rugged terrain. It is very bright, but in the darkest place, light and darkness merge as one, find the divine flower that blooms there. The Pope, not understanding the prophecy, turned to ask his right hand, Archpriest Artemos, do you understand the prophecy just now? Artemos immediately gave his reasoning, if it is about the place where the soul of darkness shines, then it must be the Levetan Plateau, where the soul of darkness exists, swept away by the flow, it sounds like something about magic. A place never understood, meaning a place ostracized because of prejudice, sometimes it's kind, but sometimes it's scary, it must be talking about someone. Rugged terrain seems to be referring to the terrain, so it could be a place near the Levetan Plateau with rugged terrain and widespread magic, it is highly likely that the Holy Maiden is there. The Pope was quickly convinced by Artemos's argument, 
perfect, Archpriest Artemos, announce that the Holy Maiden has appeared on the continent, and request the Kingdom of Tolian and the Knights of Brilliance to cooperate, the appearance of the Holy Maiden is the will of the Holy Spirit, you must put your devotion first and go quickly. The Pope commanded with an ambitious smile, Our Holy Kingdom is currently holding the greatest power ever, this is the appearance of the Holy Maiden that we have waited for five hundred years, even if we have to confront the Empire, we must not falter, those who reject the will of the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Meanwhile, Serena still showed no signs of waking up, her health and breathing were even getting weaker. Cana stayed by Serena's side with worried, watery eyes. Silfer didn't know what else to do but pray for Serena to get better soon. At this time, outside the wizard's tower, El was still trying to create a magical barrier as quickly as possible. He had almost poured all his mana into building a dome-shaped barrier, to create a strong defensive layer in case the Holy Kingdom declared war on them because of their ambition. A few days had passed, but Serena still showed no signs of waking up, Silfer gently stroked her as her face grimaced, seemingly in pain, Serena, get well soon. We'll all be happy together again, Silfer looked at Serena with sadness and helplessness. El was also very worried but could only sigh, the mana in Serena's body was gradually disappearing and being replaced by divine power, and she had even more mana than a normal mage or knight. Now divine power is replacing her huge amount of mana, so the pain must be intense, she can hardly endure it, El's eyes were full of sorrow and pity. He continued to speak in a heavy voice, we won't be able to stop Serena from becoming a holy maiden and the Holy Kingdom will make everyone know about the descent of the Holy Maiden, they will do everything to find her. Cana also spoke with a worried voice, the Holy Kingdom of Gaia greatly respects the Holy Spirit, so they will find the Holy Maiden at all costs, right? Silfer frowned resolutely and told the two of them, the Holy Maiden is not free, it's no different than hell, I can't give Serena to them, whoever they are, I will not let my precious daughter suffer. Cana opened her eyes wide and looked at Silfer, she was deeply moved by her foster mother's sincere love. Cana immediately expressed her determination, yes, I will also protect my dear sister. El also chimed in, yes, I won't hand over my family to anyone else either. He put his hand on his mother's shoulder and smiled encouragingly, we'll protect Serena. Suddenly, a strange crackling sound appeared in the room. A few seconds later, a pop sounded and a magical letter appeared in front of El. He scanned the information on the outside of the letter, it was from the royal palace. Silfer looked at El with some surprise, a letter from the royal palace, what's going on? El read the letter and his face became serious, they want you to attend the council meeting. Silfer felt anxious and immediately turned to look straight at his son, the council meeting, why you, El, El shook his head and replied. I don't know either. El pondered for a moment and continued, maybe they want to announce the new tower master, or they want to use you to help the faction of the third prince. El folded the letter and said vaguely, anyway, the magic tower has long held a neutral position, no matter what happens, it won't change my plan. Silfer heard her son's confident tone and immediately smiled. Silfer curiously asked El, it seems you have a plan, right? but he only replied to his mother with a mysterious smile. Soon after, El turned and left, telling his mother, I'll be back as soon as possible, take care of Serena, Silfer nodded and told her son, be careful. After leaving the magic tower, El went to the Countess Luvius's mansion. El suddenly visited the old manor, which was unchanged, hello, Countess. El smiled contentedly, looking around the living room which had started to have servants, it seems like managing your territory is going well, right? Rowland replied with a radiant smile, it's all thanks to you. She excitedly asked El, but why are you here today? I don't think you came to visit the territory. El smiled warmly, did you realize? Rowland nodded slightly, I haven't met you for long, but I think everyone would think that. Immediately afterwards, El's smile became sly, then I'll be straightforward with you. I hope you will go to the Central Council with me and let the Luvius Count family step into the political path. Rowland was stunned when she heard that, what, our family, at the Central Council? El nodded firmly, with your skills and my support as the Mage Tower Master, I believe your family can become an important noble, after all, your financial difficulties will be solved when you export seafood. 
El continued to encourage Raulin, if it's you, Raulin, who became a master swordsman at a young age, I believe many knights would want to follow you, and if you recruit them under the name of the Luvius family, you'll have even more standing. Then the Luvius family can restore its position, Raulin's face lit up at El's words. She immediately felt she could consider El's offer, it's true, the Luvius family is still developing steadily, but. As Raulin hesitated, El continued her words, but it's still not on par with the Terendel Viscount family, right? Raulin was a little shocked because El seemed to read her mind, why the Terendel family, El answered frankly, because it's a famous story, isn't the second son of the Terendel Viscount family insistent on proposing to you, they are taking advantage of the fact that the Luvius family is in a difficult situation due to the monster attacks, so, their condition is help, in exchange for you becoming a member of the Terendel family, right? Seeing that Rowlin didn't deny it, El continued, they believe that the monsters disappearing near the Luvius territory is thanks to their Terendel family, so, they keep proposing to you, even though you and I are the ones who suppressed the monsters. With each of El's words, Rowlin's small but strong hand tightened a little, they are so arrogant and shameless. El spoke in a low voice, reminding her of the order of status, below the king and prince are dukes, marquises, earls, viscounts, and barons, compared to a viscount, a countess is in a lower position, the Luvius family is also in decline. El said with a hint of anger, people are saying that Luvius can only endure that humiliation, this stimulated Rowlin. Immediately afterwards, he softly offered a solution, so, this time, you need to show the strength of the Luvius family, you can't keep enduring injustice. El declared to Rowlin with full confidence, I am a level 7 mage and also the master of a mage tower, I receive treatment like a viscount everywhere on this continent, but in this country, I can have an even higher position, if I'm with you, no one can touch the Luvius family. Rowland's sparkling eyes trembled slightly with emotion, El, why are you so good to me? Before El could explain anything, Rowland exclaimed excitedly, could it be you? She blushed and awkwardly embraced herself, in a shy voice, she asked, the price of unconditional help is. El quickly read the ambiguous thoughts in Rowland's mind, he sighed with exasperation, you don't have to make it sound so scary. El propped his chin and glanced at Rowland, were relatives, so, Rowland saw his teasing gaze and jumped up to retort with embarrassment, I know, I'm misunderstanding, don't look at me with that look. L suddenly stood up and paced back and forth thoughtfully, right now, she's probably been through a lot of difficulties, so it's hard for her to accept this sincere goodwill, I feel bad for letting her shoulder all the burden like that, but I need to change the atmosphere now. After thinking for a while, L clicked his tongue and pretended to scold Rowlin, so, Tomorrow we can teleport directly to the conference area, I'll leave it to you, but, I'm a little surprised that you think of me like that. Facing El's reprimand, Rowland felt even more guilty and quickly apologized, I'm really sorry, El, escaping from the awkward situation, chuckled to himself triumphantly. Meanwhile, in the capital of the Tolian kingdom, a secret meeting was taking place between several nobles. As soon as the meeting began, Duke Tudgenbollier erupted in anger, slamming his hand on the table. Tudgenbollier questioned the other nobles, what are you going to do, our faction supporting the second prince is in danger. Tudgenbollier didn't hesitate to criticize the other nobles, the plan to harm the first prince has failed, moreover, the third prince's faction has become even stronger, if this continues, our power will weaken. He spoke louder and louder, does anyone have any good ideas? Seeing that the other nobles remained silent, Tudgenbollier became even more furious, give me some advice, will you? Finally, a hesitant hand rose in the tense atmosphere. Viscount Brilken smiled cunningly and spoke, I have an idea, Tudgenbollier nodded, oh, Viscount Brilken, please speak. Brilken showed himself to be wise, speaking with a hint of arrogance, the first prince's faction has gained significant power, and the influence of the third prince's faction has also increased, but we have nothing to fear. Because our second prince's faction can expand its military potential, all we need to do is. Then, with a sinister smile, Brilkin began to reveal his plan. When they heard Brilkin's plan, the other nobles were stunned, mouths agape, they were confused, not knowing what to say, they could only glance at Tudgenbollier, awaiting his decision. After thinking for a moment with a furious frown, 
Tujanbalier relaxed his facial muscles with a cunning smile, just as I expected from Viscount Brilkind. Tujanbalier clapped his hands and laughed heartily, that's a great idea, I have no further comment. Brilkind grinned triumphantly, thank you, sir, I will do my best to ensure that we can complete this plan perfectly. Tujanbalier burst into a cheerful laugh, of course, our plan will succeed, ha ha, seeing this, the other nobles could finally smile in relief. It had been two months since Serena's mana gradually disappeared, most of it suppressed by divine power, El was certain in his heart that the Holy Kingdom had also sensed this divine power, but he was forced to suppress his worries for Serena and go with Rowland to the capital of Tolian to attend the conference. As soon as they teleported to the location, El looked around the streets with delight, so, this is the capital, I've never seen a street as bustling as this, it's amazing, isn't it? When El turned back to look at Rowlin, her face was even more surprised and delighted than his, she was so engrossed that she didn't notice his question. El was curious about Rowlin's expression, what's wrong with you, Rowlin replied shyly, I've never seen a street so crowded and lively, it's a little moving. For El, this was even more astonishing than the sight of the city streets. El asked Rowlin in disbelief, you're the Countess of the Kingdom, but you've never been here, Rowlin nodded in confusion, I'm always busy with work in the Countess territory, so. El couldn't help but feel sympathy for Rowlin, so, she's been carrying the burden alone all this time. After thinking for a moment, El suddenly suggested to Rowlin, how about we go sightseeing around for a while, as soon as she heard this, she clearly showed her excitement. Rowlin was excited but also a little nervous, she hesitantly asked El, is this okay? El immediately took Rowlin's hand and pulled her down the bustling street. He turned back to look at Rowlin with loving eyes and a gentle smile, it's alright. Then, they wandered around the capital until dusk and finally found a luxurious inn to rest. Rowlin beamed at El, wow, this is so much fun, El responded with a bright smile, you should relax like this sometimes, it's good for you, Rowlin touchedly nodded, thank you, El, I'm really happy. She smiled radiantly with bright eyes, I wish I could bring the people from my territory here too, as they were chatting happily, a man's voice suddenly interrupted, Countess Rowlin. Rowlin's face darkened as soon as she saw him, Locke. Locke strode towards them aggressively and pointed at L, demanding, who is this you're with? Locke was furious, he glared at L, you don't look like a swordsman, a mage, you look like a third-rate one, ha, huh? so you like to chew on young grass, do you? Locke didn't give Rowlin a chance to speak, he continued, you rejected my proposal because of him, didn't you? Locke angrily leaned in close to L and growled menacingly, but L simply looked at him as if he were nothing. Seeing El not even show fear, Locke became even more enraged, he gritted his teeth and cursed El, you bastard. Locke began shouting and shoved El in the face again, who are you, spill it, after a moment of shock, Rowlin regained her composure, she said coldly, Locke, watch your tongue, you don't even know who he is. Locke glared at Rowlin again, if there's nothing fishy, why hide him, even if he's a mage, he's probably inferior to me, right? Rowland snorted with disdain, inferior to you, you're such a smooth talker, do you even realize how stupid you're being, Locke's blood boiled even further at Rowland's sarcasm, what? But Rowland didn't back down at all, she glared at him and retorted, you're just the second son of a marquis, you don't even have your own noble title and yet you dare to be rude to a count, unforgivable, surely you realize the difference in our status. Faced with Rowland's sharp words, Locke started to panic, Rowland continued to criticize him, you should learn the law of the kingdom before you dare to look down upon us. After silencing Locke with shame, Rowland and L walked past him, Rowland turned to L with a gentle expression, I'm sorry, L. Rowland added with embarrassment, he's the second son of Marquis Terendel, I'm sorry about this, L calmly nodded, ah, it's fine, so, he's the one who keeps insisting on marrying you. Seeing them leave happily, Locke was filled with resentment but could do nothing but grit his teeth and silently curse in his heart. Rowland calmly said to L, we should go quickly, I feel like I'm getting infected by his negativity, L nodded in agreement, good idea. The curses echoed in Locke's head, damn it, I've put so much effort into winning Rowland over, is she rejecting me for that good for nothing, it's not over yet, she'll pay for humiliating me, even if I have to get involved in the conference. 
Meanwhile, at the royal palace, King Ridolf and Lias were talking. King Ridolf sighed with relief, looking out of the palace, thank goodness the Manicor Valley is peaceful now, don't you think so, Duke Lias? Lias smiled in agreement, yes, it's all thanks to the master of the magic tower, the only thing that could fight those monsters was the Golem Knight, a Golem Knight on par with a Grand Master, he's truly a gifted mage, the master of the magic tower, Elimus, is like an onion. King Ridolf was startled, he turned to look at Lias, an onion. Lias enthusiastically explained, his potential is limitless, and he always comes up with surprising ideas, we're lucky to have such a talented individual in our kingdom. Lias chuckled, enjoying his own joke, he's not an ordinary mage, the more you get to know him, the more intrigued you become, like peeling the layers of an onion, ha. Ah. King Ridolf, after a moment of confusion, forced a laugh, ha, ah, that's a typical joke from my father, Lias looked at King Ridolf in bewilderment, your father's joke, your majesty, but King Ridolf didn't answer his subordinate's question. He just smiled and continued talking about L, it's an honor to have such a mage in our kingdom, but it would be even better if he agreed to attend tomorrow's conference. Lias pondered for a moment then asked King Ridolf, but is that possible, as far as I know, the magic tower doesn't have any interest in politics, King Ridolf chuckled, you're doubting him, he's young, but his abilities surpass his peers. He can see through people's thoughts, I'm sure he knows what I'm thinking, his acceptance of this request shows he will support the war for the throne, King Ridolf said confidently, and his assumptions were correct. The second day El and Rowlin were in the capital of the Tolian kingdom, the Tolian conference was held, it was an annual event attended by important nobles from the country. Any noble who had inherited a title could attend, along with their two direct descendants, as soon as everyone was present, King Ridolf, presiding over the meeting, spoke, it's a pleasure to see you all, now, we will begin the meeting. King Ridolf spoke seriously to the nobles, this conference will be held without a specific topic as usual, feel free to put forward proposals for the future of the kingdom. Immediately, Tujinbalir raised his hand to speak, Your Majesty, I have a proposal. After King Ridolf's nod of permission, Tujinbalir proposed, Since the monsters who have been plaguing us have been defeated, our kingdom has seen a glimmer of hope, at this moment, our kingdom is at its peak, we have been able to stop the monsters without any casualties, and last year's harvest was bountiful, this has been the most successful year in the past decade. As Tujinbalir spoke, the nobles and the opposing factions stared intently at him, what I want to say is, now is the perfect time to spread our influence, it's important to let other countries see our strength. Then, Tujinbalir made a shocking conclusion that stunned King Ridolf, therefore, my proposal is to conquer the kingdom of Hessen. King Ridolf was completely surprised by the proposal, but Tujinbalir continued, Hessen has been plundering our resources for the past ten years and blaming it on bandits. Tujinbalir's words shocked the other nobles even more, recently, we have received news that their soldiers have been disguising themselves as bandits and stealing food from our people, there is clear evidence, I believe this is enough to declare war, through this, we can display our strength to neighboring countries. All the nobles looked towards Duke Tujinbalir, he was the leader of the second prince's faction, so the nobles from the first prince's faction glared at him, King Ridolf, seeing that the proposal would affect the peace of the country, tried to delay, this is a serious matter, we should carefully discuss it, we must consider the reactions of other countries as well. Tujinbalir immediately added, there's no need to worry, no one will dare to oppose us if we use overwhelming force, the nobles who agree with my opinion have 20,000 soldiers, with your majesty's permission, I will order an immediate departure for the kingdom of Hessen. King Ridolf understood Tujinbalir's intentions, but the proposal was too tempting for him to ignore, if they could defeat the kingdom of Hessen, the Tolian kingdom's authority would rise dramatically, seeing that King Ridolf seemed hesitant because of the benefits, Tujinbalir continued, I propose that the second prince be appointed as the supreme commander of the army. Tujinbalir cunningly explained, the first prince must protect the kingdom, it's best to send the second prince to gain experience, everyone in the meeting room saw through Tujinbalir's intentions, to be fair, Hessen wasn't a major power, but for the Tolian kingdom, conquering Hessen would be a stepping stone to expanding into other countries, and if the second prince led the conquest, he would be closer to the throne. At this moment, 
Marquis Terrandell was the first to speak out in opposition, Your Majesty, I object, last year, we suffered very few losses thanks to me and my brave soldiers, but this year, things may not be the same, therefore, instead of focusing on pressuring another kingdom, I believe we should prepare for the invasion of those monsters. Terrandell said forcefully, that's the only way to protect the kingdom and its people. Two opposing opinions emerged, making King Redoff even more concerned. On one side was Marquis Terrandell, the leader of the First Prince's faction. On the other side was Duke Tudgenbollier, who hoped to build up the Second Prince's reputation through the conquest of the Kingdom of Hessen. King Redoff looked back and forth between the two nobles with great status and power, his brow furrowed with a sigh of frustration in his heart, ugh, why can't these two factions just cooperate normally? After a while, King Redoff spoke again, I understand, but one of the reasons I'm holding this conference today is to introduce a mage. That is Elimus, have him brought in, King Redoff turned his eyes towards the opening door, hoping that El's appearance would break the tense atmosphere of rivalry. As soon as El stepped into the conference room, the eyes of the nobles clearly showed shock at his age. El smiled warmly at everyone, it's nice to meet you all, I'm Elimus. Suddenly, one of the nobles jumped up, glaring at El with an aggressive attitude. This noble's action made Rowlan startle and worry. Locke stood up abruptly, spitting out a curse without regard for anyone, that bastard, I thought he was the mage of the Count Lovius family. All the nobles were taken aback once again by Locke's agitated appearance, Terrandell spoke to his son in a worried tone, Locke, what's suddenly gotten into you? Ignoring his father's attempts to stop him, Locke pointed at El with an aggressive attitude, Your Majesty, I have something to report about him, last night, I encountered him at a hotel in the capital, he was very insolent. Locke portrayed himself as a victim and criticized El, that third-rate mage insulted me, everyone knows I sent a marriage proposal to the Count Lovius family, but he dared to interfere with my business. Locke's words grew increasingly alarming to his father, I may not have a title, but I'm an important person in the kingdom and the second son of the Marquis Terrandell family, I'm also a pure-blood noble, but he dared to belittle and disrespect me, how can I forgive him for insulting my noble honor? Locke insisted on making a shocking request to King Redoff, Your Majesty, you should not trust that villain, please punish him. A prolonged silence filled the conference room, the situation was even more tense than before, leaving King Redoff unsure what to do. Locke continued to stare at El with eyes filled with hatred. He smirked smugly, bastards like him will never know their place if they aren't taught a lesson. However, Locke's aggressive attitude was met with El's composed smile. After a moment of stunned silence, King Redoff cleared his throat and prepared to address this ridiculous situation. King Redoff extended his hand towards El and introduced him with a solemn voice, Okay, first, calm down, this person will become one of the greatest supports of our kingdom in the future. King Redoff declared with a hint of pride, This is the master of the magic tower, Elimus, I invited him here personally, the king's words stirred the crowd of nobles, master of the magic tower, all the nobles exclaimed in unison, their faces full of astonishment. With a group of nobles engaged in a highly tense battle for the throne, the appearance of a seventh-rank mage was like a trump card that could turn the tables, therefore, everyone's faces clearly showed a look of shock. The nobles began to whisper amongst themselves, only mages of rank seven and above can create a magic tower, you mean this young lad is a seventh-rank mage, doesn't that mean he's equal to a marquee? El's smile deepened upon hearing the skeptical whispers, exactly as he had anticipated. El smiled brightly, raising his hand high, if you still have doubts, then I will prove it. Immediately, a swirling vortex of light appeared on the ceiling of the conference room, spreading outwards and causing the nobles to jump in surprise. From that vortex of light, a massive amount of mana surged outwards and gradually filled the space of the room. The nobles were stunned in place, they stared at the energy vortex on the ceiling without blinking, this immense amount of mana. Tudgenbollier swallowed nervously, the air around him suddenly becoming heavier. Even Terrandell couldn't help but gape in shock, there's no doubt, his power is at least rank 7. All eyes of admiration were then directed towards El, who calmly smiled, what an incredible power. King Redoff burst into hearty laughter upon witnessing the expressions of the nobles, ha 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 ha, Elimus' magical talent is truly rare. 
King Ridoff looked at L with a satisfied nod, they seem to have a better understanding of you now, I think you can stop here. L smiled amicably in response to King Ridoff, as you command, your majesty. Immediately after, the energy vortex on the ceiling completely vanished, leaving only shimmering dust of magic, like glitter, floating in the air. Locke was now completely petrified, no, it can't be, he's actually a seventh-rank mage. L smiled triumphantly, looking directly into Locke's eyes with a warning, it seems like you won't dare to bother Rowlin anymore, will you, but if you dare to harass her again, I won't hold back. Even though L didn't voice his thoughts, his gaze caused Locke to instinctively flinch and step back. Tarendel saw his son's humiliated expression and turned away in disgust. Locke, what in the world have you done now? Then, L appeared to be in a somber mood as he addressed King Ridoff. Your Majesty, it seems I've disrupted the atmosphere, I'd like to take my leave. King Ridoff watched L's back as he left, a look of regret on his face. Ah, you've only just arrived in the capital, please forgive me. L stopped in his tracks and replied in a courteous manner, it's all right. Before stepping out of the conference room, L turned and looked at the nobles with a meaningful look, I hope to cooperate with you all in the future. When the conference room door closed, a silence once again enveloped the atmosphere, the two factions of the crown prince and the second prince had completely forgotten about the issue they were arguing over. Rowlan silently chuckled at L's very cool appearance. King Ridoff once again focused his gaze back on the conference table, that person is the savior of our kingdom and the most important talent in this country. I hope you all respect him, King Ridoff's declaration caused the atmosphere of the meeting to become heavy, it goes without saying, everyone understood that Prince Judmian, who is backed by the forces behind the royal family, has the highest chance of becoming the next king. Because the king just openly defended the master of the magic tower, it means the growing power of the master of the magic tower will benefit King Ridoff, which in turn increases the advantage of Prince Judmian, who is receiving the king's support. Tarendel saw this clearly and felt uneasy. In this case, we can conclude that the master of the magic tower also supports Prince Judmian. Tujinbalir shared the same feelings of worry as Tarendel. From now on, our faction needs to be more careful. Receiving the expected response from the nobles, King Ridoff said, we need to consider the master of the magic tower's power in relation to the issue concerning the kingdom of Hessen, so, it's best to put it aside for now. King Ridoff smiled contentedly and asked the nobles, is there anything else to discuss? With no further objections, King Ridoff declared, then why don't we end the meeting, if you have any further questions about the master of the magic tower, save them for the post-meeting feast. After the meeting concluded peacefully, that evening, King Ridoff sought out a room at the end of the deepest corridor in the palace. The long corridor was utterly silent, only the sound of King Ridoff's troubled footsteps could be heard. King Ridoff personally knocked on Princess Elisa's reading room door instead of sending a message for her to greet him. A gentle voice echoed from inside the room, Yes, King Ridoff replied, It is I. Elise, recognizing her father's voice, immediately responded cheerfully, Father, please come in. King Ridoff entered his daughter's reading room with a kind smile, So, you're here. King Ridoff glanced around at the bookshelves in the room, newly filled with more books, Princess, you truly love books. King Ridoff warmly praised his daughter, Elise, you are only seventeen years old, yet you are the most intelligent and learned princess, I have great faith in you. Elise responded with a radiant smile, thank you for your praise, what did you come to talk to me about, father, the king wanted to persuade Princess Elise about a matter related to the kingdom's future marrying El, only by becoming a family could King Ridoff secure El's unparalleled power. Concerned that his daughter might object, King Ridoff tried to persuade her, please understand, this is for a stronger nation, he will be attending the feast tomorrow, why don't you come and meet him? King Ridoff offered a gentle smile, I think you'll like him if you meet him. As your father, I feel you should marry the master of the magic tower, he said softly, unwilling to force his daughter. Knowing her father loved her deeply, Elise did not refuse his request, yes, father, if you wish it, I will meet and converse with him. Elise closed the book in her hand with a chuckle, actually, I'm also curious to know what he is like. Seeing his daughter's reaction, King Ridoff was overjoyed internally, I understand. 
he quickly departed, I'll see you at tomorrow's feast, Elise politely bowed, yes, father. After King Ridoff left, Elise's demeanor remained unchanged, she calmly put the book back on the shelf. Elise murmured to herself, a soft smile playing on her lips, the master of the golden tower with the symbol of gold, Elimus. I wonder what he's like, Elise pondered, a touch of anticipation in her eyes as she gazed towards the moon silently drifting outside the window. The next day, the royal feast hall was filled with nobles, all eagerly awaiting El's arrival. While still outside the feast hall, El curiously glanced at Rowlin, hm, Countess, why were you laughing then? Rowlin asked in bewilderment, then, what do you mean, when, El replied, when I left the meeting, Rowlin immediately exclaimed, oh, I was just thinking, you're truly something else. Rowlin candidly expressed her admiration, with people like them, actions speak louder than words, they won't dare to recklessly provoke a countess anymore. El nodded in agreement. Oh, I understand, but your clothes, Rowlin slightly furrowed her brow and looked at Elle, what's wrong with them? Elle surveyed Rowlin from head to toe and couldn't find any femininity in her attire, he sighed softly, you're not wearing a dress, you're wearing a knight's uniform, it's a feast today. Rowlin replied lightheartedly, I'm not here to seduce men, so I don't need a dress, what's wrong with wearing a uniform, Elle contemplated and found her logic sound. But then Rowlin teased him, oh my. You want to see me in a dress, huh? El clearly displayed a look of exasperation and let out a sigh. Seeing El's reaction, Rowland pouted and reprimanded him. I mean, you could lie with good intentions, you're so mean, I'm a woman, you know. El chuckled slyly, All right, all right, I'll escort you today, Countess Luvius, shall we go in now? Immediately, they entered the feast hall arm in arm. The feast was held on a grand scale with an atmosphere of solemnity. The children of nobles in the hall were all eager to meet El, the title of Master of the Magic Tower was truly captivating. A resounding announcement rang out as soon as El stepped into the feast hall, the Master of the Magic Tower, El, his appearance quickly drew everyone's attention. At the same time, people became more cordial towards Rowlin, greetings, Countess Luvius. Rowlin smiled radiantly, her heart brimming with joy, it was like a dream come true from ordinary barons to nobles at the center of politics, they were unexpectedly initiating conversations with her. She secretly glanced at Elle with gratitude, while they might want to befriend Elle rather than her, this was a rare opportunity, she had to do everything she could to revive her family's reputation. Rowland greeted the nobles with a friendly smile, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Seeing her begin to mingle with the other nobles, Elle was pleased, he hoped Rowland would seize this favorable opportunity. Soon after, the announcement echoed once again throughout the feast hall as King Ridoff and Elise entered, His Majesty, the King, is arriving. King Ridoff took his seat at the center stage of the feast and cheerfully introduced, Today's feast is to welcome the master of the magic tower, young Elimus, the master of the magic tower will forge an alliance with us. King Ridoff looked towards El, the master of the magic tower will present us with a gift before we begin the festivities today. El blinked in surprise, completely taken aback by the king's request, ha, huh, why all of a sudden? While unsure what to do, the eager gazes of everyone at the feast made it impossible for El to refuse. After a moment of contemplation, he confidently stepped forward to the center of the feast hall. El calmly introduced himself, I am Elimus, the master of the magic tower who has recently appeared in the kingdom of Tolian, thank you all for hosting this welcoming feast. Immediately, El raised both hands in front of his chest and used the spell dissolving tension, illusions of flowers suddenly appeared in his hands. The magic, carrying the flowers and their fragrance, spread throughout the feast hall and permeated the minds of the nobles, leaving them speechless with awe at its beauty. El smiled gently, I hope you all enjoy the feast. The stress-relieving magic was like a refreshing breeze, helping the nobles who were locked in a struggle for power to relax. While everyone was immersed in the comfortable atmosphere, El walked out onto the balcony, ignoring the regretful gazes. El stood on the balcony, sighing wearily, Ugh, crowded places always drain my energy, I became a professional gamer in my previous life just to make money. I can't get used to those curious stares, and this place is filled with conflicting factions, the more I think about it, the heavier this life feels. 
As El continued to sigh in distress, a graceful figure slowly approached him from behind. Elise smiled brightly and greeted El, so, you're here. El quickly hid his despondency and turned to look at Elise, Princess Elise. Elise was slightly surprised, oh, you know me, El smiled and nodded, how could I not recognize the princess of the kingdom? Elise immediately beamed, it's an honor to meet you, master of the magic tower. Then, she clasped her hands together with a mixture of shyness and confusion, you're so quick-witted, you must have guessed why I'm here. El saw the princess's nervousness, anxiety, and awkward excitement, he quickly understood her intentions. El frowned slightly, with a hint of concern, did his majesty advise you to marry me? I know you are an intelligent and wise woman, princess. El stated his assumption directly, someone who has rejected countless marriage proposals wouldn't have the princess initiate a conversation unless there was a specific reason. Elise nodded slightly, with an embarrassed smile, you guessed right, you are truly amazing. As El felt that Elise was being pressured, she suddenly flashed a bright smile, but I'm not here solely because of my father's request, I am genuinely interested in you. El couldn't help but open his eyes wide in astonishment, with me. Elise looked at El with sparkling eyes filled with curiosity, I hear you're about my age, but already a level 7 mage, how could I refuse to meet someone as talented as you? El was shocked by Elise's enthusiastic attitude, what's going on, why did her demeanor change so drastically? Elise didn't notice El's bewildered expression, she innocently asked, how did you acquire such power? El chuckled nervously and responded hesitantly, I don't know if you'll believe me, but I learned it all by myself. Elise exclaimed in surprise, really, you're a true-born genius. El smiled gently, genius, how can that be? Whether I'm level 7 or level 8, I'm still me. I'm just an ordinary person among billions on this planet. I'm not that different. Elise was stunned by El's mature demeanor. I'm just curious if your thoughts are similar to others. You've reached the level of Grand Mage at such a young age. The princess nervously revealed her feelings. I am the princess of the Tolian kingdom, a woman with full rights and responsibilities, but I don't have the power to do what I want, currently. I can follow my own desires but it won't help the royal family. Elise spoke abruptly, her voice filled with sadness, one day, I will have to marry for the benefit of the kingdom, marriage is also my duty to the nation. El didn't hesitate to shake his head and tell Elise, no, princess. He gave her a sweet smile and encouraged her, you can do many things to contribute to the kingdom besides getting married, don't worry about that. Elise seemed to awaken after El's advice, he continued, what matters is what you desire, princess, sacrificing yourself isn't always a noble act, I'd be happy to help you. El subtly expressed his refusal with a warm smile, you understand me, right, now, let's go back to the party. Immediately afterward, while Elise was still lost and thought about El's advice and rejection, he passed her and returned to the Grand Hall. After a moment of daze, Elise suddenly felt her heart beating fast, he is truly amazing, he understands me so well, Elise whispered to El, thank you, thank you very much. El continued walking with a satisfied smile, he wasn't planning to get married at this point, especially not a political marriage without emotions. As El passed the window leading to the balcony, he was startled to see Rowland standing there, what are you doing here? Rowland chuckled playfully, just taking a break, don't get any ideas, I wasn't eavesdropping on your conversation with the princess. El ignored Rowland's teasing and said, Right, Countess, I have something to talk to you about, Rowland tilted her head curiously. El spoke frankly to Rowland, I'm not being arrogant, but I hope you can make your group of nobles support the third prince. Rowland's eyes lit up with a sly smile, so, you think if I join the third prince's faction, it will balance the power within the kingdom? El nodded calmly, exactly, you realize, right, the country is currently divided into two factions the first prince and the second prince, strengthening the third prince's faction will create balance. A playful and slightly mischievous smile spread across Rowland's lips. Without hesitation, she nodded, I'll listen to anything you suggest, I trust you, L, just tell me what you need. L cheerfully shook Rowland's hand, thank you, Rowland shook her head, no, I'm the one who should be thanking you. Meanwhile, in the forest outside the capital of the Tolian kingdom, hurried footsteps echoed. 
a group of people from the Vatican Tower had arrived at their destination, finally, we're here, the Grand Priest Artemis's envoy led us here. They looked down at the Tolian Kingdom's capital with ambitious eyes. The leader of the group declared in a low voice to his companions, We, the Knights of Light, will find and rescue the Holy Maiden at all costs. The next day, the leader of the Knights of Light sought out King Redoff and revealed the prophecy, leaving him stunned, What did you say? King Redoff was both excited and worried, immediately confirming, You mean to say, the Holy Maiden from the prophecy is in my kingdom, Priest Ball. Ball nodded with a businesslike smile. He explained further to King Redoff, Yes, the Holy Maiden, who will save this continent from the dark forces, was born here, what could be more joyous for the Tolian kingdom? King Redoff was skeptical, Are you sure that girl was born here? Ball firmly asserted, We have searched nearby nations. But we sensed nothing unusual, she is definitely here. King Redoff fell into deep thought, Could it be the influence of this kingdom's barrier, the barrier, do you think so? I haven't considered this before, so I'm quite surprised. King Redoff secretly rejoiced, if the Holy Maiden is truly here, the kingdom's power will increase significantly. Although they possess the same military strength and territory, the Holy Nation has one of the Ten Grand Masters, making them stronger than Tolian. So, King Redoff's joy quickly turned into anxiety, not only our kingdom, but other countries also lack the strength to confront them. Thinking about this, King Redoff reluctantly abandoned the idea of keeping the Holy Maiden and asked Ball, What can we do for you? Ball still laughed insincerely, Currently, we can control our holy power by ourselves with our strength. We don't need your help too much, we just need a guide to lead the Holy Knights to the Thunderous Land. King Redoff was even more surprised, looking at Ball, A guide, what is this Thunderous Land you mentioned? Ball answered with a cunning smile, it's a place near the rough and rocky Levetan Plateau. He added Artemos speculation, maybe it's close to the monster territory located in the western part of the continent. King Redoff was shocked because that was where El was, he tried to hide his surprise, oh, is that so? He then expressed his concern for the group from the Holy Nation, the terrain there is quite treacherous, this journey will be very difficult. Soon after, King Redoff made an excuse to leave, I'll give the order for you to leave tomorrow, just rest today, Ball, seeing he achieved his goal, laughed triumphantly, thank you, your majesty. King Redoff tried to maintain his composure as he left the meeting hall. But as he walked down the corridor leading to the mage Desalin's room, King Redoff's steps began to become hurried, trouble is coming, that prophecy. Is the Holy Maiden related to the Master of the Magic Tower? If so, King Redoff quickened his pace in worry. King Redoff finally couldn't contain his anxiety and eagerly searched for Desalin, 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 where are you? King Redoff hastily flung open the door to the royal palace's magic room. His impulsive action startled Desalin, Your Majesty, what's wrong? King Redoff rushed over, grabbing Desalin's shoulders and shaking him, quickly. Help me contact the magic tower, something big is about to happen. Meanwhile, in the Manticore Valley, setting up the barrier encompassing the entire Manticore Valley took a long time. L, a seventh rank mage, and Silver, a sixth rank mage, had worked continuously for the past year to complete this barrier. L smiled contentedly as he touched the magic barrier he designed, now it's safe. Taking advantage of the soil erosion, El and his mother had layered protective magic on the barrier, if the mana flow of the barrier is disrupted by mages other than them, it will create some limitations for the opponent, if that person enters this place, their power will be suppressed. Silfer also smiled contentedly at her son, you're growing up, El, this barrier is amazing. El nodded to his mother, although there are no problems now, we should be cautious. Just then, Kana ran over to El and Silfer in a panic, El, El, El asked her, Kana, what's wrong? Kana said seriously, someone is calling you through the magic mirror. After a moment of surprise, El immediately realized something was wrong. His eyes became sharp afterwards, with his own calculations. El carefully instructed Silfer, Mom, quickly go inside and rest, Silfer, also feeling uneasy, looked at her son, okay. In the next second, El teleported back to his office in the Magic Tower. Silfer anxiously looked towards the Magic Tower, her intuition told her, I have a bad feeling about this. 
It took only a few seconds for L to return to his office in the magic tower. He immediately glanced at the magic mirror emitting a faint light. L rushed towards the mirror that was making crackling sounds like a vibrating phone. He reached out his hand towards the mirror and used magic to open the connection for the conversation. When the image became clear, King Redoff appeared in the mirror with a worried expression. King Redoff rushed straight to the point, long time no see, master of the magic tower, there's an urgent matter, L furrowed his brows, what is it, your majesty, could it be? The people of the holy nation have made a request, L directly addressed the issue before King Redoff could say it. King Redoff's face wrinkled with increasing anxiety, how did you know? L calmly explained, I heard news that the people of the holy nation have arrived in the Tolian kingdom, King Redoff hesitated for a moment then asked directly, so, the holy maiden is really with you. L hesitated slightly, then finally admitted, yes. King Redoff expressed his concern, if the holy maiden is with you, conflict is inevitable, do you have a plan, they are fanatics, nothing, not even death can stop them. L responded confidently, she's a member of my family, I can't ignore her. L briefly recounted everything to King Redoff, one day, a female mage suddenly fainted and gradually lost all her mana, then, her body was suddenly filled with holy power, we were very surprised. But we can't hand her over just because she possesses holy power, L said resolutely. He choked back a sob as he recounted, it was my mother who freed her from slavery and cared for her like a family member, my mother would never let her live the life of a captive holy maiden. King Redoff nodded, his eyes filled with sympathy but also confusion, but the other side is the holy nation, a powerful nation with countless holy knights, even though you're a seventh rank mage, it won't be easy to deal with them. L spoke with increasing determination, no matter what happens, I will never give up, no, more accurately. I'm confident I can protect her. He looked up at King Redoff with confident eyes, if I can't protect the people I love, how can I dare call them my family? King Redoff couldn't help but be moved, and his face lit up when he saw L's extraordinary determination. L, with sincere attitude, told him, Your Majesty, can I ask you a favor, please maintain neutrality until this matter is resolved. King Redoff smiled gently in response, Neutral, all right. Is that all? L also smiled, thanking King Redoff. Yes, if you maintain your neutrality as promised, I will not cause conflict with the Holy Kingdom and I will handle this myself. King Redoff, without hesitation, expressed his support for L. I understand. I will be careful not to let the location of the tower be revealed, but for the sake of the kingdom, I cannot refuse their request to search. Isn't it just a matter of time before they find the magical tower? L nodded in agreement, this is inevitable, if they search carefully, they will find us, but it will take at least a month, I will figure something out before then, King Redoff smiled kindly, I understand, master of the magical tower, I hope you understand this. He said with sincerity, you are a valuable member of the Tolian kingdom, if one day we cannot be there to help you, we still hope you will be safe. L smiled warmly at King Redoff. Thank you, a sudden wave of emotion washed over him, so this is what it feels like to be cared for by someone else. He said his farewells to King Redoff before ending the call through the mirror, I will see you again. Immediately after, L turned and walked towards the window. He flung open the office door and looked out at the entire view of the Manticore Valley. Facing a major event about to unfold, L wanted to look at the fruits of his labor over the years and took a deep breath to gain motivation. He clenched his fists with determination and resolve, I will protect my family, the people I love, at all costs. With L's declaration, the bright and warm sunshine spread across the Manticore Valley. A month later, without clear directions from the king, Baal, with a group of holy knights, left the royal palace and headed towards Luvia's territory to search for the holy maiden. Rowlan warmly welcomed Baal into her dilapidated manner, my apologies for making you wait. She smiled, welcoming him, it's a pleasure to meet you, I am Raul and Luvius, I heard you traveled a long distance to get here, you must be quite tired from the journey. Ball sighed, yes, I walked for a month to get here, so, I am, he silently lamented to himself, I have a feeling that the guide the king recommended to me is directionally challenged. 
A month earlier, the guide had smiled cheerfully and told Ball, The valley you are looking for is in this direction. Ball was skeptical, really, but I thought it was in the opposite direction. However, the guide insisted, pointing in the opposite direction, definitely this way. I was born and raised in the Tolian kingdom, no one knows the roads better than I do, you can trust me, I will lead you to the Holy Maiden. Ball, although suspicious, comforted himself, it probably isn't true, he was quite dedicated in guiding me, the king recommended him, so it must be all right. Rowland chuckled and asked Ball, so, may I ask, what brings you, High Priest Ball, the pillar of the Holy Kingdom, to this place? Ball got straight to the point, you must know that we are searching for the Holy Maiden of the Tolian Kingdom, we would be very grateful if you could assist in finding her. Rowland smiled brightly and nodded without hesitation, of course, I would be happy to help with all my strength. Ball continued, the prophecy says that she is in a place filled with magic in the harsh land of Levetan Plateau, do you have any idea where that could be? Rowlin, upon hearing that, immediately knew that the most fitting place for the description was Manticore Valley, but she pretended to be deeply contemplative. Rowlin slowly pondered, mumbling to herself, the terrain around here is quite rugged and dangerous, a place filled with magic, hmm. Suddenly, Ball's eyes sharpened, may I ask something, there are rumors of a new magical tower appearing in the Tolian kingdom, do you know where it is? Rowlin, upon hearing this, became slightly flustered, a magical tower, I have only heard rumors about it, I do not know its exact location. Ball scoffed, as if he had noticed Rowland's brief moment of confusion. He continued to offer clues, making Rowland even more flustered, I have tried searching around here, but there are no traces, I speculate that it might be in Manticore Valley. As expected, Rowland became flustered, unlike before, oh, Manticore Valley, you shouldn't go to such a dangerous place, besides, you definitely won't find anything there. Ball's sly smile deepened, but, the strange thing is, no matter how much I wander around here, I haven't encountered any monsters, it's as if all the monsters have disappeared. The more Rowland heard, the more flustered she became, stumbling over her words, that, that. She forced a smile, flattering Ball, High Priest, you are truly amazing. Rowlan tried to offer an explanation, perhaps your divine power is so strong that even the monsters are afraid to come near. Ball, seeing Rowlan's forced explanation, silently chuckled, he had identified the location of the magical tower based on Rowlan's reaction. Then, Ball chuckled awkwardly, telling Rowlan, Oh dear, you flatter me too much, I think it's just luck. Immediately, he stood up and made an excuse to leave quickly, I have finished my investigation here, I will go elsewhere to gather more information, my apologies for the interruption. Seeing Ball's hurried departure, his assistant approached him curiously, High Priest Ball. The assistant whispered hesitantly, the Holy Maiden is, Ball immediately nodded slightly, the Holy Maiden is in the magical tower in Manticore Valley. Ball's face showed a clear look of malice, we know her location now. All that's left is to follow her trail. He laughed gleefully, finding the Holy Maiden is our top priority, let's go. Rowlan stood at the window of the living room looking down at the gate of the manor, she silently watched Ball leave in a hurry. However, Rowlan did not seem worried about L. instead, she had a triumphant smile, although her acting was a bit blatant, luckily it was effective, as long as they reacted according to the plan. Rowlan chuckled with satisfaction. I have successfully lured them to the tower, now the rest is up to L. Rowland mumbled to herself with a warm smile, remember to take care of yourself, master of the magical tower, soon after, the group from the Holy Kingdom arrived at the forest near Manticore Valley. A subordinate of Ball reminded everyone, there are no monsters, but the terrain is very difficult, we must not let our guard down. Ball grumbled, the master of the magical tower must be crazy, or a reckless fool, his subordinate immediately agreed, why would he build a tower in a place like this? Ball frowned unhappily and replied, who knows? As they reached a towering cliff, Ball stopped, his eyes full of doubt, I think this is the entrance, if my guess is correct, the tower is behind this place, kill anyone who resists. Suddenly, L appeared at the top of the cliff with a condemnation, how cruel, how can followers of the divine be so wicked? 
El shook his head in disapproval as he looked at the people of the Holy Kingdom, you should treat ordinary people with the same sincerity that you offer to your gods, shouldn't you? Baal was offended and shouted, who are you? El smiled cunningly and questioned him back, I want to ask you the same question, what are you doing in my territory, people of the Holy Kingdom? Baal frowned and stared at El suspiciously, your territory. Immediately, a bold guess popped into his head, making him stunned, don't tell me you. Baal exclaimed in astonishment, seeing El younger than he expected, you are the master of the Golden Tower. El laughed merrily and asked him back, so what if I am? Baal widened his eyes in bewilderment, the master of a magic tower, but so young, how is that possible? Then, he started to piece together the information he had gathered before, now I remember, the rumors about a young mage who wiped out the Einhart family of the Blared Kingdom. He was a genius mage who could create a golem knight as powerful as a grandmaster and could defeat two level 7 mages. The more Baal thought about it, the more he was convinced of his guess, if the person in the rumor was him, then it was entirely possible that he was the master of the tower. Baal immediately humbled himself and lowered his voice, may I ask you something, we've come here from the holy kingdom to search for the holy maiden, is she living in the tower? El answered coldly, yes, she is under my protection. Baal instantly looked cheerful and grinned, oh, thank the gods, we've found the holy maiden. Right after that, just one sentence from El extinguished Baal's smile, but I won't hand her over to you. Baal frowned and looked displeased, what do you mean? El calmly announced to him, she is my betrothed. Baal was stunned and shouted in excitement, what, betrothed? The whole continent knows, the holy maiden is the most noble and pure, that means they are strictly forbidden from ever marrying, or even having physical contact with someone of the opposite sex. Baal reacted fiercely with a resounding scream, that's absurd, it will never happen. He pointed at El and ordered his subordinates, we must prevent this at all costs, even level 7 mage magic can't penetrate the magic resistance enchantment on our robes, attack. Baal's subordinates immediately shouted in unison, we must bring the holy maiden back, for the name of the holy god, they all charged into search. El clicked his tongue and shook his head in annoyance, although I anticipated this, I'm still surprised, the people of the holy kingdom are really unbearable, I don't know if I should call them loyal or fanatical. Right after that, El teleported and vanished from the cliff top. When the people of the Holy Kingdom were rejoicing, thinking he had retreated, El suddenly appeared on the ground in front of them. Baal grumbled and criticized El, you dare come down here yourself, you arrogant brat. Immediately, his subordinates drew their swords and pointed them at El. They fiercely raised their swords, and with Baal's order, they all attacked. However, the people of the Holy Kingdom were shocked and confused when a huge magic circle suddenly appeared beneath their feet. El smiled slyly and triumphantly as he watched the hunter suddenly become the prey and their clumsy appearance was so ridiculous, 